Section 1 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface by A. W. Ward, G. W. Prothero, and Stanley Leeds. The present volume, as its title imports, relates a complicated series of conflicts of which the origin or the pretext has for the most part to be sought in the great religious schism with which the preceding volume was concerned. But the cause of the restoration of Catholic unity in the West was, in the minds of both the supporters and the opponents of that cause, inextricably interwoven with the purposes of dynastic ambition and powerfully affected by influences traceable to the rapid advance of the monarchical principle and to the gradual growth of the conception of the modern national state. Although in graver peril than ever before from the persistent advance of the Ottoman power, Europe no longer finds a real unifying force in either papacy or empire. The spiritual ardor of the Catholic reaction, which might have served to strengthen the resistance to the general enemy of Christendom, is expanded largely on internecine conflicts. It allies itself with the settled resolution of Philip of Spain to control the destinies of Western Europe, and thus there is not a phase of the religious and political struggle here described which remains unconnected with the rest. The religious wars of France, with an account of which this volume opens, furnish the most complete instance of the constant intersection of native and foreign influences, but it is illustrated by almost every portion of the narrative. Since, therefore, the story of no European country or group of countries in this troubled period admits of being told as detached from the contemporary history of its neighbors, allies, and adversaries, the same series of events must necessarily appear more than once in these pages as forming an organic part of the history of several countries, but treated in each case from a distinct point of view. Within the division of modern history treated in this volume falls the adoption by the majority of European governments of the new style introduced into the calendar by Pope Gregory XIII. Events which happened in the history of any country after the adoption by it of the new style are dated in that style accordingly. For the convenience of readers, a table showing the several dates of the adoption of the new style by chief European governments is printed at the close of this volume. Among the chapters included in it, we are fortunately able to print two, contributed by two eminent historians, whose loss we, in common with all British historical students, deeply deplore. The chapter by the late Mr. T. G. Law had the benefit of his own revision, such was not the case with the contribution of the late Professor S. R. Gardner, one of the earliest received in the course of our undertaking. It is the intention of the syndics of the University Press, after the issue of Volume 12 of this history, to supplement its narrative by the publication of a volume of maps, and by that of another volume containing genealogies and other auxiliary information, with a general index to the entire work. A. W. W. G. W. P. S. L. Cambridge, November, 1904. End of section 1. Section 2 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1. The Wars of Religion in France by A.J. Butler, Part 1. Small as was the measure of toleration accorded to the Protestants by the Edict of January, it was too large for the zealots of the opposite party. Throughout the winter, attacks upon Huguenot congregations had been taking place all over the country. But the chief impression was made by an incident which occurred on Sunday, March 1st, 1562. 
The Duke of Guise, who was staying at his house of Joinville in the modern département of the Haute-Marne, went that day to dine at the little town of Vassy, attended after the fashion of the times by a large band of armed retainers. At Vassy they found a Huguenot service going on and some of the Duke's followers attempting to push their way into the barn where it was being held were met with shouts of Papists, idolaters. Stones began to fly and the Duke was himself struck. His enraged attendants fired upon the crowd, with the result that out of six or seven hundred worshippers, sixty were killed and many wounded. The exasperation of the Protestants throughout France was great, nor was it abated by the line of apology which the opposite party adopted. Comparisons of the Duke to Moses and Jehu were not soothing to people who had been attacked when only exercising their legal right. Another slaughter of Huguenots at Sens, where the Cardinal of Lorraine was Archbishop, added fuel to the fire, and by April war was seen to be inevitable. The first object of either party was to secure the presence of the King in its midst. Catherine, who wished to maintain her neutral position as long as possible, had withdrawn with him to Fontainebleau after sending orders, which were not obeyed, to the Duke of Guise not to bring an armed force to Paris. He had entered the capital on March 20th, and Condé, at the Queen Mother's desire, had immediately left it, retiring first to Meaux, then to La ferté sous jouarre then the King of Navarre, at the bidding of the Triumvirate, by whom he was now entirely ruled, had induced Catherine, partly by persuasion, partly by menaces, to consent to her own and the King's return to Paris, a decision which, it is said, cost tears both to the child and to his mother. Conde and Admiral de Coligny, on learning by a message from the Queen Mother herself that they had been forestalled, made the best of their way to Orléans, which city Dandelot, the second of the Châtillon brothers, was already trying to enter. The reinforcement which they brought at once terminated the half-hearted resistance of the town, and Orléans passed into the hands of the Huguenots without the usual preliminary sack. The first overt act of war had thus been committed by the weaker side, and the last voice of wisdom was silenced. The Chancellor, L'Hôpital, who till now had with the assent of the Queen Mother been making a final effort for conciliation, was met with insult and excluded from the council, which was packed with creatures of the House of Guise. Orders were sent to the regular troops to be in readiness by May 15th. The Huguenots replied by seizing the larger towns on the Rome, the Somme, the Loire and the Lower Seine, with others in the south and centre. Negotiations did not on that account altogether cease, Condé offering more than once to withdraw to his own house if the chiefs of the opposite party would do the like. To this, however, they would only consent on condition that the Edict of January was revoked. In other words, if a Protestants would surrender at discretion. Early in June, an interview took place between Condé and the Queen Mother at Talcy near Orléans. The prince held to his conditions, which Catherine made another effort to induce the Guises to accept, but in vain. Though the King of Navarre, if he had had any real power, would have been ready enough to close with them. The month was spent in parleying, while two armies were helping the inhabitants of the district to get in their crops. Finally, the King of Navarre met Condé at Beaugency, where the prince offered to place himself in the king's hands if his terms were accepted as a hostage for their loyal observance by his party. The Queen Mother at once declared it impossible for two religions to exist side by side in France. The Catholics were clearly the stronger party. The Edict of January must go. Condé then made a last offer. If the Edict were allowed to stand, he and the other leaders, as soon as the Guises had left the court, would quit France altogether and remain abroad until they should be recalled. Somewhat to their surprise, Catherine closed with this proposal. The Catholic chiefs, with the exception of the King of Navarre, were ordered to leave the camp, handing over their forces to him, while Condé was called upon to fulfil his part of a contract. He went so far as to meet Catherine again at Talcy, but some intercepted letters, whether genuine or forged, fell into Huguenot hands, in which the King of Navarre was directed by the Lorraine party to seize his brother's person. Hereupon the Admiral and the other Huguenot chiefs intervened and practically bore their leader back to their camp, June 27th. The war now began in earnest. The Parlement of Paris declared the Huguenots rebels 
and a few executions followed. The Huguenots, finding themselves outmatched, resolved on seeking foreign aid. Like their rivals, they had already applied for help from the German princes, who, whatever their creed, were usually ready to furnish Reiters and Landsknechts if they got their price. In the present instance, the Rhinegrave, John Philip, who commanded the Germans on the Catholic side, was a Protestant, as were most of his men. The levy of Reiters was almost a matter of course wherever warlike operations were on foot, but the Huguenots took a step which, even in those days, was felt by many to be hazardous. They invited the Queen of England to land a force on French soil. The matter was negotiated in London by the Vidame de Chartres, a political adventurer who played a considerable part in the intrigues of the next twenty years. The Queen was to give a large subsidy in money on condition that in the event of the Huguenots proving victorious, Calais should be restored. Meanwhile, the town and port of Havre de Grasse, which the English called New Haven, were to be occupied by an English garrison. Accordingly, Sir Adrian Poynings landed on October 4th with some 3,000 men, 2,000 of whom were immediately thrown into Rouen to reinforce the weak garrison. Ormsby, with 600, occupied Dieppe a few days later, and on the 29th, the Earl of Warwick, in whose hands was placed the chief command of the expedition, brought over the remainder of the force, which now amounted to about 6,000. The English intervention had little result. The royalist commanders strained every nerve to get possession of Rouen before Dandelot, who, with a strong force of higher troops, was on his way from Germany, could arrive. Montgomery, who was in command, refused all terms, and on October 26th, three days before the landing of the Earl of Warwick, Guise delivered his final assault, and, after a short resistance, the garrison were overpowered. In spite of strenuous efforts on the part of the royalist commanders, the usual sack followed, Catholics and Protestants being impartially pillaged and slaughtered. Montgomery escaped by boat, but three or four of the leaders were hanged. On December 17th, the King of Navarre succumbed to a wound received in the trenches, leaving, as head of the House of Bourbon, and not very remote in the succession to the throne, his son, a boy of nine, brought up in the Protestant religion by a severely Protestant mother. A desultory warfare was meanwhile going on in the southeast. At Orange, the Catholics massacred the Huguenots, and the reprisals exacted by the Baron des Adres fixed an indelible stain on his name. Chalon and Macon were retaken, but Lyon remained in the Huguenots' hands. Joyeuse, the king's lieutenant-general in Languedoc, laid siege to Montpellier, but a reverse sustained by the Catholics near Nimes compelled him to withdraw. In spite of their enormous inferiority in numbers, the Protestants were enabled by the ability of their leaders and the greater efficiency of what may be called their secret service almost to hold their own. Early in November, Dandelot, having managed to elude the vigilance of the Duke of Nevers and Marshal Saint-André, who were looking out for him in Champagne, brought his Germans, 9,000 in number, safely to Montargis, where he was joined by his brother, the Admiral, and Condé. Leaving Dandelot in command at Orléans, the others made a bold dash for Paris, hoping to seize the capital by a coup de main before the bulk of the Royalist army could get back from Normandy. They reached Arcueil without opposition on November 23rd, but found Guise and Saint-André already there, and the city prepared for defence. An assault was repulsed, but when Condé challenged the king's forces to a pitched battle, the queen mother, partly no doubt in order to give time for the arrival of reinforcements from the south, made overtures for peace. The constable, the Duke of Montmorency, actually went into the Huguenot camp as a hostage while the admiral was in Paris and the negotiations continued for some days. No result was reached, and on December 10th, Condé withdrew his forces in the direction of Chartres. The royal army followed, marching on a nearly parallel line to Etampes, thus threatening Orléans. The Huguenot chiefs were a little perplexed, and various moves were suggested. Condé, with whom valour was apt to be the better part of discretion, was for doubling back with all speed to Paris and seizing it before the other side could come up. The more wary admiral pointed out that, even if they got into Paris, with the king's army between them and Orléans, not only would that city be easily retaken, 
but they would be cut off from their main source of provisions. The Reiters, too, as usual, wanted their pay, and the money was in English hands at Havre. A march into Normandy would enable them to join hands with the English, and since the enemy would be compelled to follow, Orléans would no longer be in danger. This council prevailed, and the Huguenots, who for three days had been making futile attempts to take the little town of saint Arnoul, proceeded in the direction of Dreux, a fortified town close to the frontier of Normandy, of which a detachment from their army had been sent to make sure. This operation, however, did not succeed, and only dislocated the formation of their forces. The Huguenots reached the River Eure first and crossed it, as it would seem, on the morning of December 19th, the Admiral's division leading. The Catholics arrived later in the day and, remaining unobserved in consequence of the bad scouting of Condé's division, succeeded during the night in crossing about two miles higher up and placing themselves by a flank march between their opponents and the town of Dreux. This movement brought Saint-André, who commanded the advance guard, the Duke of Guise, choosing to serve that day as a simple captain, on the left wing of the royal army, opposite to Condé, and somewhat outflanking him, while the constable was opposed to his nephew, the admiral. Finding their road blocked, the Huguenots, though in considerably inferior force, were compelled to accept battle. We must now look to our hands to save us, not to our feet, observed the Admiral. The battle was hard fought, the lowest estimate of a slain being about 6,000. On each side the left wing broke and routed the enemy's right, but on the whole the victory was with the Royalists, who remained in possession of the ground. Their losses, however, were severe. The aged constable, fighting after his want, like a private soldier, was wounded and taken prisoner and carried straight to Orléans. Marshal Saint-André and the Duke of Nevers were killed, also the constable's youngest son, Gabriel de Montberon. The Huguenots also lost their chief, Condé, having been compelled to surrender to the Duke of Omal, who commanded the Brigade of Lancers jointly with the constable's second son, Henry de Damville. The command of the two forces thus devolved on Guise and on the admiral, who brought off his men in good order to Beaugency. Throughout January 1563, Guise was engaged with preparations for the siege of Orléans. On February 5th, he encamped before the town on its northern side. The admiral, who had thrown himself into the town, saw the imprudence of locking up his whole army in one place, and soon left the defence of it to Dandelot, making his way into Normandy. He did not succeed in getting into touch with the English, already closely invested by the Rhinegrave, though Throgmorton contrived to reach him with a supply of English money. Indeed, his operations were confined to the left side of the Seine, but he took Caen and some smaller towns. On February 18th, an event happened which changed the whole position of affairs. The Duke of Guise, after effecting a lodgment in one of the suburbs of Orléans and planting guns on some islands, had made his arrangements for a night attack and was riding to his quarters when he was shot in the back by Jean Paultreau de Mer, a kinsman of La Renaudie, the conspirator of Amboise and a fanatical Huguenot, who had attached himself to the royal army for the easier execution of his purpose. Both the admiral and the theologian Beza were accused of having prompted the crime, but beyond Poltro's own statement under torture, no evidence of their complicity was ever produced. Of the triumvirate, two were now dead, the third was a prisoner, while the Huguenots also had temporarily lost one of their chiefs. The Cardinal of Lorraine was at Tron. The Admiral, who might perhaps have been glad to push the advantage his party seemed for the moment to hold, was ten days' march away. The opportunity was excellent for conciliation. The Queen Mother, the Constable, Condé and Dandelot met in Orléans and by March 7th had agreed on terms, which were published in the form of an edict on the 18th at Amboise, where the court then was. They were somewhat less favourable to the Huguenots than those of January 1562, but their recognition of the reformed religion met with a good deal of opposition from some of the provincial parlements, those of Paris, Toulouse and Aix requiring some modification. The admiral, too, who did not reach Orléans till the 23rd, was not entirely pleased to find that peace had been made in his absence. 
The Queen Mother's next move was to consolidate the peace between the two parties by uniting them in a common task. English troops were still established on French soil, and all Frenchmen must combine to dislodge them. Marshal de Brissac was sent into Normandy at once, the court following shortly after, with the constable, his sons, Marshal Montmorency and Damville, Condé, and other captains. The admiral was thought better away. Warwick had taken steps to strengthen his position, but his army was being rapidly thinned by disease, nor was it possible any longer to maintain the pretext that it had been sent solely to aid in delivering the king from coercion by a faction. The French nobles, most of whom had friends among Warwick's officers, had no desire to exact hard terms of capitulation. On July 28th, Warwick, who was that day wounded, agreed to surrender, and on the 31st, the French were put into possession of the town. The capitulation had hardly been signed when an English fleet with reinforcements came in sight, but the only work it found was to carry home the remains of a garrison. The relations between France and England remained for some time rather strained, but a settlement was reached in a peace made at Troyes on the 13th of the following April. It was contended on the French side that Elizabeth's action in occupying Havre had cancelled the clause in the Treaty of Cato Cambresi, which entitled her to claim 500,000 crowns if Calais were not restored within eight years. She finally agreed to abandon the claim and release the four gentlemen detained as sureties for the sum. As a token of amity, Lord Hunsdon was sent to invest the French king with the garter. By the death of the King of Navarre, the Prince of Condé had become the senior Prince of the Blood. As such, he had claimed to succeed his brother as Lieutenant General of the Realm, an inconvenient claim which Catherine and L'Hôpital evaded by having the king, though he had not completed his fourteenth year, declared of age and competent to rule. This was done by an assembly held at Rouen on September 15, 1563. Peace was outwardly established, but the roots of strife were not cut off. Early in 1564, the Cardinal of Lorraine returned from Tron, where the council had closed in December 1563. On the 13th of the previous October, Paul IV had, at the instigation of the King of Spain, cited the widowed Queen of Navarre to appear and answer to a charge of heresy and in default had declared her excommunicated, her fiefs forfeited, and her children illegitimate. The cardinal came back with feelings of bitter resentments against the Châtillon, whom he persisted in regarding as accessories to his brother's murder. Moreover, the general effect of the council was to strengthen the hands of those who were determined to root out Protestantism, and who looked upon the king of Spain as in some sense their temporal head. It was thought desirable that Charles should make personal acquaintance with his subjects throughout the realm, and in the early spring of 1564, the court set out on a prolonged tour of France. The route was laid out so that, without rousing suspicion, conferences might be held with representatives of the Pope, the Duke of Savoy, and the King of Spain, the chief movers in the design of a Catholic League. Troyes was reached by the second week in April, and there the peace with England was concluded. At Nancy, it is said that the scheme of the Catholic League was first laid before the young king. At present, however, he and his advisers were not prepared to listen to proposals emanating from Rome, for the Trente Decrees had given great offence in France and had been censured by the Paris Parlement. The king therefore dryly replied that the Edict of Orléans was recent and that he was not yet prepared to quash it. On May 26, he was at Dijon with his mother on their way to Lyon. As the entrance to that part of France where Protestantism was most vigorous, Lyon needed careful treatment. A new governor was appointed, and a large fort was founded in the angle between the Saint and the Rhone. At Roussillon, en Veron, an edict of partial toleration was issued, calling upon each side to respect the religion of the other and an interview took place with the Duke of Savoy, at which the subject may have been differently dealt with. At any rate, whether an actual inspection of the relative strength of the two parties had shown the Queen Mother that the repose of a realm could be as easily attained by extirpating the Protestants, whether the Nancy reply was intended from the first as a blind, or whether it was felt that conformity with the Pope's wishes in one point 
might diminish his insistence as to the Trente Decrees, it seems that in conference with the papal officials at Avignon, the suppression of Calvinism was spoken of as a practical question. The court passed the winter in the south. In the spring, progress was resumed through Languedoc, and Bayonne was reached in the beginning of June. The Queen of Spain, with the Duke of Alba in her suite, came to meet her mother and brother. Several weeks were spent in gaieties, with intervals of more serious business. No authentic record has been preserved of what took place, but Protestants both in France and elsewhere believed that the policy was then concerted, which bore fruit in the Blood Council of the Netherlands and the St. Bartholomew massacres. It is about this time that a third party begins to emerge, that of the so-called politique. The term, originally as it would seem, implying that those denoted by it acted from motives of policy rather than of principle, came to define the group which, while remaining within the Catholic religion and when called upon bearing arms on the side of a king, were opposed to all coercion in matters of religion. The greatest and most enlightened exponent of this view was, no doubt, the Chancellor L'Hôpital. Let us get rid, he had said, to the estates assembled at Orléans in December 1560, of these devilish words, these names of party, of faction, of sedition. Lutheran, Huguenot, Papist, let us keep unadulterated the name of Christian. And again, a man does not cease to be a citizen for being excommunicated. Various motives doubtless actuated the various members of the group. Some felt keenly the state of impotence to which France had been reduced by these internal dissensions. With the men whom we have lost in these wars, said one a few years later, we could have driven the Spaniards out of the Low Countries. Another important section, of whom the great house of Montmorency may be taken as the type, were strongly moved by jealousy of the half-foreign Guises, and of the wholly foreign gang of Italians from the Queen Mother downwards, who held positions of power and influence at the court. In the case of a constable, strict orthodoxy and dread of innovation outweighed all other considerations, and, though not on good terms with the Guises, he never broke with them. But his eldest son, Marshal Montmorency, whom in 1563 Sir Thomas Smith, the English envoy, described as a Huguenot, or little it lacks, though he never, like his cousins the Châtillons, actually joined the Reformed religion, was as tolerant as the Chancellor himself. In the period subsequent to the massacre, when the Queen Mother for a time threw in her lot with the Guises, he was imprisoned and his life was more than once in danger. The King and his mother returned to the capital toward the end of 1565. Early in the following year, a great assembly was held at moulin sur allier which was attended by most of the chief nobles and by representatives of the provincial parlement. Ordinances of lasting importance for the legal administration of France were drawn up by the Chancellor and passed by the assembly. Reconciliations also took place between the widowed Duchess of Guise and Coligny and between the Cardinal of Lorraine and Montmorency, who had forcibly opposed his entry into Paris. But they were felt to be merely formal, nor did the young Duke of Guise or his uncle, the Duke of Aumale, take part in them. Catherine was probably sincere in wishing to avoid war at this time by any means, but events were too strong for her. The Huguenots had been uneasy since the Bayonne Conference, believing that it indicated a desire on the part of the King of Spain to associate the French court with his crusade against Protestantism. His own affairs in the Netherlands were rapidly coming to a crisis. In October 1565, he had definitely refused any religious toleration. Throughout 1566, the Low Countries were seething, and early in 1567, Alba was commissioned to raise an army in Lombardy and Piedmont for the restoration of order. The Admiral and Condé worked on the young king's suspicions so far as to persuade him to levy a force of Swiss under Colonel Pfeiffer in order to watch Alba's march through Franche-Comté and Lorraine. Alba, however, turned neither to the right nor to the left having his work cut out for him in the Netherlands, and the Huguenot leaders began to see that the King Swiss might have other employment found for them in quarters where the voice of discontented Protestants was no less audible than in Flanders. As at the beginning of the last war, their first idea was to get possession of the King's person. 
The court, which had been for a few days at Monceau near Paris, moved on September 26th to Mont, where it was thought the king might be seized unawares during the festivities of the Order of St. Michael. On the 28th, the Huguenot army under Condé, the Admiral and Dandelot reached Lagny on the Marne, but some gentlemen of the court succeeded in destroying the only bridge. Before they could cross the river, the Swiss had been summoned, and the Huguenots could only watch the phalanx march past them, with the constable at its head, escorting the king safely into Paris. They then took up a position in and about Saint-Denis, ravaging the country. As before, they secured Orléans, which was seized by La Noue with 15 horsemen, and several towns in the south fell into their hands. The Enterprise of Meaux, as it was called, left a deep impression of resentment in the young king's mind. Partly, however, in order to gain time for reinforcements to arrive, the king and his mother were willing to hear such representations as the Huguenots had to make, and several interviews took place between their leaders and those of the other party, but with little result. The force in Paris was considerably straitened by the enemy's command of the approaches, especially of the river, the admiral having, by a bold stroke, seized Charenton. A messenger had been dispatched at the outset to Flanders for succour, but Alba, who probably had no wish to see France quieted too soon, declined to send Spanish troops, offering only Landsknechts and local cavalry. Finally, some 1,700 horse of good quality under Count Aremberg reached Poissy on the 9th. Their approach was, however, known, and Dandelot was detached, with Montgomery, to hold them. The constable, judging the moment suitable for an attack on the main body, offered battle next day, the 10th. Condé met him in the plain between Aubervilliers and Saint-Ouane. The action was mainly one of cavalry, hard-fought, but indecisive. The Huguenots were driven back into Saint-Denis, but were able to come out next day and defy the royal forces, who had no inclination to renew the fight. The chief result was the loss of a constable who, fighting in spite of his 75 years like an ordinary trooper, was mortally wounded. His office was not filled up, but the king's brother, Henry, Duke of Anjou, a lad of 16, was presently appointed lieutenant general of the kingdom. The Huguenot army now abandoned its hold on the rivers and moved eastward to meet a force of German mercenaries under the Count Palatine, John Casimir. An attempt to bring them to battle near Chalon failed, owing, as some thought, to the reluctance of the politique Marshal Cosset to push them too hard. The junction with Jean Casimir was effected on January 11th near Pont-à-Mousson. Encouraged by this reinforcement, the Huguenot leaders rejected a proposal for peace on the lines of the Orléans pacification, influenced mainly by their followers' distrust of the Guises. Their forces entered Burgundy, and the royal army marched to Troyes, both making for Paris, but the Huguenots keeping in view the necessity of relieving Orléans. Meanwhile, Rochelle had opened its gates to the Huguenots, giving them a port, the possibility of a fleet, and a door of communication with their friends in England. The possession of this town, which became the citadel of the religion, was most important. In the course of February, Condé succeeded in raising the siege of Orléans, and the Huguenot army, resolved to force the fighting, which the other side seemed inclined to protract, proceeded to invest Chartres. The king had already sent to the Ernestine duke John William of Saxony for Reiters, and the duke, who, as a rigid Lutheran, was quite ready to fight his Calvinistic brother-in-law John Casimir, himself led 5,000 horse as far as Rotel in Champagne. Before he arrived there, however, negotiations had begun, and much to his annoyance, he was told that his services were not required. In fact, the presence of so many foreigners on French soil had alarmed both sides. The war was assuming a savage character, particularly in the south. The Huguenots were willing to accept the very favourable terms offered them, containing nearly all they asked, and peace was concluded at Longjumeau on March 23rd. The Duke of Saxony agreed to withdraw, but John Casimir at first declined, nor was it till the king undertook to guarantee the pay due to him and his men that he consented to go. The Peace of Longjumeau was in the main a confirmation of the Edict of March 1562. No one was really satisfied with it. Alba was both surprised and displeased, and it was generally felt to be no more than a truce. 
Fresh causes of quarrel arose at once. The king tried to extract from the Huguenot leaders the repayment of the money advanced by him to Casimir, forbidding them at the same time to levy it from their party. No one but himself, he said, should tax his people. Rochelle refused to admit a royal garrison, but fortified itself and began to raise a fleet. The summer was passed in mutual recriminations, and finally, towards the end of August, a plan was formed of seizing Condé and, if possible, the Admiral also, at Noyer in Burgundy. They got wind of the scheme, it was said, through a hint dropped by Marshal Tavan, and fled, with only a small escort, through the hill and forest country between the Loire and the Seine. Crossing the former Atroin, they struck westward through the mountains of Auvergne and safely reached Rochelle. There they were shortly joined by the Queen of Navarre with her son, a lad of fifteen, and by Dandelot, La Noue, and the other Protestant chiefs, except for Cardinal de Châtillon, who escaped to England, there to spend the short remainder of his life as an honoured guest. End of section 2section 3 of the cambridge modern history volume 3 the wars of religion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org chapter 1 the wars of religion in france by a j butler part 2 the third war had now begun this time the catholics were the attacking party and hostilities were clearly to be carried on with far more determination than hitherto an inner council or cabinet, the term seems to have been then used for the first time, had been formed. The Chancellor, L'Hôpital, had been included in this, but on the outbreak of war he was dismissed from all his offices and banished from the court, so the most powerful voice on the side of toleration was silenced. His place as Chancellor was taken by Morvilliers, Bishop of Orléans, a creature of the Guises and a bitter enemy of the Protestants, and the edicts of toleration were revoked. Anjou, who was in supreme command of a royal army, did not leave Paris until the beginning of November. About the same time, the Duke of Montpensier at Messignac in Perigord met a Huguenot contingent coming from Languedoc and defeated them with heavy loss, including that of their commander, Mouvant. But he was unable to prevent the junction of the greater part with the Admiral and Condé, or to hold the ground himself. On the arrival of Anjou, the two armies manoeuvred for some time in close vicinity to one another, but neither side would risk a pitched battle. Finally, the weather became very severe, with much sickness in both armies, and both sides went into winter quarters, the Catholics at Chinon, the Huguenots at Niort, where they received munitions, for which they had to pay, from the Queen of England. During the winter they raided Perigord and Saint-Ange. At the beginning of March, the Catholic army moved south, after securing their right flank by the capture of Ruffec and Molle, and crossing the Charente at some point between the former place and Angoulême, they followed its left bank as far as Chateauneuf, which surrendered at once. The bridge, however, was broken, and the time occupied in its repair was devoted to a reconnaissance, extending as far as Cognac, where the enemy was reported to be in strength. The Huguenot army was presently seen marching in the direction of Jarnac, separated by the river from the Catholics. Their van, under the admiral, was already at Passac, higher up the stream. Anjou returned to Chateauneuf and remained there the next day. By midnight of March 12th, the restoration of the bridge was completed and a bridge of boats also thrown across, and before sunrise on Sunday the 13th, Tavan and Biron, who were the real commanders, had brought their army to the other side. They found the enemy in position, and having driven in the outposts, came in sight of a left wing in the direction of Jarnac. The admiral, who was in command, was not anxious to fight until Condé could arrive from Jarnac, but the impetuous charge of the Duke of Montpensier left him no time to retire, and in spite of desperate efforts on his own part, and that of Dandelot, La Noue, and others in command under him, he was forced back. Condé presently came up with the bulk of the Huguenot cavalry, and by a furious charge checked the royalists for a moment, but was himself charged in flank by the Reiters under Tavan and Anjou. The Huguenots were routed. Condé continuing to fight till he was surrounded and borne down. He had hardly given his sword to his captor, D'Argent, when Montesquieu, captain of Anjou's guard, shot him dead. 
Among the prisoners were Lanou and Rosny, father of a future Duke of Sully. But though defeated, the Huguenots were not discouraged. Their leaders soon reassembled at Cognac, where the Queen of Navarre joined them. Her son, the Duke of Vendôme, then about fifteen years old, was proclaimed head of a party, and the young Prince of Condé associated with him. The command-in-chief of the army was entrusted to the admiral. The king and his mother were at this time at Metz, whither they had gone partly for security and partly for greater facility of communication with Alba in the Netherlands and with Margrave Philibert of Baden, from both of whom reinforcements were expected. On the other side, it was known that Duke Wolfgang of Zweibrücken, de Pont, was about to bring a powerful force of German troops to the aid of the Protestants, and it was all important to prevent these, if possible, from crossing the Loire. The Dukes of Romal and Nemours, who commanded in the east, though strengthened by the accession of nearly 5,000 men, duly sent by Alba, did nothing beyond feebly opposing the passage of Viermontson at Nuit by the German invaders. About May 10th, the Germans reached La Charité, which was taken by assault after a short bombardment, thus securing their passage of the Loire. Thence, after crossing the Vienne a little above Limoges, they effected a junction with the Admiral's forces at saint Irieux on June 23rd. The Duke of Zweibrücken had, however, died a few days before, some thought from overindulgence in the wines of southern France. He was succeeded in the command by Count Volrad of Mansfeld. William of Orange, with his brothers, Louis and Henry of Nassau, was in the army. Anjou, who had been engaged in reducing some small places in Saint-Ange and Perigord, now brought his army to Limoges, where his mother joined him. He soon moved to La roche la nearer to the Huguenot position, and a few indecisive skirmishes took place, chiefly notable as having afforded to the young Prince of Navarre his first experience of actual fighting. Before long, however, the wiser heads among the Catholics decided to leave the opposing forces to the disintegrating effects of a summer spent in a half-ravaged country, and withdrew their army to Turenne. The Protestant army, from which Montgomery had been detached for operations in Guyenne and Gascony, followed into Poitou, where they recovered most of the smaller places that had surrendered after Jarnac, raised the siege of Niort, and on July 24th appeared before Poitiers, into which Anjou had but just time to throw a reinforcement under the young Duke of Guise, who now also began his military career. From July 24th till September 8th, the siege and the defence were conducted with an equal display of spirit on both sides. Finally, Anjou effected a diversion by threatening Chateau and the siege of Poitiers was raised, after costing the Huguenots a loss of some 3,000 men. On the whole, however, they had rather the best of a campaign of sieges which occupied the summer. Sansac failed to reduce La Charité, while, on the other side, Montgomery captured Orthez and gained some advantages in Guienne and Gascony. A decree of attainder, published at this time against the Admiral and other Protestant chiefs, only served to exasperate their followers. The royal army in its retreat from Châtellerault was closely followed by the admiral, who in vain sought to bring it to battle. After a day or two, the respective forces drew off, Anjou going to Chinon, while the admiral led his troops, first to la vineuse and then further to Montcontour. The Catholic army, numbering about 22,000, of whom just one-third were French, now thoroughly rested and reorganized, followed in about a week's time and by October 1st the two forces were in position on either side of the little river Dive. Anjou's main object was to prevent the Huguenots from again moving south into Poitou and effecting their junction with Montgomery. Moving to the left, he crossed the Dive near its source and in the afternoon of October 3rd found the opposing force drawn up in the level ground between it and the Toué. Neither side had any advantage of position, and the battle resolved itself into a series of furious charges on the part of the royal troops and of hand-to-hand -hand encounters. The admiral exchanged pistol shots with the Rhinegrave, receiving a wound in the jaw, but mortally wounding his adversary. The Margrave of Baden also fell. Finally, a charge of a Swiss upon the Huguenots' Landsknechts, who were butchered almost to a man, decided the day.
The Reiters, under Count Louis of Nassau and Count Volrad of Mansfeld, drew off in good order, but 3,000 French surrendered and the artillery and baggage fell into the victors' hands. Lanou, with his usual ill luck, was again taken prisoner, but was soon exchanged and took the command at Rochelle. Though Montcontour was the most crushing defeat the Huguenots had yet sustained, they were not prepared to surrender. In the course of November, de Losses was sent to Rochelle to treat with the Queen of Navarre on the terms that full liberty of worship should be allowed to the Protestants, provided it were not exercised publicly. If a peace be made on those terms, she replied, the names of Jeanne and Henri will not be found attached to it. Nor, indeed, were their losses so heavy as might be inferred from the number of the slain. The French and German cavalry had not suffered very severely. The South was still unshaken, perhaps indeed confirmed in its loyalty to the cause by Montgomery's successful campaign. Moreover, Marshal Damville, the second of the Montmorency brothers, who governed in Languedoc, had quarrelled with Montluc and was not more friendly than the rest of his house to the Guises. Thus, when the admiral, a few days after the battle, rallied his party at Niort, he had little difficulty in persuading them, after leaving garrisons in Rochelle, Saint-Jean-d'Angely and Angoulême, to abandon Poitou and the adjacent districts to the king's forces and to march eastwards. Mouy was left with a small garrison in Niort, which held out for a short time against the Duke of Anjou, but on the treacherous murder of its commander by Morevel, it opened its gates, and its example was followed by the other towns of Poitou and Saint-Ange, with the exception of those named above. Their loss was balanced by the capture of Nîmes, which took place about this time. Anjou next proceeded to besiege Saint-Jean-d'Angely, which, after a gallant defence of forty-six days, capitulated toward the end of the year. After this, the court retired to Angers, and the army was disbanded. The desultory fighting which went on during the early part of 1570 was, on the whole, favourable to the Huguenots. La Noue, sallying out of Rochelle, recaptured several towns, including Niort and Saint. Meanwhile, the admiral and the young princes had, after a raid into Dauphiné, recrossed the Rhône and were by the end of May at Saint-Étienne. Thither, Marshal Biron and the Sieur de Malassis were sent to negotiate. But as the condition which prohibited public worship was still insisted on, no agreement was reached, and the Huguenot army on June 25th reached Arnay-le-Duc in Burgundy, where they found Marshal Cosset, Anjou being absent through illness, waiting to offer battle. A smart, though indecisive, skirmish ensued, but after this both armies drew off. The admiral to Autun, Cosset, alarmed for the safety of Paris, and as a politique unwilling to push matters to extremity, towards Saint. Negotiations were then resumed, and on August 8th, peace was signed at saint germain en laye on terms, if anything, more favourable than the Protestants had hitherto obtained. It is possible that, at the moment, neither Charles IX nor his mother had any purpose in view beyond the restoration of peace to the country. There is no reason to suppose that either of them had any special antipathy to Protestantism. Religion was not a dominating influence of Catherine, while the two persons whom Charles probably loved best in the world, his foster mother and his mistress, Marie Touchet, were Huguenots. Piety was not a marked characteristic of the French upper classes, nor, except possibly among a section of the clergy, was there any enthusiasm in the country at large for the See of Rome. On the other hand, in view of a growing danger of foreign intervention, it was felt by the rulers of France that internal unity was the most urgent necessity of a state, and the king and the queen mother seem at first to have had some hopes of securing this unity by negotiation. Accordingly, an old scheme originally proposed by Henry II and more recently revived by Catherine was again brought to the front of a marriage between Henry of Bourbon, son of the Queen of Navarre and, after the House of Valois, the next in succession to the throne of France, and Margaret, the king's youngest sister. At the same time, Charles himself was betrothed to Elizabeth, daughter of the Emperor Maximilian II, who had hitherto been in no great favour at either Rome or Madrid, although in this same year another daughter of his was married to Philip II of Spain. The alliance between Bourbon and Valois, promoted mainly by the politique, 
was not at first welcomed by the Huguenot leaders, some of whom had a scheme of their own for marrying Henry to the Queen of England. This, again, crossed a plan which had been in Catherine's mind for the past two years, of securing the hand of Elizabeth for her second son, Henry of Anjou, and after some talk between the Huguenot agents and Francis Walsingham, the new English ambassador to the French court, the matter was dropped. The negotiations for the Duke of Anjou's marriage, on the other hand, were vigorously pushed forward during the first half of 1571. They were opened by a dispatch, dated January 2nd, from Sir Henry Norris, then ambassador in France, to the Queen, in which he mentioned that he had been sounded by Montmorency and others as to her matrimonial intentions. This revival of the scheme seems to have been due to the Vidame de Chartres as much as to anyone, for in the previous October he was urging Montmorency to forward the match, as offering an opportunity for the Gallican Church to throw off the yoke of Rome, a phrase of no small significance as a key to the action of a politique. The Pope, on his side, did what he could to hinder the match. Norris added that, being resolved thereof, Monsieur intended to be a suitor to the Queen. The proposal was favourably received, the chief difficulty being the question of religion, or rather the exercise of it, when Monsieur should be established as King Consort. About Easter, Walsingham hopefully quoted a conversation between the King and Teligny, who with the rest of his profession wished the match to proceed. The king thought that if he could only get the duke away from certain superstitious friars that seek to nourish this new holiness in him, he could soon put that right. Two days later, after another conversation with the duke, Teligny was able to assure the king that he found him so far in that he hoped he would make no difficulty at religion. No, said the king, observe my brother well, and you shall see him every day less superstitious. By the beginning of June things were so far advanced that de Foix was sent over to negotiate in conjunction with the resident ambassador, La Motte Fenelon. Articles were drawn up, but in the end the religious difficulty proved insurmountable. Even the perusal of a book of common prayer, duly translated into French, did not overcome the duke's scruples, and though towards the end of July he expressed his regrets to Walsingham, he did not give way. Foix remained in England till September, when, failing the marriage, he suggested a treaty of defensive alliance between France and England. This was favourably received, and in December the accomplished secretary, Sir Thomas Smith, went over to negotiate it. But he found the Guises making every effort to prevent an English alliance, and Scottish agents earnestly soliciting aid in the interest of their queen. On the other hand, Smith had a valuable ally in Coligny, who had been at length induced to come to Blois, and whose presence at court was connected with another intrigue destined to have serious consequences. Count Louis of Nassau, who had served in the Huguenot ranks during the last war, had at the conclusion of peace remained at Rochelle, occupied in organizing the privateers sent from the Low Countries to prey upon Spanish commerce in the Bay of Biscay and to hinder communication by sea between Spain and their own ports. In the spring of 1571 there arrived at Rochelle a Genoese adventurer named Fregoso in the service of the Grand Duke of Tuscany, by whom he alleged that he had been sent to the Elector Palatine and then into France in order to secure eventual support against Spain. He came apparently as an avowed messenger from the Huguenot agents in Paris to the Admiral, and at the same time with some kind of business on the Queen Mother's account, or so it was believed by suspicious Huguenots. Fregoso had speech of Count Louis, and returned to lay before the king and his mother certain proposals which rendered a personal interview with the count desirable. The idea of an invasion of the Low Countries had for some time been growing in certain quarters. Even before the conclusion of peace, Alava, the Spanish ambassador, had warned Alva as to these rumours. On April 5th, Walsingham wrote to Burley, referring in guarded terms and unofficially to the same subject, urging English cooperation and pointing out its importance in connection with the scheme of marriage. 
The upshot was that on July 14th, Count Louis met the king at Lumigny in a house belonging to Madame de Moy, widow of the Huguenot leader, and shortly to be married to Lanou, who was present himself with Montmorency, his brother-in-law Tellini, and others of the anti-Spanish party. The Count's plan was to rid the Netherlands of Spanish rule in the following manner. Flanders and Artois, ancient fiefs of the French crown, were to revert to it, Brabant, Gelders, and Luxembourg, in like manner to be restored to the empire, while England was to have Zeeland. Other arrangements would presumably be made as to Holland and the smaller states. Strozzi was to occupy the King of Spain by a raid on his coasts. Early in August, Louis saw Walsingham in Paris, reported the conference, and advocated the plan. The ambassador answered diplomatically, but wrote to Leicester in terms that showed his strong approval of both the scheme and its propounder. On September 12th, the last step, as it appeared, was taken toward the complete reconciliation between the king and his late rebels. The admiral was at last persuaded by Marshal Cosset to come from Rochelle to the court at Blois. Charles addressed him as Mon Père and deferred to his judgment in everything, including the Netherlands enterprise. For the time, the Guise influence seemed to be utterly annihilated, and the amity with England and the preparations for open hostility to Spain progressed steadily through the winter. In the course of the autumn, Alava shook the dust of France off his feet and retired to Brussels, and the Spanish ambassador in England was desired to withdraw. At an interview in January 1572, Smith and Walsingham spoke with much freedom to the king, pointing out that there was a Spanish party in England as well as in France. If they should take advantage of a delay to cause the treaty to be broken off, it might be hard to set it on foot again. Break off, said he. I had rather die. I will satisfy the queen, my good sister, though you be never so stiff. Meanwhile, the marriage negotiations were not forgotten. It was clear by the end of 1571 that Anjou must be given up but Catherine was ready with a substitute in the person of his younger brother, Alençon. In March, we find her pressing for an answer as to whether the Queen could fancy him. The ambassadors also had an interview with the Queen of Navarre, who had followed Coligny to the court, touching her son's marriage, and gave her, as a kind of precedent, a copy of the marriage contract between Edward VI and the French princess, who ultimately married Philip II. But again, the difference of religion stood in the way. Finally, in April, a defensive alliance, which was as far as Elizabeth would go, was concluded between the two crowns. Although it only pledged each party to come to the other's aid in the event of invasion, Charles felt sufficiently secure to allow the expedition to the Netherlands to go forward. About May 17th, accordingly, Count Louis left Paris and on the 23rd was in possession of Mons. Lanoux, following close in his wake, seized Valenciennes with a small force on the 29th. He was well received, but while he was engaged in reducing the citadel, a message from the Count summoned him to Mons and the Spaniards recaptured Valenciennes at once. Alba marched on Mons and laid siege to it. Sieges in those days proceeded slowly, and Louis had time to send for reinforcements. Unfortunately, he selected for the purpose an incompetent officer, Jean d'Angest, Sieur de jean Lee, whom Colony had once had occasion to reprimand in the field. On June 9th, the Queen of Navarre, who had come to Paris in order to make the final arrangements for her son's marriage, died of pleurisy after a short illness. A legend that she had been poisoned long formed one of the stock charges against the Queen Mother. There is as little evidence for it as for most of the similar accusations brought in those days. Pius V had died about a month before. His successor, Gregory XIII, though less rigidly severe, was not more favourable to the match. During this same month, Montmorency went to England to carry out the final formalities in regard to the treaty, the former envoy, Foy, accompanying him. He was received with extreme friendliness and took the opportunity of urging Alençon's suit with the Queen. The Earl of Lincoln went from England on a similar errand, and with him Philip Sidney. Coligny succeeded in raising a force for the relief of Mons. Alba was, however, kept duly informed of his movements, whether by the members of the King's Council who disapproved of the enterprise or, 
according to one report by Anthony Standen, an English refugee said to be the paramour of Barbara Blomberg, mother of Don Jean of Austria. In any case, jean Lee was on July 17th surprised at Kievren, two leagues from Mont, by Alva's son, Don Frederick of Toledo. His force was cut to pieces and himself wounded and captured. A hundred of his men succeeded in reaching Mont, which was closely invested. The reverse was a serious blow to Catherine's plan of operations, for she was not herself prepared for open war with Spain. It was said that compromising documents had been found on jean Lee, proving the king's complicity in the raid. Catherine was, however, a woman of resource. The enterprise had been undertaken largely with a view, if one may so say, to keeping the admiral quiet. This method had failed. It was time to try another. She was certain of an ally, for in spite of a formal reconciliation which had recently at the king's instance taken place between Coligny and the young Duke of Guise, the Duke and his mother at any rate had no idea of foregoing the vengeance to which they conceived themselves entitled. There is little reason to suppose that Catherine bore the admiral any special resentment, or was jealous of his influence over her son, nor would she have let her personal likes and dislikes, if she had such, interfere with the aim of her policy, directed wholly so far as one can perceive, to keeping France tranquil and the house of Valois secure on its throne. At this moment there was every prospect that the dynasty would be continued to another generation. The marriage of Henry, now by his mother's death, King of Navarre, to Margaret took place on August 18th. The next few days were devoted to festivities. On Friday the 22nd in the forenoon, the Admiral was, with a few friends, leaving the Louvre after an audience. As he walked along, he read a letter. Before he reached his lodging, a shot was fired from a window of a house recognised as that of a retainer of the Guises. The ball carried away a finger of one hand, and broke the other arm. Before the house could be searched, the assassin was beyond the reach of pursuit. He was generally believed to be a bravo named Marivel, the murderer of Mouy. An Italian named Tossini was perhaps with him. The news reached the king as he was playing tennis. He swore roundly after his manner and started at once to visit the injured man, to whom he sent his own surgeon, the famous Ambrose Paré, himself a Huguenot. At the same time, he promised a strict inquiry and condign punishment of a culprit when caught. Paris was full of Huguenot gentlemen who had come to celebrate the wedding. All that day and the next, consternation prevailed among them. Many meetings were held, but no definite plan of action was decided on. The court was hardly less frightened. The deed had exasperated the Huguenots without depriving them of their head, all the fair words of the last two years had been thrown away, and the hostility of Spain and the Pope incurred for nothing. On the 23rd, Catherine held a council, at which were present, so far as can be ascertained, her son Anjou, Marshal Tavan, Nemours, Guise's stepfather, Nevers, Birago, now Chancellor, and Gondi, Count, afterwards Duke and Marshal de Retz. It was afterwards noticed that out of the seven, four were Italians and one a Savoyard. Even Tavan's family probably belonged to Vajura, which then was far from France. The result of their deliberations was soon seen. In the early morning of the next day, August 24th, the Feast of St. Bartholomew, the church bells rang. At the signal, armed bands directed by the Guises, the Duke of Angoulême, bastard brother to the king, and other Catholic lords, left the Louvre and went into the streets of Paris. The municipal authorities had received warning of what was on foot and the Paris mob, which needed as little encouragement to massacre Huguenots then as in later times it needed to murder priests, was ready to take its part. A party, led by the Duke of Guise in person, proceeded to the Admiral's house. A few armed men, headed by one Janovich, a Bohemian, hence generally known as Besme, entered the room where the wounded man was lying, and after running him through with a pike, threw him out of a window into the courtyard where Guise was waiting. His body was brutally mutilated and treated with every indignity, being finally hung by the heels to the public gibbet at Montfaucon. During the remainder of that day and into the next, the slaughter went on. The Huguenot nobles who were in the Louvre were brought into the court and killed. The King of Navarre and the Prince of Condé were spared, but presently compelled to profess themselves Catholics. 
Montgomery, the Vidame of Chartres and other Huguenots who were lodged on the south side of a river got the alarm in time to fly. They were pursued by the Dukes of Guise and Aumale for nearly 20 miles, but effected their escape. It was doubtless owing to their being thus occupied that the Guises, as several historians of a massacre have noted, took little part in it after gratifying their vengeance against the Admiral. The total number of victims has been variously estimated. In any case, it amounted to several thousands in Paris alone. Three Englishmen only are reported to have perished. How far the massacre was premeditated has been a subject of discussion ever since. The Spanish ambassador Zuniga wrote that, except as concerned the admiral, it was done on a sudden impulse. La Motte d'Enelon was instructed to tell a similar story in England, and to Walsingham, Catherine insisted on the alleged Huguenot plots, to which the Privy Council reasonably replied that it would have been easy for the king to seize the persons suspected and have them regularly tried. Walsingham, on his own account, mentioned the fact that Montgomery, whom Catherine indicated as a chief object of suspicion, had been with him on the night following the attack on the Admiral, and had spoken gratefully of a king's expressed intention to inquire into and punish the crime. Protestants, not in France only, believed that the scheme had been forming in Catherine's mind since the conference at Bayonne in 1565. Cardinal Michael Bonetti, Pius V's nephew and confidant, had in the early part of the year been sent on a mission first into Spain and thence into France. He was at the court for some weeks in February, and though little is known of what then passed, it seems at least possible that some plan of the kind was discussed. The promptitude, again, with which many of the great towns followed the example of Paris points, in those days of slow communication, to a scheme of at any rate more than a few hours' conception. The news was variously received throughout Europe. Gregory XIII is said to have expressed dismay, but a te deum was sung in Rome. Philip II laughed for almost the only time on record. Alba observed that in Coligny France had lost a great captain and Spain a great foe. The emperor disapproved without reserve, as did most of the princes of the empire, and the Duke of Anjou, on his way to take the crown of Poland in the following year, had to listen to some home truths. In spite of the indignation that was felt by several of her ministers and in England at large, Elizabeth was quite ready, after some decorous expressions of surprise and regret, to accept explanations and allow the alliance to stand and the marriage negotiations to go on. Left without leaders, for besides those that had been slain, Lanou was shut up in Mons, and Montgomery had escaped to Jersey, the Huguenots throughout the country had to take what steps they could for local defence. Rochelle closed its gates, first against Strozzi, then against Biron, sent as governor. Nimes and Montauban resisted the entrance of Joyeuse, left in charge during the absence in Paris of Governor Marshal Damville while Sancerre on the Loire served as a refuge to the Protestants of the centre, their usual stronghold, La Charité, having been promptly seized by order of the Duke of Nevers. The operations for the reduction of these and the other towns held by the Protestants formed the Fourth War. Of these, Rochelle was by far the most important, and to its recovery the most energetic measures were addressed. At first, Charles decided to try the effect of negotiation. He sent for Lanou, who, since the capture of Mont in September, had remained in Alba's camp, and induced him, somewhat against his will, to act as his envoy to the citizens. Biron, who had as yet done little beyond observing the town, in the hope that terms might be arrived at without the use of force, gave facilities for communication, and on November 19th some deputies from within met La Noue at a place outside the walls. The Rochelois were, however, in no mood for listening to any terms and returned, remarking that they had supposed they were going to meet La Noue. The envoy, they admitted, was very like him, but they could not believe it was he. He then persuaded Biron to allow him to enter the town, in order to attempt a direct appeal. There, however, he had no more success and finally was induced to take the command while continuing to negotiate with Biron and to do all in his power to bring the citizens to a peaceful mind. In February, the Duke of Anjou took command of a royal army and the siege was more vigorously pressed. The Rochelois held out, vainly expecting succours from England, though Montgomery with a fleet mainly equipped there succeeded in landing stores. Unfortunately, some jealousy, 
not unusual between Normans and Bretons, estranged him from Lanou, and the two chiefs did not cooperate. On the contrary, almost immediately after Montgomery's appearance, Lanou, finding that his mission as peacemaker only exposed him to insults, and on one occasion to blows, from some of the more hot-headed ministers, left the town and went into the camp of the besiegers, where he remained, taking no part in the operations. In June, the election of Anjou to the vacant throne of Poland put an end to the siege and the war, and the Edict of Rochelle, issued in July, granted fair terms, though less generous than those of some past edicts, to the Huguenots. End of section 3《Section 3 Section 4 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1, The Wars of Religion in France, by A. J. Butler, Part 3. Peace was not, however, to last long. One result of a massacre had been to bring the politiques more openly into line with the Huguenots. Different motives doubtless actuated the leaders, and it is difficult to suppose that the adhesion of the Duke of Alençon, who saw in his brother's absence his own opportunity, can have been due to any but the most purely selfish. But the main influence which consolidated the party and led them to seek common action with the Huguenots was unquestionably dislike of the methods adopted by the Queen Mother and the Italians, and a keen perception of the helpless state to which France was being reduced by the depopulation and impoverishment inseparable from protracted civil war. It is worth noting that not only the Chancellor L'Hôpital, who had the fleur de lys in his heart, but after the death of Tavannes on his way to Rochelle, all the marshals of France, Montmorency, Damville and Cosset, were of this way of thinking. The alliance was looked on with suspicion by some of the stricter Huguenots, like Duplessis Mornay, who did not see what religion had to do with the Duke of Alençon's discontent. But Lanou approved, and joined in inviting the Duke to put himself at the head of a combination. The two younger of the Montmorency brothers, Meru and Torre, are said to have about this time become Protestants, and Torre, who with Navarre, Condé, and the Vicomte de Touraine, a young Gascon noble, was in the camp before Rochelle, added his persuasions to those of Lanou. At the conclusion of peace, the princes returned to Paris, where the preparations for Anjou's departure to his new kingdom were being made. In October, the court started. Charles, whose health was beginning to fail, did not go beyond Vitry, where a long stay was made. Henry, who was not ignorant of his younger brother's ambitions and had no desire to be out of the way when the French crown should become vacant, delaying his journey until the king grew angry and threatened to deport him forcibly. Hereupon Catherine and Henry started, taking with them Alençon and leaving Navarre with the king. On the frontier of a palatinate, they were met by the elector's youngest son, Christopher, and Count Louis of Nassau. Catherine's mind was again turning in the direction of intervention, this time less ostentatious, in the Netherlands. She also wished to guard against the danger of another invasion of France by writers, such as John Casimir would be only too ready to conduct. Carefully, as Alençon was watched by his mother, he managed at parting to exchange a word or two with Louis when promises of mutual assistance passed. The Queen Mother rejoined the King at Reims, and on the road thence to Paris, Navarre and Alençon received a secret message from Louis urging them to escape and join him. The Queen of Navarre, getting wind of a plan, informed her mother, and the two princes were more closely watched than ever. Charles, who had intended to summon a meeting of the estates to Compiègne, abandoned his intention and went to Saint-Germain. Intrigues of every kind went on during the first weeks of 1574. Guise and Montmorency had met as friends, but Catherine contrived to set them at odds again by devising, perhaps in concert with the Cardinal of Lorraine, a story that Montmorency, one of the least rancorous of men, had directed a member of his household to assassinate Guise, upon which Montmorency retired to Chantilly. Alençon wanted the office of lieutenant-general, vacated by Anjou, which the king refused to give him. Meanwhile, Torre and Touraine, with the assent of Lanou, 
had been arranging for a general rising to take place on Shrove Tuesday, February 23rd. As part of a scheme, Alençon and Navarre were to be got away from the court. Thus began the Fifth War. The first part of the plan was punctually executed. Throwing out his forces fanwise from Rochelle, Lanou seized Fontenay, Lusignan, Mel, Saint Jean d'Angely, and Rochefort. The South rose at the same time. If a princess could be got away, all would go well. The Count Palatine Christopher, with a strong force of Germans, was waiting near Sedan, while Guitry, with several companies of Huguenots, lay near Mont, which was garrisoned by Montmorency's own company under Duby, brother to Duplessis Mornay. Guitry's overhaste spoilt the scheme. Instead of waiting till March 10th, the day fixed by Lanou for the attempt, he showed himself in the neighbourhood of Saint-Germain as early as February 20th and persuaded Alençon to escape on the 28th. Mont was to be secured as a place of temporary refuge for the fugitives. On the appointed day, Guitry appeared before Mont with so small a force that B did not deem it prudent to admit him. Alençon did not start. Navarre, Condé, Torre and Touraine, who were waiting outside the castle, had nothing to do but to return. Meanwhile, the Queen Mother was in possession of the whole scheme, which had been revealed to Margaret by Alençon's favourite, La Molle, a worthless profligate who was more than suspected of being her lover, and at her instance reported by him to her mother. Being questioned, Alençon admitted the whole and was pardoned. Henry himself did not deny the plot, but justified his own action. Torre made his escape and joined Condé in Germany. About March 8th, Charles went to Vincennes. He still seems to have relied on conciliation. The Queen Mother lost no time in meeting this new storm. Within a few days, three armies were in readiness. One, under the Duke of Montpensier, was to check La Noue in the west, Another, under his eldest son, to pacify Dauphiné, always a dangerous quarter from its proximity to Savoy, while the third, under Matignon, was destined for Normandy, where Montgomery, who had landed on March 11th, was overrunning the Cotentin. Languedoc was more perplexing. Damville, who governed there with almost vice-regal authority, was inclined, like the rest of his house, to the politique side. It was almost as dangerous to let him alone as to interfere with him. Meanwhile, he was left to pacify his province as best he could. The war was most vigorously conducted in Normandy. On May 25th, Montgomery, after a heroic defence against vastly superior numbers, was captured in Domfranc. He surrendered under a promise of personal safety, but Catherine, vindictive for once in her life, insisted on his execution. At Vincennes, a fresh plot for the escape of the princes was brewing. Many persons were involved in it, and all kinds of wild designs were imputed to them, though, as a matter of fact, its objects seemed to have been much the same as those of a former one. This time the chief organiser was La Molle, in company with a Count Annibale Coconato, a Piedmontese adventurer of the worst type, who had for some time, it would seem, been acting as a Spanish spy about the French court. The execution of the plan was fixed for April 8th, the Thursday before Easter. This time Catherine was kept well informed of the conspirators' proceedings throughout, and on the Thursday morning the gates of Vincennes were shut and the guards doubled. By Friday evening, those of the conspirators who were quick enough, among them Touraine, were in flight. The rest hid themselves in Paris, where they were before long unearthed. La Molle and Coconato were brought to trial, tortured, and on April 30th beheaded. In spite of the interest made on behalf of the former by persons of consequence in France and elsewhere, including the Queen of England, on whom he had made a favourable impression when in England on his master's affairs. Alençon and Navarre were also judicially examined. The whining deposition of the former endeavoured to throw the blame as much as possible on others. Henry replied to the questions in a vigorous memorandum, reciting the circumstances of his life and justifying his action by the treatment that he had undergone. On May 4th, Marshals Montmorency and Cosset were sent to the Bastille. Damville remained at large so long as it was not prudent to go to any greater length with his colleague and brother. 
Attempts had already been made to supersede him by his lieutenant Joyeuse. Now, on the day of the marshal's arrest, Chara Martinengo, an Italian soldier of fortune, was sent with all secrecy and dispatched to bring him alive or dead. Martinengo found him at Pesina, a town devoted to him, and, on being admitted to his presence, was too much alarmed to do more than present a letter from the king, demanding an explanation of the omission to hand over certain troops to Joyeuse. This Danville was quite ready to give, and the messenger returned to be followed in a day or two by an envoy from the marshal, whom the news of his brother's arrest had now reached, demanding fair treatment for him and asserting the loyalty of himself and his family. His letter was received on May 29th. On the following day, Whit Sunday, Charles died. The Queen Mother, left in sole charge of the kingdom until Anjou, now become Henry III, could make his way back to France, wisely resolved not to force the pace. The capture of Montgomery and the consequent cessation of active hostilities in Normandy had eased the pressure considerably, and though she would not forego her vengeance against the slayer of her husband, she had, as a rule, no wish for severity. When Carenton, the last stronghold in the province, surrendered on June 26th, and Guitry, who had been in command there, was brought to Paris, she dismissed him to his own house unpunished. An armistice was ordered for the months of July and August, or as much longer as the king should decide. Strozzi and the Abbe Guadagni were sent to treat with Lanou, bearing the announcement of the truce, and an offer of 12,000 crowns a month, while it should last, for the payment of the garrison of Rochelle. At the same time, she sent by another hand letters calculated to provoke distrust between the citizens and the nobles who had cast in their lot with them. The Rochellois were also allowed to send deputies to the meeting which the Protestants of Languedoc and Dauphiné were holding at Millot. To Damville, Catherine was less conciliatory. Immediately after Charles's death, she had sent again to him, confirming the order for his arrest, of which he appears now to have heard for the first time, and ordering him to give up his government to the Admiral de Villars and the command of his troops to the Prince Dauphin. For himself, he was advised to go to Savoy and await the arrival of the king. His answer was to summon the estates of Languedoc to Montpellier, to lose the capital being bitterly hostile to him, to extend the truce for his own government to the end of the year, and to receive a deputation from the assembly at Milot, where Condé had just been declared the head of a party. For the next three years or so, Danville worked entirely with the Huguenots, though never like his two younger brothers quitting the Roman church. On receiving the news of his brother's death, Henry made all haste to leave Poland. Evading the Polish nobles by a nocturnal flight, he rode hard with a few followers to the Silesian frontier. The route by which he had left France was now barred to him, with Condé and Meru active in western Germany and the Duke of Bouillon at Sedan in full sympathy with the Huguenots. Accordingly, he passed through Vienna, Venice and Ferrara to Turin, whither he summoned Damville to confer with him. Though their meeting was friendly and the cause of the Protestants was pleaded by the king's aunt, the Duchess of Savoy, no important concessions could be obtained from him. On September 5th, he entered his own kingdom at pont beauvoisin where he was met by Navarre and Alençon. The Queen Mother had remained at Bourgoin on the road from Lyon, and on the next day they all entered that city together. The Duke of Savoy had escorted Henry thus far, and before he returned had obtained the retrocession of Pignerol and other fortresses now in French keeping. On September 18th, the Duchess died. On All Saints' Day, the King, his brother, and Navarre received the communion together at Lyon, proceeding afterwards to Avignon, where they took part in a procession of flagellants. The Duchess of Savoy's death was soon followed by those of a Cardinal of Lorraine, and on the opposite side of the Duke of Bouillon. In the west, after the cessation of the armistice, Montpensier captured Fontenay and Lusignan and pressed Rochelle hard during the winter, but the chief centre of activity was in the south. On November 3rd, Danville issued a manifesto calling not only for religious toleration, but for a general administrative reform coupled with the usual demand for the expulsion of foreigners, among whom the Guises were indicated, from office. 
for the settlement of religion a council was to be called, while the States-General should be convened to deal with the political issues. Shortly afterwards, a man was arrested at Montpellier who confessed under torture that he had been sent by Villequier, one of the king's council, to poison Donville. About the same time, he received from Henry, through de Beloy, a friendly letter, followed by the invitation to an interview, which he declined on the ground that Condé might think it suspicious. Henry then talked of putting himself at the head of an army and joining hands with Joyeuse and Ouzès to crush Donville, but nothing came of it, and on January 20th, 1575, the king left Avignon and proceeded northwards. He was crowned at Reims on February 13th and the next day married to Louise de Vaudemont of the House of Lorraine, thus allying himself with the Guises. The marriage was not popular. As a matter of fact, however, the young queen interfered very little in politics. In spite of Henry's gross profligacy, she was always faithful to him and led a blameless and obscure existence throughout his reign. That reign opened unpropitiously. Donville, left with none to oppose him save the Duke of Uzès, himself a Protestant, though a personal enemy of the Marshal, took towns almost as he pleased. The king's disposition seemed to be entirely changed. Instead of a reputed victor of Jarnac and Montcontour, the hardy campaigner, the ruthless accomplice in massacre, men saw an effeminate youth devoted at best to religious exercises, leaving business mostly to his mother and languidly submitting to the influence of a gang of worthless young courtiers. Yet, though enervated in mind and body by self-indulgence, he was not devoid of shrewdness. Throughout his reign, though perfectly aware of the aid which, at all events during the first years of it, Elizabeth was giving to his rebels, he maintained the alliance with England. One of his first acts was to take steps for the continuance of the League of 1572 with that country, and in spite of some opposition on the English side, due to the offence caused by the massacre, it was duly ratified on April 30th, 1575. At this very time, Wilkes was on a mission to the Elector Palatine with the view of suggesting to him the importance of assisting the Huguenots. If he would find the men, Elizabeth would guarantee 50,000 crowns towards the expenses. From certain expressions in Wilkes's instructions, she seems to have hoped that such a show of force would bring the king to terms, in which case there need be no actual breach of her treaty. The Palatine replied that 50,000 crowns would not go far. He asked for 150,000 and undertook not to conclude peace till Calais should be restored to the Queen. She did not provide the whole sum asked for, but in the course of the summer a considerable force of writers was levied and entered France later in the year under Torre and John Casimir. In March arrived deputies from the various Huguenot centres with proposals for peace. The principal points required were, as usual, the observance of the Edict of January with the addition, which henceforth was to figure in all similar proposals, of the condemnation of the massacre and the reversal of all sentences pronounced on the victims and their families. The king was inclined to reject the terms at once, but it was thought more expedient to try what could be done to destroy the cohesion of the insurgent provinces. Fair promises were separately made to Rochelle and La Noue, to Condé, and to those of the South, on the condition that they should abandon Domville, now the prime object of dislike to the Catholic party, and stronger than ever, owing to the assistance given him by Turenne, who was busy in Auvergne. The only result seemed to be to stiffen the deputies' demands. The king was to pay 200,000 crowns towards their expenses. The marshals Montmorency and Cosset were to be released. The Queen of England, the Elector Palatine, the Duke of Savoy and the Swiss were to be parties to the peace. The Italians Retz and Birago were to have no hand in the negotiations. This last clause was doubtless aimed specially at the Queen Mother who, as Dale reported, worked entirely with the Chancellor Birago. In the end, the deputies departed unsatisfied, though the king was ready to yield on such points as the assembling of the states-general. Warlike preparations were resumed, and meantime efforts were made, Dale thought by the Duke of Guise, to breed jealousy between Navarre and Alençon, now Duke of Anjou, and Monsieur. 
by means of a notorious Madame de Sauve, wife of one of the secretaries of state. An early instance of that employment of affairs of gallantry as a political instrument, which the Queen Mother was presently to develop into a fine art. At the same time, Guise, possibly foreseeing the result of a conflict between himself and the king, endeavoured to win over Navarre. The English ambassador's reports during the summer describe a state of complete disorganisation throughout the country. Paris was full of brawls and murders. No money could be got for state purposes. Desultory fighting went on in the provinces. The capture and execution of Montbrun in July did nothing to loosen the grip of the Huguenots on Dauphiné. Lanoux failed in an attempt on Niort, but captured Benon, a stronghold commanding the route by which supplies reached Rochelle from Poitou and extended a hand to Touraine. The whole of Perigord was reported to be in arms. The king began to suspect a fresh attempt of his brother to escape, this time with the connivance of their mother, who seems to have been pleading the cause of her youngest son. If the brothers were to become hopelessly estranged, the game would be wholly in the hands of the Guises, and this she was determined to prevent. Nor did she wish to see the dormant negotiations for his marriage with the Queen of England, and with them the English alliance, altogether fall through. Matters were brought to a head by the escape of Monsieur on the night of September 15th. Guitry and other gentlemen joined him, and by the time he reached Dreux he had a following of three or four hundred. Consternation reigned in the court. The Queen Mother started to try persuasion, but before she reached Dreux, the fugitive had issued a proclamation announcing the loyalty of his intentions and his desire for nothing but the reform of abuses, and was on his way to join Lanoux and Touraine in the west. Immediately on the arrival of the news at Strasbourg, Condé, though mistrustful of Anjou as an ally, ordered Torre and Clervent to start at once with such force as he had. Guise, who was watching the passes of the Vosges, but owing to the disaffection of Champagne with an inadequate force, fell back before him, keeping on the right flank of the invaders. On October 9th, both armies were about 60 miles from Paris, Guise at Fim, Torre at La Ferrantarde Noire. Thence Torre turned south to cross the Seine, but by this time the king had succeeded in sending considerable reinforcements under Biron and Retz, and Guise, with a force double that of the invaders, drove them back to the Marne at Dormont. After a sharp fight, in which Guise himself received a severe wound in the face, of which he bore the scar to his dying day, the writers were routed. Clervent was taken prisoner, but Torre, with some 1,200 horsemen, made his way to the Seine, which he crossed at Nogent, and, after cutting up a force under Martinengo at Montargis, joined Monsieur at Vaton, having effected his main object in drawing the royal force eastward. Meanwhile, the Queen Mother, more vexed, as reported, than she had ever been in her life, continued her pursuit of her son, and on September 30th, being at Chambord, he came to meet her in the neighbourhood of Blois. His conduct during this period was regarded as discreet, and Catherine was willing to agree to his terms. The first of these was the release of Montmorency, and on October 3rd he and Cosset were allowed to go to their own houses on parole, which was presently exchanged for complete freedom. Their services were at once required to conduct the negotiations with Monsieur. Dale considered that the situation was not unlike that of the wars of a bien public, but with the difference that there was now no Louis XI alive. Monsieur continued his retreat to chatillon sur andre whence he returned as far as Loche for another meeting with his mother. No conclusion was arrived at, and he went further into Poitou, while she repaired to a house of the Duke of Montpensier's at Champigny. On November 8th, a truce, to last till about Christmas, was agreed to at Marigny. Certain towns were to be granted to Monsieur, and a large contribution was to be made towards the pay of Condé's writers. Montpensier, Montmorency, and Cosset were appointed to execute the terms, which were ratified at Champigny on the 21st. Anjou at once notified the Queen of England, somewhat apologetically. At the same time, he expressed to Walsingham a hope, which the King, in a subsequent dispatch, endorsed, for a successful issue to the marriage negotiation. From truce to peace was, however, yet a long way. The Queen Mother might labour for it tooth and nail, 
but Condé was no party to the arrangement and had no confidence in the king's good faith. Nor was it easy to persuade the Reiters to forego the facilities for a profitable campaign offered by the defenceless state of France. The Huguenots thought that the presence of their chief with a powerful army would be a better guarantee than any number of towns in the hands of Monsieur. On the other hand, the Pope was not expected to approve, while the Guises and the Italians were against any sort of peace. Then the people of Paris, though desirous of peace, objected to being taxed for the benefit of Reiters, and some of the towns assigned to Monsieur demurred strongly to being thus disposed of. When the year ended, no one had much hope. About the beginning of January 1576, Condé, Meru, and Jean Casimir entered France near Sedan. They marched rapidly through Champagne, Burgundy, and the Bourbonnais, Mayenne helplessly watching them. They reached Vichy about the beginning of February. The king and his mother, who returned to Paris on January 25th, fortified the capital as best they could and sent to Germany for troops. Anjou, who was lying in the Limousin, began to move eastward on learning that Condé had reached the centre of France. On March 11th, the two forces joined at Villefranche, Allier. The beginning of February was marked by another incident, which, though it created some perturbation, did not at once affect the course of events. On February 3rd, the King of Navarre, under pretext of a sporting expedition, escaped from the court with a few friends, and, riding hard, reached Alençon in time to attend the Protestant service on Sunday the 5th. A few days later, at Tours, he publicly abjured Catholicism. No attempt was made to bring him back. On the contrary, his sister was allowed to join him with anyone else who cared to do so, and his personal property was sent after him. Contrary to the general expectation and indeed to an intention expressed by himself, he did not join Condé and Anjou, but remained in Poitou. He sent, however, his own demands to be forwarded with those of the Confederates, including a request to the king to aid him in recovering from Spain the part of his kingdom annexed by Ferdinand the Catholic. The armies, numbering some 30,000 men, lay at Moulin till the end of March. John Casimir, who never in his life trusted Frenchmen, least of all French Catholics, took up his quarters in a house at La Guerche, belonging to the Duke of Nevers, with his army between the Allier and the Loire, and set to work to throw a bridge over the river below that point. From Moulin, a memorial in 93 articles was sent in which the demands of the Huguenots and their politic allies were embodied. They comprised the usual request for freedom of religion, subject, however, to the prohibition of any but the two at present professed, for indemnity on account of acts committed in the war, for the addition to the Parlement of Chambre mi parti, composed of Catholics and Protestants in equal numbers, and for the restoration of civil status and privileges. One clause is remarkable, and was probably due to Danville, who in a former memorial had complained of the lack of education in France. The king is requested to appoint in every cathedral church the revenue of one prebend to provide a college for the teaching of children. This is marked, cannot be granted. The Queen of England was in communication with both John Casimir and Anjou, and in April sent over Randolph to watch the course of events, especially to find out whether the king had any designs on Holland and Zeeland. Montmorency, much broken in health from his imprisonment, went to Moulin, and the Queen Mother hovered between that place and Paris, finally establishing herself near Saint. The Huguenots continued to levy contributions on Berry and the Nivernais, and some of Condé's horsemen pushed nearly to Montereau. The king was ready enough to grant peace, which was delayed mainly by Casimir's suspicions. Finally, terms were agreed to on Easter Eve, April 21st, and ratified by the Edict of Bolio on May 6th. They were the best on the whole that the Protestants had hitherto obtained. The exercise of their religion was allowed everywhere, save within two leagues of Paris. In no case were private houses to be searched, chambres mi parti were to be set up, Amnesty was carried back as far as the negotiations for the surrender of Havre in 1562. Eight towns of refuge were granted. 
Certain other concessions sworn to by the king were not included in the edict. Of these, the most important were the grant of La Charité to Monsieur and that of Perron to Condé. The peace was known as the Peace of Monsieur. Casimir obtained promises of lands and a pension from the king, the town of Chateau Thierry from Monsieur, various honours and dignities, and pay for his men. The summer was, however, far advanced before they were got out of France, and a longer time elapsed before they saw their pay. It became at once apparent that the peace was not destined to last. The Guises refused from the first to be parties to it. The edict was not published in any parlement save that of Paris, and at Paris and elsewhere the clergy preached a boycott against the Huguenots. Persuasion and intimidation were alike resorted to. At Rouen, the Archbishop Cardinal de Bourbon, with the most benevolent intentions, entered a Protestant place of worship and, mounting the pulpit, began to address an exhortation to those present, only to see the congregation disperse in some panic. Guise hanged two Protestant captains serving under him. Near Bordeaux, Protestants were massacred. Picardy entirely refused to receive Condé, and Humière, the governor of Peron, who had a private quarrel with the Montmorencies, founded a league of the province for his exclusion, which, being adopted as a precedent by other provinces, rapidly developed into the formidable organization which kept civil war alive in France for twenty years. It was believed that the original outline of this league was due to the Cardinal of Lorraine and dated from the termination of the Council of Trente and that its full development was only delayed till the young Duke of Guise should be of age to take the control of it. Beginning with a statement that it was formed for the protection of Henry III and his successors, its articles established an imperium in imperio, claiming an allegiance more peremptory than that due to the king, and even threatening the lives and goods of recalcitrant members. These articles were secretly circulated, and received many signatures, including in December that of the king himself. He was practically forced to adopt this course as the only means of taking the wind out of the sails of the Guises, in whose interest the League had almost avowedly been formed. Its formation was duly reported to and approved by the King of Spain and the Pope. The States-General had been convoked to Blois and held their first meeting on December 6th. The elections had been looked after by the Guises, and the deputies for the nobility in the Third Estate were almost exclusively such as were opposed to the edict. The cahiers, or memorials, sent up by the provincial estates were without exception adverse to toleration. The fears of Duplessis seemed likely to be better justified than the more sanguine anticipations of Lanou, who had spent the autumn in efforts to maintain the good understanding between the king, monsieur, and the Huguenot chiefs. His head was still full of a scheme of intervention in the Netherlands, to which Monsieur, it was thought, with the King's assent, was again turning his thoughts. On Sunday, October 7th, Dale had presented his successor, Sir Amya Poulet, to the King and Queen Mother. Both ambassadors received assurances that the ill-treatment of Protestants in Paris should be checked, accompanied by friendly phrases as to the amity between the countries. Yet the pendulum was undoubtedly beginning to swing towards Spain. In the latter part of October, Don John of Austria, passing incognito through France to take up the government of the Netherlands, had seen the Queen Mother at Chenonceau and Guise at Joinville. About the same time, Lanou had found it expedient to quit the court, his views in regard to the Low Countries having brought him into disfavour. Approach to Spain necessarily involved coolness towards England, and while in May 1576, immediately after the peace, Dale had reported that Her Majesty's friends are much increased in countenance and force, just a year later, Poulet writes, England never had fewer friends at the French court than at this present. The estates declared almost unanimously in favour of one religion only, and on January 1st, 1577, the king announced in their assembly that the edict had been extorted from him by force, and that he did not intend to keep it. The Huguenots at once prepared for war, which indeed had been already begun with a capture by de Luin of Pont-Saint-Esprit-en-Dorone, whence Doré had to fly precipitately. 
Their position was far less favourable than it had been nine months before. Monsieur, whose fidelity to his late allies had long been suspected, had on January 30th in the Assembly of Nobles at Blois, in company with the Guises and Nevers, who had lately spoken of him as hated by one side and not trusted by the other, signed a formal promise to aid the king. He carried it out by leading an army to besiege La Charité, which had refused to admit him. It capitulated in May, but this did not prevent a general slaughter. Thence, Monsieur proceeded to Issoir, the capture of which was attended with even greater cruelty. End of section 4《Section 5 of Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1, The Wars of Religion in France, by A. J. Butler, Part 4. The chief operations of a sixth war, however, took place in the West. The Duke of Mayenne was in command of a king's forces here, Guise being, as usual, sent to Champagne. Mayenne took tonnay charente and Maron in May and proceeded to lay siege to Brouage, a town commanding the entrance to the harbour of Rochelle, which La Noue had fortified and Condé garrisoned. The siege was not conducted with much energy, and it was not till August that the place surrendered on terms which in this instance were duly kept. Rochelle was at the same time rather loosely invested by a fleet under the younger Lansac, whose main exploit, performed after peace was concluded, was to capture some English merchantmen, no doubt bringing supplies to the town an act construed in England as the sign of a hostile combination between France and Spain. In the south, the Huguenots had lost their ally, Domville, who, after at first proposing a scheme for calling in the Turk to make a diversion on the coast, subsequently quarrelled with the Protestants, and in May declared for the king. His brothers, Meru and Torre, however, were staunch to the cause. Elizabeth, who all the summer was in constant communication with Casimir, was at last persuaded to send a sum of £20,000 to enable him to levy a fresh force for the aid of the Huguenots. In spite of Poulet's diplomatic evasions and denials, the Queen Mother was aware of what was going on and knew that Navarre had no funds to levy mercenaries for his own defence. To this, more than to anything, was due the prompt opening of negotiations after the capture of Brouage. Navarre, whose heart was never in the war, had begun to treat in June, almost before Condé's envoys to the Queen of England and Casimir had even left Rochelle. On September 15th, the treaty was concluded at Bergerac, the terms being slightly less favourable to the Huguenots than those of the previous year, but forming on the whole a satisfactory modus vivendi, which sufficed to preserve at least official peace, with one trifling interval, for the next eight years. The relations with England also improved. The Queen had indeed to arrest some French ships in English ports, in order to secure the release of those taken by Lansac, but neither side had any desire, in spite of Poulet's inveterate suspicion of French duplicity, for a serious rupture, which would only have played into the hands of Spain. Elizabeth and Catherine understood each other thoroughly, and the policy of both was directed to the same end, the securing of internal tranquillity, in order to allow their respective countries to recuperate and consolidate their forces. Neither was desirous of being too far outstripped by the other in the attainment of this result, and therefore each was not unwilling, when occasion served, to keep sedition alive among the subjects of the other. Each, too, had her moments of inclining to the advances of Spain, and each had her domestic zealots to hold in check, zealots equally capable, as the event showed, of carrying zeal to the point of rebellion and regicide. The shiftiness perceptible at times in their respective methods was no doubt largely due, in Elizabeth's case, to dislike of abetting rebels, in that of Catherine, apart from her Italian blood and training, to her consciousness of the ease and secrecy with which, as a continental power, France could be attacked, and the consequent necessity for rapid decision in moments of sudden danger. As usual, the Peace of Bergerac was followed by complaints that its terms were not being properly carried out, and by sporadic outbreaks of actual hostilities. To put a stop to these, in August 1578, 
Catherine, accompanied by several of the principal councillors and by the Queen of Navarre, who had not seen her husband since his departure from the court, started on a prolonged tour through the south. During the winter, conferences were held at Nerac, at which the two parties met for the first time as almost equal powers, and in February, articles explaining and confirming the provisions of the last edict were drawn up and agreed to by both sides. The Catholics were, however, far from being content. At a council in January 1580, we find the Catholic clergy, Cardinal Birago and the bishops of Lyon and Valence, strongly in favour of renewing the war. The laymen were opposed, and when Malassis suggested that it might be necessary to provide funds from vacant benefices and tithes, the bishop of Lyon indignantly denounced the proposal as an heretical opinion. In spite of the lack of funds, war broke out in the spring. It began with the seizure by Navarre of Cahors, a town which formed part of his wife's dowry, but which he had never been allowed to occupy. Its capture was a remarkable feat of arms involving several days street fighting. Biron was sent into Guienne, but the king had no wish to crush Navarre and leave the Guises predominant. The remainder of a war in the south is a record of desultory skirmishing and attempts on insignificant fortresses. In the north, the only operation of any importance was the siege of La Fere in Picardy. Condé, chafing at his continued exclusion from the government of his province, had taken possession of the town. He afterwards went to seek help in England, but Elizabeth had other plans in hand. The town stood a short and not very vigorous siege, finally capitulating on easy terms, and this series of conflicts, dignified by the name of the Seventh War, was terminated in November by the Peace of Flex. Its terms differed in no material respect from those agreed to at Nerac. So early as 1577, overtures from the Netherlands had been made to Anjou, and in the summer of that year his sister, the Queen of Navarre, under the pretext of a visit to Spa, had passed through Artois and Hainaut, and had exercised her fascinations on some of the nobles of those provinces, with a view to securing their interest in his behalf. By the middle of 1578 his plans were generally known, and generally disapproved, sincerely by the King of Spain and the Pope, ostensibly by the French King and his mother. In England a notion prevailed that the League had a hand in it, and Edward Stafford was sent to France to dissuade the government from furthering the scheme. Shortly afterwards, Cobham and Walsingham, who were about to go on an errand of mediation to the Low Countries, were instructed to do what they could to hinder the reception of Anjou. Before they started, however, this part of their instructions was cancelled. The Queen had another scheme in her head, which, without directly thwarting Monsieur's plans, would enable her in a great measure to regulate his movements. Stafford brought back a letter from the Queen Mother, accepting in very cordial terms a suggestion that the suspended marriage negotiations should be renewed. Envoys from the suitor himself quickly followed. He paid more than one visit in person to England, and in 1581 a commission composed of many of the most notable persons in France went over to arrange the terms. It is difficult to suppose that Elizabeth ever seriously intended to marry a dissolute and ill-conditioned youth who might, so far as age went, have been her son, but she kept him dangling for many years until his plans for sovereignty in the Low Countries were obviously doomed to failure and all danger of the alternative marriage with an infanta of Spain was at an end. His doings in the Low Countries hardly concerned the progress of a religious conflict in France, except in so far as they served to draw off a large part of the fighting power of the Huguenots and kept ill-feeling alive between France and Spain. The political history of the years following the Peace of Flex is of extreme complexity, but shows the growth of a pronounced hostility between France and Spain. Anjou's enterprise, and in a less degree the coquetting of the Queen Mother with Don Antonio, the claimant for the throne of Portugal against Philip, had led to considerable animosity on the part of the latter towards the French court. In February 1582, we even find Cardinal Granville, who three months before had seemed in favour of the marriage of Anjou with the Infanta, hinting at the possibility of an alliance with England to chastise France. Overtures were more than once made to the King of Navarre, and on one occasion at least reported by him to Catherine. 
He was himself by no means in entire harmony with the extreme section of his own party, whose leader Condé was not satisfied with the terms agreed upon at Flex, and refused to promulgate them in the Protestant towns of Languedoc. Turenne, however, succeeded in inducing Condé to meet Navarre, and made the proclamation in his absence. Condé appears at this time to have cherished some fancy of carving out a separate state for himself in the southeast of France, a scheme with which Navarre, who throughout never forgot that the crown would in all human probability one day be his, was not likely to sympathise. Condé and his section again were inclined to turn for aid and alliance to John Casimir, between whom and Navarre no love was lost. On the other hand, Casimir had designs upon the bishoprics of Metz, Toul and Verdun, and was in frequent communication with the Duke of Lorraine and Guise. He was jealous, too, of Anjou's intervention in the Netherlands, where he himself had failed, and was on bad terms with the Prince of Orange. Navarre, in short, acted throughout, in spite of his apparent levity, as a statesman, Condé as a somewhat narrow partisan, Jean Casimir as an adventurer, though with a dash of principle, Guise as an unscrupulous player for his own hand. Among the negotiations and combinations actual or attempted of these years of intrigue, there was one antagonism which nothing could reconcile. However the sides might at any moment be made up, Henry of Navarre and Henry of Guise were always opposed to one another. There was no personal antipathy between the two, such as seems to have existed between Guise and the king. Indeed, they had been friends in their younger days. Nor was the antagonism based, it may safely be said, on any fervour of religious conviction on either side. Yet these two were instinctively felt to be the natural leaders of the contending causes, and neither, it was thought, deemed himself secure so long as the other lived. As soon as Anjou's death had simplified the issues, and the head of the Huguenot party had become the next in succession to the throne, the first object of the leaguers was, as will be seen, to legalize their position by securing not, indeed, after the fashion of the earlier Huguenots, the person, but at least the adhesion of the king, and to Guise was entrusted the management of the operation. In November 1582, we find Navarre reminding the king of his former offers to assist in annoying the king of Spain. Curiously enough, at the very same moment, Henry was being urged by the papal nuncio not to forget his amity with that power. Anjou's treacherous attempt, two months later, to seize and sack Antwerp, though baffled by the promptitude of the citizens, while it terminated his chances of success in those parts, still further embittered the relations between France and Spain, for, in spite of protestations, Philip was well enough aware of Henry's complicity in his brother's adventure. It was doubtless as a result of this fresh aggravation that the overtures already mentioned were made to Navarre. Negotiations of a kind were, however, also going on with Anjou himself, who, soon after his repulse at Antwerp, had approached Parma with what is best described as an offer to be bought off, and communications passed between Anjou and the agents of Parma. In November, a report was current in Paris that the Duke intended to sell Cambrai, which he had occupied at the outset of his expedition, to Spain, which he himself denied. He had left the Low Countries for the last time in the previous month. In February, he visited Paris and was well received by his brother. Some envoys from the Low Countries accompanied him, and it was decided to renew the enterprise, this time with the king's definite adhesion, the reversion of the sovereignty over the provinces being secured to him in the event of Anjou's dying without heirs. Anjou himself presently fell ill at Chateau Thierry, whither he had retired, and died on June 10, 1584. During this time, the Guises and Navarre had been watching the course of affairs and endeavouring to adapt their policy to its various turns. When it became clear that Anjou would neither succeed in the Low Countries nor marry the Queen of England, little time was lost in reviving the relations with natural allies which his enterprises had somewhat interrupted. In June 1583, Ségur Padayen was sent by Navarre on a mission, first to England, then to the Prince of Orange, and later to the German princes. The Guises on their side, while actively intriguing with Spain, Spain and forming plans for an invasion of England, were careful to keep in touch with the French court. 
In the summer of 1583, we hear of an ingenious suggestion on the part of Guise and Mayenne that the former should take charge of an army to be levied by the Queen Mother on the frontier of Flanders, while the latter should find the money for a fleet and effect a diversion by sea in favour of Don Antonio. Catherine was, however, too doubtful as to the ultimate destination of these forces to accede to the proposal at that time. Guise remained about the court, scheming in silence. The Duke of Guise, wrote the English ambassador, saith little, and then he commonly thinketh the most. He had secured the friendship of Joyeuse, the rival in the king's favour of Epernon. These two young noblemen, both of whom had recently received dukedoms, may be called the last, as they were the most able of the long succession of Mignon, who exercised so disastrous an influence over Henry III. Joyeuse was of the two most in favour with the Queen Mother. It was thought, to quote the English ambassador again, that she and the Duke of Guise would be glad to hoist the other out. The condition of the country during these years offers a picture of demoralisation hardly to be matched in the records of any period. Peace nominally existed between the two factions, but acts of private war were continually taking place. Indeed, for some time after the Treaty of Flex, Mayenne was carrying on avowed hostilities in Dauphiné. The Catholics seized Perigueux in the summer of 1581. In 1583, there were risings in Languedoc. Duels and assassinations were matters of daily occurrence. The profligacy of the upper classes, as attested by unprejudiced witnesses, was appalling, nor was there much to choose in this respect between Catholics and Huguenots, though of, of a few serious-minded men who have left any record, the majority are perhaps to be found among either the Protestants or the politiques. Offices of every sort were freely bought and sold, Indeed, they were hardly to be obtained without payment, and justice suffered accordingly. The king, who, though himself one of the worst offenders, was in his better moments neither stupid nor callous, saw and deplored the disorder into which his realm had fallen, and made spasmodic efforts for reform. But the life he led was not of a kind to brace his will, while his own whims and the luxury of his favourites demanded never-ending supplies of money. The sale of offices went on, necessaries of life were subject to heavy and arbitrary taxation, public debts were unpaid, Swiss envoys sent to demand the pay long overdue to their countrymen who had served in the royal armies were told that the king had no money, though a million had just been spent on the celebration of Joyeuse's marriage with a sister of a queen. Anjou's death, followed a few weeks later by the assassination of the Prince of Orange, cleared the situation materially. No life, except that of the childless Henry III, now stood between Navarre and the crown of France. The death of William left him without question the most prominent champion of Protestantism on the continent, while it removed the leading advocate of French intervention in the Netherlands. At the same time, the conjunction of events forced Elizabeth's hand. The fiction of amity with her good brother, the King of Spain, was worn very thin, while with the life of her suitor, her great asset in negotiating a French alliance had disappeared. She made one more effort, sending an embassy in February 1585 to invest Henry III with the garter. At the time when a deputation from the Netherlands was in Paris with a last appeal to him to assume the sovereignty. For a moment the king seemed inclined to respond favourably and returned a spirited answer to Spanish threats, but the activity of the League left him no choice and the offer was declined. Before the end of the year, Leicester, with an English force, had landed in the Low Countries. Before these events, however, a definite alliance had been formed between the chiefs of the League and the King of Spain. On January 2, 1585, a treaty had been signed at Joinville, by which the succession to the crown was vested in the Cardinal of Bourbon, to the exclusion of Navarre and Condé, his elder brother's sons. Philip promised a monthly subsidy of 50,000 crowns to the funds of a party, and neither ally was to treat independently with the King of France. Thus the League assumed the position of a sovereign power, while the opposing forces were once more clearly divided, and in alliance with Spain confronted the Huguenots, supported by such aid as England could overtly or covertly afford them. The struggle, though localised for the moment, really embraced a good deal more than French interests. As the King of Navarre's secretary wrote to Walsingham, France is the stage on which is being played a strange tragedy, in which all Christendom has a share. Many persons will come on, if not in the earlier acts, at any rate in the later. 
one important question still remained unsolved. Which side would the King of France himself take? Henry's personal and political preferences drew him, and in a less degree his mother, who seems to have had some scheme for the devolution of the crown to the children of one of her daughters, either of Spain or of Lorraine, towards Navarre and the English alliance. Yet he was, after all, the eldest son of the church, and as such could hardly join openly with those whom the church regarded as her deadly foes. At this juncture, an event took place which at first seemed likely to prove of considerable advantage to the League. In April 1585, Gregory XIII died and was succeeded by Cardinal di Montalto, who owed his promotion to Pius V. He took the name of Sixtus V. Gregory had resisted the pressure of the Leaguers to give a formal sanction to their proceedings and would go no further than a vaguely expressed verbal approval. Neither bull nor brief will the League get from me, he is reported to have said not long before his death, until I can see further into its game. Sixtus was at first in doubt. Much as he disapproved of heresy, he was little better disposed towards rebellion, and though he had no great esteem for Henry III, he, like most Italians, had no desire to see the power of Spain increased. Finally, however, he yielded so far to the persuasions of the Duke of Nevers as to send a brief to the Cardinal of Bourbon. As yet he would not issue the desired bull, nor proceed to the excommunication and deposition of Navarre. Henry III himself, throughout the latter part of 1584 and the beginning of the following year, was struggling as best he could against the toils that were closing round him. As soon as it became clear that his brother's life was drawing to a close, he had sent Epernon to Gascony to try if Navarre might by any means be induced to cut the ground from under the feet of the League by returning to the church. There were divided councils at the Bernays court, but in the end Mornay and the stricter party prevailed. Navarre offered the king all the aid in his power against the disturbers of the realm, but declined either to change his creed or to come to court. He was under no illusion as to his own position and was taking his own precautions. Towards the end of March 1585, the king published an edict forbidding all armed assemblies, which was in a few days followed by a declaration dated from Peron in the name of the Cardinal of Bourbon. Beginning with complaints of a favour shown to the Huguenots, this document went on to recite the various grievances under which the country was suffering, sale of offices, excessive taxation, undue preference of favourites, and so forth, and to demand reforms. It concluded with an appeal to all persons for aid, calling on the towns to refuse to admit garrisons, and ending with a promise to abstain from hostilities save against such as shall oppose us by force of arms. Active measures followed immediately. Guise had already secured Chalon-sur-Marne, whither he presently brought the cardinal. This place, commanding the routes by which German levies would naturally enter France, became practically the headquarters of the League till Paris fell into its hands. Attempts on Bordeaux and Marseille failed, but Verdun, Dijon, Lyon, Bourges, Orléans, Angers formed a line of strongholds behind which the Huguenots were helpless while even in the west and south, where their strength lay, they were, of course, in a minority. No time was lost by the League in getting to work. So early as April, an English messenger reported that in the neighbourhood of Boulogne, the Duke of Guise's horsemen had laid wait for and slain a minister and others on their way to the Prêche. In Paris, emissaries of the League were busy among the lawyers and the municipal officials. The University of the Sorbonne was on their side, as well as most of the clergy of the city. The king found it necessary to give orders for the closer guarding of the gates and to forbid the promiscuous sale of arms. About this time, too, he engaged his famous bodyguard of 45 gentlemen, mostly from Gascony. Henry's courage was, however, nearly exhausted, nor could Elizabeth's exhortations and warnings delay much longer his surrender. At the end of March, the Queen Mother undertook a journey into Champagne to see what terms could be arranged with the Guises, and from then till late in June, Miron, the king's physician, went to and fro between Epernay and Paris. So completely did the Leaguers feel themselves masters of a situation that, even while negotiations were proceeding, Mayenne was sent to meet and stop, if necessary by force of arms, the Swiss levies expected by the king. 
An attempt to detach the Cardinal of Bourbon from Vigesis precipitated matters. Catherine, after many grumbles at the inconstancy and irresolution of ces messieurs, was finally intimidated by the manifest strength of a party, and on July 7th a treaty was concluded at Nemours and signed a few days later at Saint-Maur by the King and the heads of the League. It embodied a complete capitulation on Henry's part to all their demands, and bound him to abandon entirely the principle of toleration. The entire northeastern half of France was placed in the power of a house of Guise, and large subsidies were promised to meet their expenses. It was currently said that, when the news of a treaty reached the King of Navarre, one half of his moustache turned white. On July 19th, effect was given to the Treaty of Namur by an edict revoking all that had preceded and reducing the Protestants to the position of a prescribed and outlawed sect. The king did not disguise the fact that he had yielded only to superior force. His hatred of the Guises was only stimulated by his enforced surrender. To the Cardinal of Bourbon he said, I signed the former edicts against my conscience, but with a good will. This one is in conformity with my conscience, but against my will. He left the palace of the Parlement with a gloomy countenance, returning no man's salutation. Even the most experienced of a king's counsellors now inclined to war, but first one more appeal was made to Navarre. Three days after the publication of the edict, Bishop Lenoncourt and Secretary Broulard went on this rather hopeless errand. The king's idea, however, was to gain time by any means, in the hope that either the resources of the League might be exhausted, or that their high-handed proceedings might show the real value of their affectation of concern for the people's welfare. Navarre himself had recently issued a skilfully worded remonstrance contrasting the conduct of the House of Bourbon with that of the half-foreign Lorrainers, reasserting his loyalty and his willingness to be instructed in religion, and ending characteristically enough with a personal challenge to Guise. On receiving news of the edict, he issued a further protest, putting his case with irresistible force. But the time for paper warfare or peaceful negotiation had gone by. An army under Mayenne, with Matignon as second in command, speedily set forth for Guienne. Biron was to command in Saint-Ange, Joyeuse in Gascony, while Epernon received the government of Provence. In this way, the king could, to some extent, control the operations of the League in the south. Languedoc was left in the hands of Montmorency, who was too strong to be meddled with, though some friendly letters addressed to him about this time by Sixtus seemed to show that efforts were being made to win him over. Guise took charge of the east, Mercœur of Brittany and Poitou, Elbeuf of Normandy, Omal of Picardy. The War of the Three Henrys had begun. The news of the Treaty of Namur decided the Pope to take a step to which, in spite of Spanish urgency, he had hitherto hesitated to commit himself. On September 9th, a bull was launched declaring Navarre and Condé incapable of succeeding to the Crown of France, depriving them of their estates and absolving their vassals from allegiance. The effect of this manifesto was not wholly that intended. It was generally regarded as an unprecedented interference with French rights and customs. The Parlement refused to publish it, and addressed a protest on the subject to the king. Navarre himself appealed from it to the peers of France, giving the lie direct to Monsieur Sixtus, self-styled Pope, saving his holiness, and hoping to visit on him and his successors the insult done to the king of France and all the Parlements of the realm. It is said that he contrived to get this document posted up in Rome, and that Sixtus was more delighted than offended by its audacity. He was himself by no means convinced of a policy of a step taken by him under a miscalculation of the sincerity of a king's adhesion to the League. In the earlier half of August, Navarre, Condé and Montmorency had met at Saint-Paul on the confines of Gascony and Languedoc and concerted a plan of action. Condé went into Saint-Ange and, after a slight success over Mercure at Fontenay, sat down to besiege Brouage, which was held by Saint-Luc. Unfortunately, he allowed himself, with a large part of his force, to be drawn off to Angers, where the castle had been seized by a handful of Huguenots. 
Two days before he arrived, the place had been recaptured by part of Dwayos's force, and Conde's army, in presence of superior numbers, had to disperse. He himself made his way to Avranches, and so to England, while Saint-Luc had little difficulty in beating off a reduced force before Brouage. Thus, unfavourably, did the war open for the Huguenots. In Dauphiné, however, Les Deguières continued to hold his own, and Condé presently returned to Rochelle. The winter of 1585-6 was occupied by Mayenne and Matignon with small captures. Navarre wisely confined himself to guerrilla warfare, relieving places that were hard-pressed, cutting off the enemy stragglers, intercepting his supplies and generally baffling the slow Mayenne by the rapidity of his movements. In the spring, Biron arrived in Poitou with the intention of undertaking the siege of Maron, a place commanding the approaches to Rochelle on the north, much as Brouage did on the south. Navarre at once hastened to Maron and fortified it so effectually that when Biron appeared before it in June, a short skirmish, in which he himself was wounded, showed him that the place could only be taken by regular siege. Meanwhile, the negotiations of Ségur, who was now aided by Clervant and backed by a promise of money from the Queen of England, had been so far successful that a powerful German force was set on foot. At this juncture, the Queen Mother undertook the last and not the least courageous of her many journeys in the interests of peace. The king, still fretting under the yoke of a league, had invited Navarre to send some confidential person to the court with whom he might discuss possible means of reconciliation. Rosny, afterwards known as the Duke of Sully, was chosen for this purpose. He had several interviews with the king and his mother and found that the main obstacle was still religion. The envoy argued that by changing his creed, Navarre would bring only himself to the king's side, whereas if this point could be waived, the whole forces of the Huguenots would be at the king's disposal and with such levies as he could make in the Catholic states of Germany and Switzerland would be amply sufficient to suppress the League. An influential deputation of German princes and nobles who arrived at Paris in the course of a summer were prepared to add their persuasions. In October 1586, Mayenne returned to Paris, having done more for the King of Navarre's reputation than for his own, and in no friendly frame of mind towards the King. Finally, an armistice was arranged in Saint-Ange, and in December Catherine and Navarre met at Saint-Brie near Cognac. She consented to a divorce between him and her daughter, who had now entirely deserted her husband and was carrying on some kind of hostilities on her own account, and she suggested a marriage with her granddaughter, Christine of Lorraine. Navarre was to be officially recognised as successor to the crown, and other friendly offers were made. Nevers and Turenne also took an active part in the debate, but, as before, Henry would not agree to the one indispensable condition. A suggested compromise of a truce for one year, during which the exercise of a reformed religion was to cease, was not more acceptable. Disquieting reports of a state of affairs at Paris began to arrive, and Catherine set her face homewards, holding, however, further conferences with Turenne at Fontenay and Niort, whence the news of a Scottish queen's execution recalled her to Paris. Rumour had not exaggerated the threatening position of affairs in the capital. A revolutionary government had been secretly formed, called the Sixteen, as representing the Sixteen Sections of Paris. The leaders at first were mostly lawyers. Étienne de Neuilly, president of the Cour des Aides, who had attained that office by arranging for the murder of his predecessor on St. Bartholomew's Day. His son-in-law, Michel Marteau de la Chapelle, a master in the Chambre des Comptes, Jean, known as Bussy, le clerc, a proctor in the Parlement, and Charles Ottman, collector to the Archbishop of Paris, brother to a more famous man, the eminent Protestant publicist. This body was in constant communication with the Spanish ambassador, Mendoza, and took its orders from the Duke of Guise. One of their schemes was the seizure of Boulogne, with a view to facilitating the operations of a fleet which the King of Spain was fitting out for the invasion of England. This would have the further advantage of affording an easier entrance for a Spanish army into France than was offered by the route through Guienne. Plans were also formed for the seizure of the King's person. Fortunately, there was a traitor in their camp in the person of one Nicolas Poulain, 
a superior police official, whom they proposed to use as an instrument of their schemes. This man, while ostensibly acceding to their requirements, contrived to keep the Chancellor, Chiverny, and the King regularly informed of all that went on, and the plots were for the present frustrated. The advance of a German army held Guise occupied in Champagne, and the King himself presently marched with a force under his own command to take part in repelling them. End of section 5 Section 6 of The Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org, Chapter 1, The Wars of Religion in France, by A.J. Butler, Part 5. Maron fell in February 1587, but Navarre lost no time in providing for the safety of a Huguenot's vital point in the west. Pushing boldly out into Poitou, in May he captured Talmont, Fontenay, saint mexon and Chizay. The news of a German's advance summoned him eastward, but before he had had time to do more than collect his army, Joyeuse, who had so far only retaken some small places in Poitou and had retired to Saumur, advanced again with more determination. Navarre attempted to put himself behind the fortified line of the Dordogne, but was overtaken and forced to fight on October 20th at Coutras in the south of Saint-Ange, where his superior generalship in the face of an army twice as large as his own secured for the Huguenots their first victory in a pitched battle. The action lasted little more than an hour, but it resulted in the complete defeat of a royal army, Joyeuse himself being among the slain. One week later, the Germans, under the command of Fabian von Dona, who, having been headed off from the Loire by the king's army, had made their way as far as Vimory near Montargis, were badly shaken by a spirited night attack delivered by the Duke of Guise. They pushed on, however, as far as Onon near Chartres, where Guise again fell upon them and routed them utterly. Though the French contingent under Châtillon, Coligny's eldest son, fought its way back to Languedoc, the king returned to Paris for Christmas 1587, while Guise, having pursued the remains of a German army as far as Montbéliard, retired to Nancy. Here future plans were discussed, the immediate upshot being that in February 1588 the heads of the League, emboldened by Guise's recent exploits, presented a memorial to the king insolently demanding that he should purge his court and council of all persons obnoxious to themselves, publish the decrees of Trent, and confiscate the estates of all Huguenots. Henry, as usual, temporized, but events were moving rapidly in Paris. The sixteen were entirely under Guise's orders, given through his agent, Mainville. Nothing except Poulain's timely informations frustrated the continual plots against the king's life or liberty. Epernon, who had succeeded Joyeuse in the government of Normandy, secured most of that province, with the goodwill of the Huguenots. Less success attended Secretary Villeroy's half-hearted attempts to detach Orléans and its governor Entrague from the League. The king summoned 4,000 Swiss first to Lagny, then into the suburbs of the capital, and the Parisians in alarm sent to the Duke of Guise, imploring his presence. At Soissons he was met by Bellievre, bearing the king's command not to enter the city, a command which Guise, it was believed with the connivance of the Queen Mother, chose to disregard. On May 9th he entered Paris amid the applause of the citizens and proceeded to her house. She at once sent word to the king, who was much agitated, but rejected the proposal of some of those present that the duke should be put to death on his entry into the Louvre. Presently Guise himself arrived, accompanying the queen mother. Henry received him with words of reprimand, but allowed him to depart unhurt. The next day he came again to the Louvre, after taking counsel with his chief supporters, and in the afternoon conferred with the king at the Queen Mother's house. On the 11th, an attempt to turn all suspicious persons out of the city having failed, the Swiss under Biron were ordered in. They entered early on the 12th and were posted in various parts of the town. The citizens flew to arms and raised barricades in all directions, cutting off communication between the different detachments of the royal forces. The Swiss were attacked and, finding themselves incapable of resistance, surrendered. Marshals Biron and Daumont were received with musket shots and retired into the Louvre, where the king was practically besieged. 
Guise rode through the streets unarmed and showed his complete command of a situation by quieting the people. A long interview then took place at his house between him and the Queen Mother, at which he repeated his former demands, with the further requirement that the conduct of a war against the Huguenots should be placed entirely in his hands. On the 13th they met again. During their discussion, the king, with a few followers, walked quietly from the Louvre to the royal stables, took horse, rode out of Paris, swearing that he would enter it again only through the breach, and made his way to Chartres. The government of Paris remained wholly in the hands of the adherents of the League, appointed to the chief municipal offices under Guise's influence, La Chapelle Marteau becoming provost of the merchants, or virtually mayor of Paris. The two queens remained, the queen mother continuing to act as an intermediary between her son and the League. On July 11th, a fresh treaty was concluded, by which the king practically granted all Guise's demands, undertaking once more to uproot heresy throughout the kingdom, and further to publish the decrees of Tron, to appoint the duke lieutenant-general of a realm, and to convoke the states-general at Blois in October. Epernon had already been removed from the court, and from his government of Normandy, and the king presently dismissed his chancellor, Chiverny, and his four principal secretaries, but refused entirely to go to Paris. Immediately on receiving news of the doings at Paris, Elizabeth had sent Thomas Bodley on a confidential errand with condolences and offers of assistance. Henry III replied gratefully, but said that many of his own subjects had offered their services and that he had no doubt of being able with his own forces to chastise his enemies. The world should see that he would not, as Stafford reported, put up unavenged with so manifest indignities. As a matter of fact, the value of English aid was just then uncertain. The Armada was ready to sail, and for the moment Henry was once more inclined to seek an escape from his difficulties in an understanding with Spain. The legate, Marossini, with the full approval of the Pope and the cooperation of Mendoza, suggested an alliance between the two great Catholic powers. Philip was sounded, but deferred any decision until he should be clear as to the motives of all parties to the proposal. Long before he could be satisfied, the Armada had met its fate, and a Spanish alliance had less to recommend it. On October 16th, the king opened the session of the estates with a speech betraying clearly enough his animosity towards the faction which for the moment was his master, and which held a vast preponderance in the assembly he was addressing. The speakers for the three estates, the Archbishop of Bourges, the Baron de Sonnes, and La Chapelle Marteau were all ardent leaguers. The sessions of the estates continued for the next two months, Guise taking steps for the confirmation of his appointment as lieutenant-general, which would give him supreme command of the forces, and the king revolving in his mind the scheme on which he had been bent since his humiliation in Paris. The Duke of Nevers, who was in command against the Huguenots in the West, was not a keen partisan of the League, and made no effort to press Navarre hard, or to weaken forces of which the king might yet have need. Soon after the destruction of the Spanish Armada, informal communications seemed to have passed between the kings of France and Navarre through Epernon, who had retired to Angoulême. Finally, Henry III deemed himself strong enough to act. Early in the morning of December 23rd, he sent for Guise and the cardinal. The duke went alone into the king's antechamber, where his bodyguard were posted. He had hardly entered the room when he was stabbed, and, unable to draw his sword, fell pierced with many wounds almost on the threshold of a royal closet. He wanted a few days of completing his thirty-eighth year. The cardinal was arrested at the same time and put to death the next day. The bodies of the two brothers were burned, and their ashes thrown into the Loire, lest any relics of them should be preserved. The Cardinal of Bourbon and the young Prince of Joinville, now become Duke of Guise, were arrested, together with the Archbishop of Lyon, La Chapelle Marteau, and other prominent leaguers. Another, if less direct, victim of these fatal days was the Queen Mother. She had been ailing for some time, and had already taken to her bed when her son in person brought her the news. According to one version, he said, Now I am King of France, I have killed the King of Paris. God grant it may be so, my son, was the answer, but have you made sure of the other towns? On January 5th, 1589, she passed away. 
She had been an indefatigable worker in the cause of peace in her adopted country. She had, however, had to contend with causes of strife that reached deeper than she could fathom. The result was that, though virtuous herself, she assented to and utilized the profligacy of perhaps the most profligate court in history, and with no natural tendency to cruelty, has come down to posterity as the main author of a most justly execrated massacre. The news of Guise's death was brought to Paris by a special messenger from Mendoza and reached the city on Christmas Eve. The fury of the Parisians was unbounded. The Duke of Omal was appointed governor and proceeded to plunder the houses of any citizens who were suspected of favouring the king. The royal arms were torn down and the insulting anagram of Vilain Herodes, Henri de Valois, was freely bandied about. Preachers fulminated from all the pulpits, finally working up feeling to such a pitch that the Sorbonne pronounced that the king had forfeited all claim to the crown and that it was the duty of subjects to cast off their allegiance. The warning of the dying Queen Mother was quickly justified, for with the exception of Bordeaux, which Matignon saved, Caen, Blois, Tours, Saumur, and one or two more along the Loire, every town of importance in the country gave its adhesion to the League. An attempt to seize Mayenne at Lyon had failed, and the Duke presently came to Paris, entering the city with a powerful force on February 15th. He was declared Lieutenant General of the Kingdom and took the chief command of the League. The King had lost no time in communicating his action through saint goar Marquis Pisani, his ambassador to the Pope. Sixtus took the death of Guise easily enough, but the execution and arrest of cardinals was a more serious matter. Henry sent Claude d'Angennes, Bishop of Le Mans, to ask for absolution. The heads of the League sent an envoy urging its refusal. Olivares, the Spanish ambassador, added his persuasions, and Sixtus withheld absolution till the Archbishop of Lyon and the Cardinal of Bourbon should be released. About the same time, Mendoza left the court, and at Paris acted henceforth in full accord with, and indeed as an intimate adviser of, the League. Henry was now forced to adopt the only course that promised him even personal safety. Negotiations were opened with Navarre, and on April 3rd a truce was concluded on the terms that Catholics should not be molested by the Huguenots, and that Navarre should bring his forces to the king's aid, receiving Saumur as a cautionary town, and to secure him a passage across the Loire. The matter was not arranged without some difficulty. Henry stood in fear of a papal censure that hung over his head, while many of Navarre's advisers dreaded some treachery. At length the advice of the king's half-sister, Diana of Angoulême, the widow of the late Marshal Francis de Montmorency, overcame his fears, while on the other side Duplessis Mornay was actively encouraging Navarre to accept the king's overtures. Events, too, were pressing. Navarre was advancing by the usual road through Poitou. He had taken Niort and Châtellerault, and made a dash to clear the league out of Argentan. On the other side, Mayenne was marching from Paris and had reached and occupied Vendôme. The legate, Morosini, was made the bearer of some despairing proposals to Mayenne, which were rejected, and he also left the court. On April 28th, the Treaty with Navarre was published, and on the 30th, the two kings met just outside of Tours, where the King of France had fixed his headquarters and summoned the few members of the Parlement of Paris who retained their allegiance. Mayenne arrived in the suburbs during the following week, but after some fighting withdrew. A few days later, the Duke of Longueville and Lanoue defeated at saint a force under the Duke of Aumal, Baligny, who, since Anjou's death, had exercised a quasi-independent sovereignty at Cambrai in the name of Queen Mother, and Mineville, the factotum of the Guises in Paris, the last named losing his life in a gallant attempt to save his guns. The two kings recaptured most of the towns in the Isle of France, though, as it was said, there was not a hovel which did not treat resistance to its king as a feather in its cap. Sixtus now launched his thunderbolt. On May 24th, a monitory was posted up at Rome, directing the king, under pain of excommunication, to release the prelates within ten days, and himself to appear personally or by proxy within sixty days before the tribunal of Peter. The effect was twofold. 
the Duke of Nevers and some of the more moderate leaguers, resenting the interference in the domestic affairs of France, came over to the royalist side. But the bulk of the party was stimulated, and the exasperation reached a greater height than ever. On July 29th, the Royal Army, reinforced by some 14,000 Swiss and Germans, forced the bridge of saint Cloud and proceeded to invest Paris on the south and west. An assault was planned for August 2nd. On the previous day, however, a Jacobin friar named Jacques Clément, having obtained admission to the house in which the King of France was lodging at saint Cloud, sought an interview with him under pretext of presenting a letter and while the king was reading it, stabbed him in the lower part of the body. The wound was not at first considered dangerous, but unfavourable symptoms set in, and Henry expired in the early hours of August 2nd, 1589, after recognising Navarre as his heir, and calling upon all present to acknowledge him. According to one version, he also counselled Navarre himself to become a Catholic, as the only means of securing the throne but it seems doubtful whether Navarre was present at the final scene. The new king was accepted at once by many of the nobles who were on the spot, including the marshals Biron and Daumont, Bellegarde, Do, and others, though even of these several urged his instant reconciliation with the Church of Rome. The risk, however, of alienating the Huguenots by a step which would certainly not conciliate the League, now wholly under Spanish influence, was too great, and Henry found it better to temporize, promising in due course to submit to instruction, and meanwhile to do nothing to disturb the existing privileges enjoyed by Catholics. In spite of this, Epernon and others retired, leaving the army so much depleted that Henry, seeing it useless to make any attempt on Paris, after a brief essay at negotiations with Mayenne, withdrew to Normandy. Mayenne, suspected of having designs on the crown for himself, proclaimed the imprisoned Cardinal of Bourbon as Charles X. After breaking up his camp at saint Cloud, Henry marched with a force of little over 7,000 men into Normandy. Tours was chosen as the temporary capital of a royalist party. Henry's chances seemed for the moment almost hopeless, and it was important at first to keep within easy reach of succour from England. Also, Paris was largely dependent for its food on the district between the rivers Eure and Oise. Thus the scene of war was again that in which the earliest operations had been conducted nearly a generation before, and the siege of Rouen by a royal army was to be one of the last, as it had been one of the first events in the long series of campaigns. At present, however, Henry passed on to Dieppe, whither Mayenne at the head of an army of 30,000 men followed him. The king prepared to meet him at Arc, where a stubbornly contested battle, in which the royal troops had not the worst, was fought on September 21st. An attack three days later by Mayenne on Dieppe itself was foiled, and on the 26th, La Noue and Longueville joined the king, and Mayenne drew his forces off. Henry marched to Amiens, and at the same time came a welcome reinforcement of 4,000 English under Lord Willoughby. After returning to Dieppe to meet them, Henry marched on Paris, with a force now increased to 23,000, and on November 1st captured the Faubourg of Saint-Jacques and Saint-Germain, while La Noue nearly penetrated into the city itself. On the next day, however, Mayenne, who had been on the eastern frontier, came back to Paris, and Henry, after vainly challenging him to fight in the open, withdrew to Tours. In December, Le Mans, Bayeux, Lisieux, and other towns surrendered to Henry. About the same time, the Signoria of Venice decided to recognize him as King of France, and accredited their ambassador to him. By the end of 1589, the king's prospects were far more promising than they had been at his accession. With the exception of the House of Lorraine and their immediate connections, the higher nobility and the best fighting men had rallied to Henry, and his superiority in the field was speedily shown. Soon after the beginning of 1590, Mayenne, having arranged for reinforcements from Flanders, took Pontoise, and laid siege to Moulin, a small town on the Seine. Henry had set out with the view of taking on Fleur, the last stronghold of the League in Lower Normandy, but hastened to the relief of Moulin. On February 25, 1590, Mayenne, disquieted by news from Rouen, left Moulin, 
and Henry at once laid siege to Dreux, thus placing himself between his enemy and Paris. Mayenne, with a force raised to nearly 25,000 by the addition of Flemings under Count Egmont and of Germans, turned back to meet him or draw him away from Dreux. Henry, though with a far inferior force, was ready to accept battle, and on March 14th the armies met near ivry on the eure The result was the complete rout of the leaguers. By the king's order, Frenchmen were spared as much as possible, but there was a terrible slaughter of the foreign auxiliaries, Count Egmont and the Duke of Brunswick being among the slain. Mayenne and his cousin Omal escaped by hard riding. The royalists' loss was not above 500. The road to Paris was now open, and had the king chosen, there can be little doubt that the city might have been taken by assault. Henry appears, however, to have shrunk from exposing his capital to the horrors which this would have entailed. At the same time, he rejected very decidedly proposals for an armistice brought by Villeroy and others, and prepared for a siege in due form. On May 7th, he proceeded to invest the city on the northern side. Saint-Denis and Vincennes remained in the hands of the League, but all the other neighbouring towns of any consequence on that side of the Seine were reduced. On May 10th, the old Cardinal of Bourbon died. He had been brought into the League against his will. Nevertheless, his death was a cause of some perplexity to the Leaguers, as depriving them of even the semblance of legitimate head. An attempt which was presently made by the Cardinal de Vendôme, known henceforth as the young Cardinal of Bourbon, brother to the late Prince of Condé, to form a third party for the maintenance of the Catholic monarchy without Spanish interference, though countenanced to some extent by Mayenne himself, came to very little. Paris was in no condition to stand a long blockade. It was estimated that the available provisions would last the population, reckoned at 200,000, for a month. By the end of May, famine was imminent, wheat was selling at 120 crowns the bushel, and before long horses, dogs and cats had become recognised articles of diet. Even the grass that grew in the streets was eagerly sought after. Mendoza was openly playing the King of Spain's game, even causing coins with his arms to be struck and distributed among the people. Mayenne, after some difficulty and at last only by the aid of peremptory orders from Spain, succeeded in persuading Parma to come in person to the relief of a hard-pressed city. On August 30th, the Duke reached Meur. Henry marched to meet him, and vainly tried to draw him to action near Shell. On September 5th, however, Parma issued from his trenches in full order of battle, with his cavalry spread out in front. Behind their screen, he with his main body made a clever move to the left, seized the suburb of the town of Lagny, lying on the right bank of the Marne, and entrenched himself there. The bridge, which had been broken by the garrison as they withdrew to the town itself, was replaced by a bridge of boats, and on the following day Palma stormed Lagny under Henry's eyes. Thus astride of a river he could revictual Paris at his pleasure, and the king, making a futile attempt at escalade as he passed the city, withdrew to Saint-Denis. Presently he broke up his army, retaining only a flying force, and retired along the valley of the Oise. Parma took Corbeil, which was retaken a few weeks later, but jealousy soon arose between him and the heads of the League, and in November he went back to Flanders, harassed by Henry so long as he remained on French soil. He had, however, rendered an immense service to the League in saving Paris from imminent surrender. In the winter of 1590-1591, to Henry sent Turenne to England and Germany in quest of further aid, returning himself to the neighbourhood of Paris. An attempt by the League to recover Saint-Denis had been repulsed. There were reports of dissensions within the city, where the relations between Mayenne and the Spanish faction, which controlled the Sixteen, were becoming strained. The politiques were gaining courage, and there seemed a chance of effecting a surprise. But the citizens were on the alert, and the scheme failed. More confidence had, however, been given to the whole party by the death, in August 1590, of Sixtus V, who had grown more and more estranged from the League and who, after the brief papacy of Urban VII, was followed by Gregory XIV, Nicolas von Drato. This pope showed himself disposed to carry into effect the promise of material aid, which Sixtus, if he ever made it, had successfully evaded. Henry saw that his tactics of isolating the capital promised best. About the middle of February 1591, he laid siege to Chartres, 
which surrendered on April 19th. At the end of July, the Earl of Essex landed at Dieppe with 4,000 men from England. The States of Holland sent a contingent, and about the same time, 16,000 troops arrived from Germany. Henry was besieging Noyon in Picardy, which fell on August 19th, and being now at the head of an army of 40,000 men, he decided to besiege Rouen, the last important town still held by the League in the north. On November 11th, Biron and Essex opened the siege. In the course of August occurred the death of a veteran Lanoux from a wound received in an attack on the petty fortress of Lombal and the escape of the young Duke of Guise from his captivity at Tours. The king found some consolation in the latter event for the loss of his old comrade in arms. It will, he said, be the ruin of the League, foreseeing that the jealousy certain to spring up between nephew and uncle would open a fresh rift in that faction. In Paris, during this autumn, Mayenne being absent in Champagne, the sixteen took the law into their own hands. In September, a letter to the King of Spain was drawn up, begging him to appoint a sovereign for France, and suggesting for the throne his daughter, whom it was proposed to marry to the young Duke of Guise. They next formed a secret council of ten to deal with persons suspected of being out of sympathy with the dominant faction. And on November 16th, Barnabé Brisson, the aged president of a parlement, a man of much account in the late reign, was with two other eminent lawyers arrested and hanged with barely the form of a trial. Mayenne instantly returned, and by administering similar treatment to four of the sixteen and issuing a stringent edict for the time stopped further outrage. The siege of Rouen went on throughout the winter of 1591 to 1592. The brilliant defence of the governor Villard frustrating the no less brilliant gallantry of the king and his officers. Early in January 1592, Parma again set out to the aid of the League. Henry dashed off with 7,000 horse and came in touch with the invaders on the confines of Picardy. Thence he fell back before them, keeping on their flank and skirmishing whenever an opportunity offered. At Omal he narrowly escaped capture and was wounded for the first and only time. After a brief delay caused by the resistance of Neuchâtel and the difficulty of advancing through a country denuded of supplies, Parma arrived on February 26 at Belencombre, where he was met by a messenger from Villars, announcing a successful sortie and expressing confidence in his own power to raise the siege. Parma therefore contented himself with throwing a few hundred men into the place, retired with Mayenne to Picardy and besieged Roux near the mouth of the Somme. The king, who had been at Dieppe, returned to Rouen and prosecuted the siege with such vigour that Villars sent to Mayenne fixing April 20th as the day on which he must capitulate if not relieved. This brought Parma promptly back, and Henry, whose army had been of late much weakened by illness and secession, had to raise the siege. On the day which Villars had specified as the limit of his resistance, he withdrew to Pont de l'Arche, thus placing himself between the enemy and Paris. Parma, desiring to open the river, took Cordebec, receiving a severe wound during the operations. A day or two later, Henry, reinforced by the Duke of Montpensier, who had secured western Normandy by the capture of Avranches, was ready to take the field again. He had quickly detected the blunder made by Parma in allowing himself to be drawn into a narrow triangle between sea and river, all the naval power being in the hands of his opponents. All that seemed necessary to compel his surrender was to close the landward side, and this the king proceeded to do. He drove Mayenne and Guise before him to Yvetot and Fécamp, and after three weeks of hard fighting was preparing to assault Parma's camp between Cordebec and Rouen. The attack was fixed for May 21st, but when day broke, not an enemy was to be seen on the right bank of a river. Parma, who, though the illness caused by his wound had prevented him from directing his army in the field, had lost none of a resource which had made him the first general in Europe, had secretly collected boats and timber at Rouen. Bringing these down on the ebb, he was able, during the night, to bridge the river, and his entire force was in safety before the royalists suspected what was going on. He marched rapidly up the Seine to saint Cloud and passed on to Flanders without entering Paris, but leaving 1,500 Walloons to reinforce the garrison. Apart from his wound, Palmer's health was now breaking down, and he died before the year was out. 
The king's arms continued to prosper, though he had to lament the loss of several of his best supporters. Francis, Duke of Montpensier, the most trustworthy and capable man among the princes of the blood, Guitry, a faithful servant for twenty years, and the veteran Biron, whose head was taken off by a cannonball before Epernay. Biron and Montpensier being Catholics, the balance within the Royalist party was in a sense shifted in favour of those who, unlike them, were Catholics first and Royalists afterwards. Most of these, however, were too good Frenchmen to endure the domination of Spain, and thus grew up that third party whose object was, while keeping the crown in the actual royal house, to ensure its being worn by a Catholic. A marriage between the Cardinal of Bourbon and the Infanta formed part of a plan. The scheme was revealed to Henry in the course of the summer by the interception of some correspondence and decided him to take a course which some of his staunchest Huguenot advisers now began to regard as unavoidable. Meantime, some of the saner and more patriotic men on the side of the League, notably Villeroy, the ex-Secretary of State, and the President, Jeanin, who for some time past had been working in the cause of peace, had soon after the siege of Rouen renewed communications with Duplessis Mornay and others on the king's side, and terms were actually drawn up and proposed on Mayenne's behalf. Hostilities, however, went on throughout the autumn of 1592, fortune generally favouring the royal cause. So long as Parma lived, the League was not without hope of aid. But the news of his death, which reached Paris on December 4th, while not wholly displeasing to Mayenne, rendered a change of policy necessary. He called a meeting of the States General who assembled at Paris in January 1593. The Spanish party, aided by the Cardinal Legate, Sega, Bishop of Piacenza, strove hard for the election of the Infanta as Queen. Philip sent the Duke of Feria as his special envoy and wrote more than once recalling his own services to the Catholic cause in France. Even Mendoza, though blind and ailing, made a long discourse, crammed with laws, canons, glosses of theologians and casuists. The estates could not be brought to see the blessings of Spanish rule, and in April a conference began at Suren between their deputies and those of a royal party, the archbishops of Lyon and Bourges taking the leading parts respectively. An armistice was declared at the same time, and a guarantee was given by the Catholics on the king's side to their Protestant allies that nothing should be done to prejudice their interests. On May 18th, the king himself wrote to the archbishops, expressing his desire to be instructed. On July 25th, he received absolution from the Archbishop of Bourges, Renaud de Bonne, sometime Chancellor to the late Duke of Anjou, and heard Mass at Saint-Denis. Henceforward, though hostilities were for some time maintained by the remnant of the League, acting avowedly in the interest of Spain, there was no longer any war of religion. Within eighteen months after Henry's conversion, France and Spain were in open conflict. End of section 6《Section 7 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2 — French Humanism and Montaigne by A. A. Tilly, Part 1 The Fall of Florence in 1530 together with the building of the new royal chateau at Fontainebleau and the marriage of the second son of Francis I with Catherine de' Medici, had led to a large influx of Italians, mostly Florentines, into France. On the accession of Catherine's husband, Henry II, to the throne, they began to make their influence felt alike in politics, society, literature, and art. The result was that the Renaissance in France entered upon a distinctly Italian phase of development, which lasted for forty years, though after the first five and twenty of these a species of reaction ensued. At the same time, a change took place in the character of French humanism. Instead of being more or less encyclopedic, it began to specialize in particular branches of knowledge, and in two of them philology and jurisprudence speedily took the lead. The quarter of a century from 1547 to 1572 was the golden age alike of French philology and French jurisprudence. Moreover, French literature, both poetry and prose, 
now received a strong and lasting impulse from humanism, which had hitherto neglected the vernacular language. A few days after the death of Francis I, Adrien Tournebus, 1512-65, known to scholars as Tournebus, was appointed to succeed Jacques Toussaint, Tuzanus, as Regius Professor of Greek at Paris. The difference between these two men marks the change in the character of French humanism. Toussaint was nicknamed the Living Library. Turneb, to call him by the French form of his Latinized name, though a man of wide interest, devoted himself to the task of reconstructing, translating, and commenting on classical texts. His name stood so high in his own day that German professors raised their caps when they mentioned it in their lectures, while to Montaigne's partial eyes he seemed the greatest man of letters the world had seen for a thousand years. His most notable contributions to scholarship were editions of Philo, Aeschylus, and Sophocles, all of which he printed himself in his capacity of king's printer for Greek. His edition of Philo was the first complete one. The merits of that of Sophocles have been pointed out in an earlier volume. That of Aeschylus was of no less value. His other works include Latin translations of Philo and various treatises of Plutarch and Theophrastus, and commentaries on Cicero, Varro, Horace, and the Elder Pliny. In 1564, the year before his death, he published the first volume of his Adversaria, a collection of critical, explanatory, and illustrative notes on passages of classical authors. A second volume was added in 1565, and a third in 1573. The historian de Tout prophesied for it immortality, and scholars may still consult it with profit. His friend and colleague Denis Lambin, 1516-72, though a professor of Greek, made his mark chiefly as a Latin scholar. According to H. A. J. Monroe, his knowledge of Cicero and the older Latin writers, as well as the Augustan poets, has never been surpassed and rarely equaled. He edited brilliantly Plautus, Lucretius, Cicero, and Horace, in his Lucretius, he acknowledges his obligations to Turnep and Jean Dora Auratus, who also held a chair of Greek in the Royal College. Gottfried Hermann is said to have regarded Dora as the most illustrious of Aeschylian critics, and his emendations, though less numerous than those of Turnep, go somewhat deeper. But he is chiefly known as a teacher of genius. For a time he was tutor to some of the royal princes and princesses and in various noble families, one of his pupils being Jean-Antoine de Baif, the future poet. Being appointed about the year 1544 to the headship of the College of Coqueret at Paris, he began to lecture in Greek poetry to an enthusiastic class, which included Baif and his friend Pierre de Ronsard, and somewhat later Joachim du Bellay. Thus the group of French poets known under the name of the Pléiade had its origin in Dora's lecture room. Hitherto Frenchmen had read the great classical authors for their subject matter. Dora taught them to appreciate the perfection of classical form. The leader of this useful band of humanists, who now set themselves to revolutionize French poetry, was Ronsard, but it was Du Bellay who wrote their manifesto. This work, which appeared in 1549 under the title of Défense et Illustration de la Langue Française, is less remarkable for sustained arguments than for its confident and vigorous eloquence, and for its grasp of the vital principle that without style there can be no great poetry. If Frenchmen, Du Bellay says in effect, would make their language illustrious, they must abandon the inferior forms of poetry hitherto in fashion and take for their models the Greek and Latin poets or the modern Italians. They must write odes like Horace, eclogues like Theocritus and Virgil, elegies like Ovid's, sonnets like Petrarch. Poetry is an art, and therefore natural capacity is not sufficient in itself. It must be trained and cultivated by study and labor. 
another important principle, namely that poetic style is distinct from prose style, requiring an embellished and heightened diction, though fully recognized by Du Bellay, is more clearly enunciated by Ronsard in his preface to the Franciade and in his Abrégé de l'art poétique. It is this part of the poetical theory and practice of the Pléiade which from Boileau downwards has been most misunderstood. The borrowing of Greek and Latin words and forms of syntax was only one of the many devices recommended by Ronsard for the purposes of poetic diction. It was the one which met with the strongest opposition, and which, with his usual prudence, he soon greatly modified in his own poetry. In fact, so far from his muse speaking French and Greek and Latin, as Boileau has it, his best poems contain no word or expression which is not of the purest French. On the other hand, a feature of the Pliat poetry which recent research has brought to light is that its direct debt to Italian models is far larger than to classical ones. Petrarch, Ariosto, Bembo, Sanazzaro, and many less known poets of the Italian Renaissance are freely laid under contribution. Another Italian who had great influence on the whole movement was the Florentine exile Luigi Alamanni, who since 1530 had resided at the French court and had received many substantial marks of favor from Francis I. He was a poet of no great originality, but he had a strong feeling for style and was an ardent classicist. Ronsard's pindaric odes resemble his hymns in structure, while Du Bellay, when recommending in his Défense certain kinds of poetry, is possibly influenced by the practice of the Seigneur Louis Allemand. The new school of poetry naturally did not supplant its predecessors without a struggle. But by the year 1554 the victory was assured, and Ronsard was hailed as the Prince of French Poets. His followers were originally known as the Brigade, but now he and six others assumed, in imitation of a group of Alexandrian poets of the 3rd century BC, the name of the Pléiade. His colleagues were Dora, Dubelet, Baïf, Estienne Jodel, Remy Bello, and Pontus de Thiers. In 1560, the crown was put on Ronsard's reputation by the publication of his collected poems in four volumes. It is significant partly of the pedantry of the age and partly of the close connection of the new poetry with humanism that the first book of the Amour was provided with a commentary from the pen of Marc-Antoine Muret, Muretus, who, having abandoned French poetry for classical scholarship, was on his way to become the foremost Latin stylist in Europe. There is no great depth or originality of thought in Ronsard's poetry, no intense passion, but his best pieces are signal examples of the power of style when it has imagination or emotion to support it. The famous ode à Cassandre, the equally fine one beginning Pourquoi chétif laboureur, several of the sonnets to Marie and to Hélène, including the perfect Quand vous serez bien vieille, with many passages in the elegies, hymns, and other longer poems, bear witness that Ronsard was not only a great artist in verse, but a true poet. Du Bellay's genius was somewhat longer in finding its true bent. It was not till 1558, less than two years before his early death, that he produced a really original work in Les Regrets, mostly written at Rome, whither he had gone as secretary to his cousin the cardinal. In form of a sonnet sequence, it departs widely from the favorite Petrarchian pattern. Instead of being addressed to some more or less imaginary mistress, it is a journal intime of the poet's thoughts and impressions, in which he records the ennui of his life, the corruptions of the Roman Curia, and his longing for his native land. Though Du Bellay had a slighter poetic endowment than Ronsard, possessing less imagination and less mastery of his art, he represents almost better the delicacy of perception and the refined grace which are proper to the French genius. It is the latter quality which is preeminent in the well-known D'un valeur de blé. The close relations of the Pliade with the court made its members ardent royalists. This was especially the case with Ronsard, who had been page in succession to two of the sons of Francis I. 
Moreover, like Dubelay, he was dependent on the royal favor for the church preferment, which was in those days the recognized method of rewarding men of letters. It was this attachment to the throne which led him, who had all a humanist aversion from political or religious strife, to take up a militant attitude in the great struggle, and in the Tout Discours des Misères de ce Temps, written towards the close of the year 1562, to throw all the blame of the war on the Protestants. This led to reprisals from the Huguenot camp, and Ronsard was attacked in several venomous poems, which, along with much that was false, contained a certain amount of truth, especially as regards the irregularities of his life and the licentiousness of some of his verses. Stung to fury, he replied in another discours which was too violent to be effective. Moreover, he could not do away with the fact that in his own person he was a conspicuous example of the corruption from which the church was suffering. If Dora's lectures gave a stimulus to French poetry, the work of another scholar largely contributed to the successful development of French prose. In 1559, the year between the publication of Du Bellay's Regret and that of Ronsard's collected poems, Jacques Amiot, 1513-93, formerly a poor scholar of the College of Navarre and now abbot of Balazan, published a complete translation of the lives of Plutarch. The translation of the Moralia, or moral treatises of the same author, followed in 1572, when Amiot was Grand Almoner of France and Bishop of Auxerre, to both of which posts he had been appointed by his former pupil, Charles IX. His Plutarch is one of the rare instances of a translation which has taken its place as an original work in the literature of its adopted country and the secret of its success lies in the double fidelity with which the translator has preserved at once the meaning of the original author and the spirit of his own language. Though Amiot's scholarship is very seldom at fault, he never allows either the Greek idiom or Plutarch's idiosyncrasies to color his own style. And that style, from its high artistic qualities, its feeling for order and proportion and harmony was of the greatest service to a language which, in spite of Rabelais and Calvin, still stood in need of considerable molding before it could become a perfect instrument for the expression of thought. Hardly less important was the influence of Amiot's work on the moral and intellectual development of the nation. In the evil days upon which France had fallen, Plutarch's examples of lofty patriotism were an encouragement and an invitation to her worthier sons. They helped to strengthen the mental and moral fiber of the nation and to prepare the way for her regeneration. Moreover, the moral treatises stimulated that interest in the causes and phenomena of human conduct which, beginning with the essays of Montaigne, has given rise to so many masterpieces of French literature. Another French scholar of this period who did not disdain to cultivate his own language was Henri Estienne, 1528-98. Trained in Latin and Greek from his childhood and endowed with a rare natural instinct for language, he knew Greek as if it were his native tongue. His home was at Geneva, where he had inherited the printing press of his father, Robert Estienne. But with a full share of the restlessness which is so characteristic of the Renaissance, he was a constant traveler, especially during the last 18 years of his life. The best part of his work was done between 1554 and 1579, and it was enormous. About 130 editions of Greek and Latin authors issued from his press, comprising 18 first editions of Greek authors, and such important undertakings as Plato, Plutarch, and an edition of Aeschylus, in which for the first time the Agamemnon was printed in its entirety and as a separate play. They were all, or nearly all, of his own editing, and in spite of the rapidity with which he worked, he was at once a scrupulous and a careful editor. Moreover, owing to his instinctive knowledge of the Greek language, it was the first to show what conjecture could do towards restoring really corrupt passages. But his greatest legacy to scholarship is the Thesaurus Grecae Linguae, 1572. 
After making due allowance to the materials collected by his father and for the assistance given him by the German scholar Silberg, it stands forth as a monument of industry and sound learning and remains to this day the most complete Greek dictionary. He also wrote several French works which, though they bear evident marks of haste, are remarkable not only for their racy and picturesque language, but for the logical construction of the sentences, a rare quality at that time. Three of these writings, 1575-9, to nine, are devoted to establishing the merits of the French language and its superiority over Italian, one of them being especially directed against the prevailing fashion of interlarding French with Italian words and forms. They were signs of the growing reaction against Italian influences in France. The services of Pierre de la Ramée, better known as Ramus, 1515-72, to the French language, were of a different character. His only French writings were of French grammar, a few speeches and prefaces, and a translation of his famous treatise on logic, 1555. But this last is important as almost the first scientific work written in the vernacular, and as a practical expression of Ramos's view that learned as well as popular works should be written in French. It was one of the many reforms advocated by this many-sided and original thinker, whose reforming spirits rather than his actual achievements makes him of such importance in the history of thought. The fame of the Ramist logic was due far less to its intrinsic merits than to its patronage by Protestant universities excepting Oxford. But it still has a historical interest as a revolt against the Aristotelian tyranny. The man himself was greater than his work. As a president of the College of Presle and Regius Professor of Eloquence and Philosophy, he was for more than a quarter of a century power in the university life of Paris. This was due partly to his brilliance as a lecturer, but chiefly to the breadth of his views and the dignity of his character. From humanist logic we turn to humanist jurisprudence. Its pioneer in France was Pierre de l'Estoile, Stella, the grandfather of the well-known diarist who began to lecture at Orléans in 1512. But its real founder was the Italian Andrea Alciati, who, coming to Bourges in 1528, definitely restored the Corpus Juris to the place which had been usurped by the gloss. Under the wise patronage of Margaret, Duchess of Berry, daughter of Francis I, and afterwards wife of Emmanuel Philibert, Duke of Savoy, Bourges became the first school of jurisprudence in Europe, and was illustrated by such names as Baron, Baudouin, Doirin, Dono, Ottman, and, greatest of all, Cujat. The services of Jacques Cujat, 1522-90, the pearl of jurists to jurisprudence, were similar to those of Tourneb in the field of classical scholarship. He resolved the corpus juris into its component parts, purified the text, and enriched it with a commentary. His labors included Papinian, Alpian, Paul, Justinian's Institutes, the last three books of the Codex Justinianus, three books of the Codex Theodosianus, and the Lex Romana Burgundiorum. On the other hand, Hugues Donau, or Danellus, 1527-91, to aimed at a philosophical conception of the Roman law as a whole, a task which was rendered easier by the publication in 1583 of an edition of the whole Corpus Juris Civilis by Denis Godefroy, father of a greater son, Jacques Godefroy. The text was a mere reproduction of earlier editions, but it remained the standard one till the close of the 18th century. The commentary still has some value. Mention also may be made of Barnabé Bresson, a man of great erudition, who wrote a dictionary of Roman law and who paid the penalty of political ambition. Having been appointed to the League first president of the Paris Parliament in the room of the Royalist de Arlet, he was three years later put to death by the stalwarts of the party, November 1591. 
With the almost solitary exception of Brisson, the great French jurors did not practice, but their influence on the whole bar and bench was immense. The French lawyers of this time, to use the words of Sir Henry Maine, in all the qualities of the advocates, the judge, and the legislator, far excelled their compeers throughout Europe. Estienne Pasquier, Antoine Loisel, the brothers Pitou, Guy Dufort de Prébac, Pierre Seguier and his son Antoine, Jacques-Auguste de Toux and his brother-in-law, Achille de Harlay, all these great advocates and magistrates, most of whom also achieved high distinction in literature, had sat at the feet of Le Grand Cugin. Moreover, they were all ardent humanists, and their speeches bristled with references to classical authors. A sound training in Roman law was absolutely necessary in those provinces of France which acknowledged that law as the basis of their jurisprudence. But part of France was subject not to the droit écrit, but to the droit coutumier, or law based on local usage. Of this vast and varied domain, Charles du Moulin, 1500-66, was the master whose European reputation vied with that of Cujat. But unlike Cujat, he took an active part in the political and religious disputes of his day, and especially opposed the publication of the decrees of the Council of Trent in France. Even Dumoulin did not escape the influence of Roman law, for it was from the jurists of the Antonine era that he derived those ideas of the law of nature, which were destined to play at a later date so important a part in the history of French thought. The massacre of St. Bartholomew, with its sequels on a smaller scale, in large towns like Orléans, Bourges, Bordeaux, and Toulouse, dealt a blow to French humanism from which it never recovered. The religious wars in themselves had been a serious hindrance to the pursuit of learning, but down to the massacre they had been relieved by considerable intervals of peace. Even Protestant professors, especially if they made no parade of their religious opinions, had been able to continue their teaching in comparative security. Now all was changed. Ramos, hunted down by a rival professor, perished in the massacre. Lambinus died of the shock a month later. Donau and Otman fled from Bourges to Geneva, and the same city provided a refuge for the younger Scaliger, the rising hope of French scholarship. When Scaliger returned to France in 1574, Cujat and Dorat were almost the only scholars left in the land, and a year later even Cujat was driven by religious disturbances from Bourges, as he had already been driven from Valence eight years earlier. Joseph Scaliger, 1540-1609, is the greatest name in the history of French classical scholarship. To a mastery over Greek and Latin, and a critical sense equal if not superior to that of any of his predecessors, he added a range of learning, a sureness of method, and a constructive power that have never been surpassed. The first fruits of his labors after his return to France were editions of Festus and of the Latin elegiac poets Catullus, Tibullus, and Propertius. But having shown his capacity for the restoration of texts, he turned to a new field of labor, and his edition of Manilius, 1577, produced what was practically a treatise on ancient astronomy. This was the prelude to the great work of his life, the creation of a scientific system of ancient chronology, which he accomplished by his De Emendatione Temporum, 1583, and Thesaurus Temporum, 1606. The latter included a marvelous reconstruction of the last first book of Eusebius's Chronicle, the very existence of which he had divined. If the discovery of an Armenian translation in the last century has somewhat modified his results, it has detracted nothing from the brilliance of his conjectures. But when his masterwork was published, he was no longer living in France. In 1593 he had accepted an invitation to become a professor at the new University of Leiden. Three years later, a French scholar was restored to France in the person of Isaac Cosabon, 1559-1614, to 1614, 
who had been living for nearly twenty years at Geneva, where he had married the daughter of Henri Estienne. He had neither Scaliger's constructive genius nor his instinctive feeling for language, but thanks to his patient industry and lively memory, he acquired, as Scaliger himself admitted, an even greater knowledge of Greek. His special aim was, in Mark Pedersen's words, to revive the picture of the ancient world, a work which his special gifts enabled him to carry out with great success. His editions of Athenaeus, Theophrastus, and Strabo have never been superseded, while those of Polybius, Perseus, Suetonius, and the Scriptores Historiae Augustae are indispensable to students of those particular authors. He was a professor at Montpellier till 1600, when Henry IV summoned him to Paris and made him one of the regius professors of Greek. But the assassination of the king deprived him of his only protector, and he gladly accepted an invitation, with the offer of a prebendal stall, from Richard Bancroft, Archbishop of Canterbury. It was no longer possible for a scholar who was a Protestant to make a livelihood in France. The decline of scholarship in France was partly due to the fact that the study of Greek, though it had flourished greatly for a time, had never taken deep root. At the first touch of adversity it began to wither, and henceforth French culture and civilization became almost exclusively Latin. After the departure of Scaliger, the most learned man of France was Pierre Pitou, 1539-96, and Scaliger could say of him that he was nothing of a Greek scholar. But he was an excellent Latin scholar, and we owe to him Editiones Principes of Phaedrus, 1596, the Pervigilium Veneris, 1577, Salvianus, 1580, and the Edict of Theodoric, 1579. He also edited Petronius and the Lex Visigotorum. The text of most of these editions was based on manuscripts in his own library. His many-sided activity also displayed itself in the publication of medieval historical texts and in various short treatises, of which the best known is Le Liberté de l'Église Gallicane. We shall meet him again as one of the authors of the Satire Ménipé. One effect of the Counter-Reformation in France was to divert the energies of French scholars from pagan to Christian studies. This was in a large measure due to the Jesuits. They saw that if they wished to dominate thought, they must train men to vie with Scaliger and Cosabon in learning. Partly as a result of this policy, a succession of excellent edition of Christian writers began to issue from the Paris presses early in the 17th century. Thus, Fronton du Duc, 1558-1624, edited St. John Chrysostom, 1621-4, and a collection of minor writers under the title of Bibliotheca Veterum Patrum, 1624. Jacques Sirmont, 1559-1652, edited Sidonius Apollinaris, 1614, and a large number of writers on ecclesiastical history and doctrine. Denis Petot, 1583-1652, edited Synesius, 1612, and Epiphanius, 1622. All these were Jesuits, and the two latter had been educated in Jesuit colleges. Another illustrious pupil of the Jesuits, though he never became a Jesuit, was Nicolas Rigaud, 1577-1654, who, after editing a few classical authors, turned his attention to the Latin apologists and fathers and produced important editions of Tertullian, 1634, and Cyprian, 1648. All this hardly accords with the theory that Jesuit education, owing to its excessive devotion to style and language, did not produce men of learning. Even more eminent instances to the country are Ducange and Adrien de Valois. French poetry cannot be said to have suffered from the massacre of St. Bartholomew to the same extent as French scholarship. But nevertheless, a certain deviation in its development may be traced to this period. Within a month of the massacre, Ronsard published the first books of his epic, La Franciade, but he never completed it, and eighteen months later he retired from the court. 
Though he lived till 1585, his work was practically done. After his retirement, the poetical stream divided into two channels. The one represented by the Catholic courtier and ecclesiastic Philippe de Porte, and the other by the Huguenot country gentleman and soldier Salust du Barta. Both were disciples and admirers of Ronsard, but they deviated from his methods in exactly opposite directions. De Porte, 1546-1606, has more esprit and less imagination than Ronsard. His language is less poetical but more lucid and correct, and he is an excellent writer of courtly songs. If in his choice of frivolous subjects and in his devotion to Italian models he went even beyond his predecessor, his style marks a return to the more genuinely French tradition of Marot. On the other hand, Du Barta, 1544-90, deliberately chose sacred subject as a protest against the frivolous and pagan character of the contemporary muse. He wrote the epics Judith and La Semaine, the latter a long poem on the creation, which was received with acclamation not only in France but in all Protestant countries. But his work has not stood the test of time, and nowhere has it been rejected more decisively than in France. For though he has imagination of the highest order, his execution is seldom equal to his conception. La Semaine is a poem of splendid single lines and a few fine passages. But even these are marred by blemishes of bad taste or provincialism. The rest is a dreary waste. Notre Milton manqué is the French verdict, and the verdict is just. It was the perusal of part of La Semaine which moved another Huguenot, Agrippa d'Aubigny, 1550-1630, to write a rival epic on the same subject. It was a complete failure. In 1577 he began a new one, taking for his subject the great religious struggle and entitling it Le Tragique. Constant fighting left him little leisure for poetry, but he wrote as furiously as he fought, and the poem, though not printed till 1616, seems to have been practically completed before the death of Henry III. An epic in intention, or rather, as the author describes it, a poem in seven tableaux, it is chiefly the satirical parts which have any merit. The description of the Mignon, the portrait of Henry III, the account of the young man's arrival at court, evidently a personal reminiscence, show a concentrated energy and a fire of declamation equal to anything in Juvenal. But on the whole, Le Tragique is, like La Semaine, a poem of fine passages and still finer single lines. To one department of study, that of historical research, the massacre of St. Bartholomew gave a certain indirect impetus. The treatment which the Protestants had received from their rulers led them to investigate the origin and limits of the royal authority. Among numerous treatises on the subject, two stand forth conspicuous. The Vindictae contra Turanos, written almost certainly by Duplessis Mornay, and not, as was long supposed, by Hubert Languet, and the Franco Gallia, 1573, of François Hautemont. While the former is mainly philosophical in character, the latter, though a pièce de circonstance, written with a definite political object, pursues a strictly historical method. In masterly fashion, Otman establishes the German origin of the Franks and gives the true explanation of the Salic law. His whole work is based on the best original authorities, and it is a sign of his historic insight that he was the first to recognize the importance of Gregory of Tours. Six years later, Claude Fauché, 1530-1601, published the first part of his Recueil des Antiquités Gauloises et Françaises, in which, independently of Ottman, he pointed out that the Franks were a German tribe. His work was eventually carried down to the close of the Carolingian dynasty. Another writer, who, like Otman, had a wider knowledge and a rounder conception of history than any of the professed historians, was Jean Baudin, 1530-96. to 96. 
in his Methodus at Facilem Historiarum Cognitionem, 1566, he had declared that political history is the only true history. Ten years later appeared his great work, the Six Livre de la République, which laid the foundations of modern political science. It had a great success, and when Baudin went to England in 1579, he found a Cambridge professor lecturing on it in a Latin translation. This was so bad that he made a new one himself, which, owing to the improvements he introduced, is superior to the original version. Though neither an Aristotle nor a Montesquieu, he is an enlightened and independent thinker of great learning and sound judgment. His chief contribution to political science is his theory of sovereignty, which Hobbes borrowed from him. And he was the first to work out in detail the effect of climate and situation on national character and government. His defense of lawful monarchy, which he distinguishes from despotism as that in which the monarch obeys the laws of nature, is what one might expect from a distinguished and active member of the politique party. It was no doubt provoked by the republican theories of the Protestants, and especially by those of the Franco Gallia. Equally characteristic of his party are his views on the religious question. A prince, he says, should not allow the religion established in his state to be made the subject of controversy. But if religious factions spring up, he must not put them down by force. This was also the view of Montaigne. Fauché's work on the origin and early history of the nation was preceded by the Recherche de la France of Étienne Pasquier, 1529-1615, who had won great distinction as advocate for the University of Paris in her first dispute with the Jesuits. The first book appeared in 1566, but the whole work was not published in a complete form till after the author's death. It contains much valuable information on various subjects, especially on the history of French institutions and French poetry, and is written in a style which, though not quite of the first rank, gives it considerable literary importance. Pasquier's antiquarian researches were largely inspired by his patriotism. The same patriotism and the same interest in the early history of his country led Pierre Pitou to edit from his own manuscripts two collections of French medieval chroniclers, 1588 and 1596. Similar work was done by the diplomatist Jacques Bongard, 1554 to 1612, a man of many-sided learning, who, at the close of his active life, published, under the title of Dei Gesta per Francos, a collection of contemporary writers and the French Crusades. These were the forerunners of André Duchesne, 1584-1640, and Adrien de Valois, 1606-92, the former of whom, at the date of Bongard's death, had already been giving to the world for some years the fruits of his marvelous erudition. End of section 7《Section 8 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion.》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2. French Humanism and Montaigne by A. A. Tilly. Part 2. In spite of all this historical research, no great result was achieved in the actual writing of history. It is true that in 1576, Bernard du Hayon, circa 1536 to 1610, produced the first modern history of France written in French. His work, as he claims in his preface, is far superior in treatment to that of a mere chronicler, like his contemporary Belleforêt. But his standard of research is anything but a high one, and his history is, after all, little more than a reproduction in elevated language of the Grand Chronique with rhetorical editions translated from the Latin history of Paolo Emilio of Verona. The only writer who dealt with the later history in a really critical spirit was Nicolas Vignier, 1530-96, whose critical sense had been stimulated by the study and practice of medicine. 
His principal works are a Sommaire de l'Histoire des Français, 1579, and a Bibliothèque Historielle, 1588. The latter, a universal history and the pattern of that of Diodorus, in the preface to which he speaks with equal contempt of the Miroir Historio and Mère des Histoires of the Chroniclers, and the Invention de Rhetorique and Harangue Forgée à Crédit of the school of Paolo Emilio. Contemporary history was treated with greater success. Jacques Auguste de Tou, 1553-1627, produced in his Latin History of His Times from 1543-1607, to a work which not only achieved an immediate continental reputation, but retained it till the close of the 18th century. The first part appeared in 1604, the complete work in 1620-1. It is a testimony to the Catholic historian's honesty and impartiality that his work was formally condemned by the congregation of the Index. But his very endeavors to avoid giving offense to either Catholics or Protestants have caused modern critics to accuse him, not unjustly, of timidity. Moreover, the difficulties which beset a writer of contemporary history were increased in his case by the use of the Latin language and subservience to Latin models. That his work should fail to satisfy the modern scientific standard is only to be expected. But we also miss in it that atmosphere of contemporary thought which makes contemporary narratives valuable as historical documents. It is this atmosphere which, accompanied by a large measure of fair-mindedness, gives value to the Huguenot history, Histoire universelle, 1616-20, of Agrippa d'Aubigny. Save, however, for a few chapters in which he gives some excellent summaries of the political and religious situation, it partakes more of the nature of personal memoirs than of a regular history. It was supplemented by the charming autobiography, Vie à ses enfants, which he wrote towards the end of his long life, circa 1625, and which closes the long series of memoirs in which so many of the leading actors in the stirring drama of the religious wars recorded their manifold experiences. The earlier memoirs of the 16th century were rather contemporary narratives than personal reminiscences. Such are the political and military memoirs of Guillaume and Martin du Bellay for the reign of Francis I, and the account of the campaigns in the Low Countries from 1551 to 1559 by François de Rabutin. The first man to set the example of employing the evening of an active life in writing down his own experiences for the benefit of posterity seems to have been the celebrated Gascon commander Blaise de Montluc, 1502-77, the hero of the Siege of Siena, who began to write his commentaire in 1574. In the opinion of French judges, he is the first in merit as well as in time. His style at the outset is somewhat stiff and awkward, but once at his ease, he writes with all the racy and picturesque charm which makes Frenchmen the best raconteur in the world. His book was written chiefly for the instruction of soldiers. Henry IV called it the Soldier's Bible but it is, at the same time, an admirable reflection of that intensity of life which is so marked a feature of the Renaissance. It is likewise characteristic of the Renaissance that a rough soldier like Montluc should have borrowed not only the idea, but the title of his work from Caesar's commentaries. In the memoirs of Michel de Castelnau, which he began to write in 1575, when he was ambassador to the English court, we find numerous references to ancient history with other touches of pedantry common to the books of the day. Though his book is unimportant from a literary point of view, it is among our surest sources of information for the events between 1559 and 1569. The Discours politique et militaire of the Protestant leader François de Lanoux, 1531 to 91, which he wrote while a prisoner in the fortress of Limburg, 1580 to 5, are, as the title indicates, a series of reflections suggested by the author's political, military, and moral experiences, rather than personal memoirs. They are a noble contribution to that work of moral reconstruction of which France was so urgently in need 
and they breathe a spirit of lofty and hopeful patriotism akin to that of Plutarch, a careful reading of whose works was one of the consolations of Lanoux's imprisonment. With Pierre de Bourdeille, Abbé de Brantome, 1534 to circa 1614, as with Montluc, the predisposing cause of his memoirs was the love of posthumous fame, but the immediate cause was a bodily accident. In Brantome's case it was a fall from his horse, which, like Montluc's gunshot wound, put an end to his active career in 1584. His vie de grand capitaine, dame illustre and dame galante, which make up the greater part of his work, though biographical in form, are so full of personal reminiscences that they fairly come under the category of personal memoirs. But they are, at the same time, a valuable historic document, not because Brantome had been at any pains to control the copious and varied information which his insatiable and aimless curiosity led him to collect, but because the whole courtly society of the later French Renaissance is here mirrored before our eyes in all its manifold aspects. Vice and virtue have no meaning for Brantome, he cares only for intensity of life. When he is not an actor in the drama, he is content to sit among the spectators, to applaud, but not to criticize. It was far otherwise with Michel de Montaigne, 1533-92. He too was an interested spectator in the stirring drama of his day, but he was a deeply reflecting one, a critic of singular sincerity, shrewdness, and penetration. Quote, there are some men, and these not the worst, who look for no other profit but to watch how and why everything is done, and to be spectators of the lives of others, in order to judge of them and by them to regulate their own. End quote. It was in the year 1571, on his 38th birthday, that Montaigne, having resigned his post of counsellor in the Parlement of Bordeaux, retired to the chateau which three years earlier he had inherited from his father. Here his essays grew as he grew, and became part and parcel of his existence. Originally undertaken as an occupation to vary the monotony of country life and as an outlet for his vagabond fancies, the earliest essays consist of little more than anecdotes culled from his favorite books and pointed with some moral reflection of his own. But before long he found wings, and the 19th essay, written in March 1572, already shows that realistic grasp of the facts of life, combined with an imaginative portrayal of them, which is the goal of all artistic achievement. The subject, that philosophy is to learn how to die, was peculiarly suited to the times. For to men of the Renaissance, death, like the sword of Damocles, seemed to be forever suspended over the banquet of life, and struck them a chill with all the colder from the passionate intensity of their enjoyment. It was soon after writing this essay that gradually, and with some hesitation, a plan began to shape itself in Montaigne's mind, which, carried into execution in his own desultory fashion, gave unity and cohesion to his book. His essays from the first revealed his interest in human nature, in the study and analysis of human motives. But living as he did somewhat out of the world, he had little opportunity for observation at first hand. It was chiefly from books that he got his material, from Plutarch and Seneca and his favorite historians, where he found, quote, man draws more to the life and more completely than elsewhere, end quote. There was one man, however, with whom he was in daily intercourse and whom he had unrivaled opportunity of observing, and that was himself and the subject he believed that he was, quote, most learned man alive, end quote. So he would make his book a portrait of himself, not a grand imaginative portrait to be hung up in some public place, but a likeness, quote, simple, natural, and ordinary, without study and without artifice, end quote. Such was the portrait he offered to the world in 1580 in the form of two books of essays. Immediately after their publication, he set out for an extended tour through Germany to Italy, from which, at the end of eighteen months, he was recalled by the news that he had been elected mayor of Bordeaux. 
he accepted the post unwillingly, and only after being practically compelled by the king. But he served two terms of office, four years in all, acting throughout with judgment and moderation. When, during his second term, the death of Anjou, which left Henry of Navarre next in succession to the throne, rendered the state of affairs more critical, and there was a danger of Bordeaux being seized by the League, he showed vigilance, promptitude, and coolness. Then, released from office, he returned to his beloved essays, and, encouraged by the success of his design, continued it with increasing freedom and boldness. The old essays were expanded and new ones written, and thus enlarged, a new edition of his work in three books was published in 1588. It is in the third book that Montaigne reaches the full maturity of his genius. The essay on repentance shows a profound knowledge of human nature, that, on the art of conversation, roused Pascal's admiration for its quote-unquote incomparable author. Finest, perhaps, of all, is the essay on vanity, containing the splendid burst of eloquence on the grandeur of Rome, and rich in details of Montaigne's life and character. After this he wrote no fresh essays, but went on correcting and adding to the old ones, down to his death on September 13, 1592. The term of Montaigne's literary labors was almost coincident with what may be called the acute stage of the wars of religion, that which followed the massacre of St. Bartholomew. His attitude towards the great struggle was peculiarly his own. He was on friendly terms with the leaders of both parties, and was even entrusted by them with delicate negotiations. His was the only country house in France, he believed, quote, which, with no guard or sentinel but the stars, was left to the protection of heaven, end quote. Yet it was never pillaged. It was not, however, to any hesitation between the rival forms of religion that his neutrality was due. Distrust of change and respect for duly constituted authority combined to make him, outwardly at least, a loyal adherent of the Catholic Church. He had no doubt that, quote, the best and the soundest cause was that which maintained the ancient religion and government of the country, end quote. Nor had he any sort of sympathy with Protestantism. That inquiring habit of mind, which seemed to him so desirable in all other matters, was, he held, wholly out of place in the sphere of religion. He objected to the promiscuous singing of psalms, and he regarded the translation of the Holy Scriptures into the vernacular as more dangerous than useful. But he was deterred from taking a side, partly by his love of ease and tranquility and independence, but still more by his love of toleration. It is worthy of note that he dedicated his edition of La Boissie's writings in terms of warm admiration to the fallen statesman Michel de l'Hôpital, the one man who had tried to carry out a tolerant policy. In Montaigne's case, toleration sprang not so much from any philosophical principle as from a hatred of civil war. It was, quote-unquote, a monstrous war. Nor did he believe religion to be the real cause of it. Quote, Pick out from the Catholic army all the men who are actuated either by pure zeal for religion or by loyalty to their country or their prince, and you will not find enough to form one complete company, end quote. He was especially shocked by what he calls the horrible impudence with which the rival parties interchanged their principles, as for instance that of the right of rebellion in defense of religion, which, originally set up by the Protestants after the massacre of St. Bartholomew, was adopted by the League as soon as the death of Anjou had made Henry of Navarre heir to the throne. But however parties might shift and multiply, he never budged, he was always a royalist and a patriot. Thus, on the death of Henry III, he found himself in agreement with the now united Politique party, ready to recognize the legitimate successor, the strongest and the ablest man in France. Twice Henry IV, when he was only King of Navarre, had visited him at his chateau, and now in July 1590, during the siege of Paris, he summoned him to his presence with the offer of some post or pension. Montaigne declined the offer in a noble and dignified letter, and, while he expressed himself willing to obey the summons, pleaded his age and infirmities. 
Though he did not live to welcome the final close of the struggle and Henry's triumphal entry into his capital, he saw, at any rate, the League scotched by Mayenne's summary execution of some of its leaders and witnessed the formation of a strong politique party in Paris. Thus it was in no indifferent spirit that Montaigne, from his quiet corner, looked on the troubles of his country. Rather, they color his whole book, or, what is almost the same, his whole estimate of man. It was the self-seeking, the dissimulation, the want of principle of most of the party leaders which made this partisan of truth doubt at times of its very existence. It was the singular corruption of the age which added to his inborn dislike of taking a side and his love of balancing country arguments without coming to a final decision, gave to his mind its skeptical quality and made it a congenial soil for the doctrines of the Greek skeptics. But Montaigne's skepticism was never crystallized into a definite system, either for his own use or for that of others. His skeptical habits did not prevent him from holding very definite opinions on many subjects, on politics, morals, education, literature. The sum of his moral philosophy was rather the old precept to live according to nature, though, like Rabelais and like the Renaissance generally, he interpreted it in a very different fashion from either the academy or the porch. For him, as for them, it meant that every man should follow his own nature, and towards the close of his life, in his last essay, he could say, quote, that he was grateful for what nature had done for him, that he loved life and cultivated it as it had pleased God to grant it to him, end quote. His imagination might sometimes soar to lofty heights, as it sometimes descended to unsavory depth, but at heart he was no transcendentalist. Quote, the fairest lives are, in my opinion, those which conform to the common human patterns, well ordered but without miracle or extravagance. End quote. This was his conclusion of the whole matter. This sober and tempered estimate of human nature marks the close of the Renaissance. We are far from Pico della Mirandola's treatise on the dignity of man, far even from Rabelais's Abbey of Telema and Oracle of the Bottle. Man is no longer the center of the universe. He is rather, in Pascal's phrase, the epitome of an atom, or at best a thinking reed. So too Montaigne's attitude towards that literature which had impressed the earlier humanists with so strong a sense of human dignity differs considerably from theirs yet he had been educated on thoroughly humanistic lines. So anxious was his father to carry out the humanistic theory that boys should learn to speak as well as write pure Latin, that from his infancy no other language was spoken in his presence. At the age of six he was sent to the college of Guienne at Bordeaux, a revival on humanistic lines of the old College of Arts, and already under its principal André de Gauvillat, the most flourishing place of education in the kingdom. Here he studied under distinguished scholars, among whom were George Buchanan and Marc-Antoine Muret, and acted in Latin plays which those scholars wrote for their pupils. His studies were mainly in Latin, and though he probably exaggerates when he says that he knew little or no Greek, he was never anything of a Greek scholar but he studied with none of the enthusiasm and ardor which we find in the early humanists, or even in some of his own contemporaries. Greek and Latin, he wrote afterwards, are no doubt fine accomplishments, but we pay too dear for them. And though in his retirement he learned to love the classical writers, and pillaged them in his essay, taking, as he quaintly says, a wing here and a leg there, his love stopped short of superstition. They were to him great writers, dealing with a world which he thought in many respects better than his own. But they were not the only great writers, and their opinions, like those of everyone else, had to be brought to the bar of common sense. This attitude of Montaigne's to the classics was a wholesome correction to the pedantry which in his day had largely taken the place of the simple enthusiasm of the early Renaissance. Though he has not escaped the charge of pedantry himself, he at any rate recognized that mere erudition was neither learning nor wisdom. He valued the classical writers mainly as interpreters of life, 
and he approached them in that spirit of free inquiry which was, after all, the chief characteristic of the Renaissance. If his cultivation of that spirit produced on the one hand a tendency to skepticism and inaction, on the other it fostered common sense and independence of thought. For his professed disciples, the libertins of the 17th century, half free thinkers, half sensualists, he may have been a dangerous teacher. But France and the world at large owe a great debt to the sincerity and practical good sense, which, underlying his skepticism and love of paradox, form the real basis of his character. Some six months after Montaigne's death, a member of the Politique Party in Paris, Pierre Le Roy, a canon of the Saint-Chapelle, turned the weapon of ridicule against the League by writing a short burlesque account of the meeting of the Estates held in the spring of 1593. It is not clear that in this form it was ever published, but it circulated freely in manuscript. A year later, having been to some extent recast, and with very considerable additions, it was printed under the title of Le Septième Ménipé. In this enlarged form, it was the joint production of several writers, including Pierre Pitou and two other scholars of repute, Florent Chrétien and Jean Passerat. The whole period of the French religious wars is remarkable for the quantity and quality of its pamphlet literature. Ever since the Tigre of Atman, published in the year of the conspiracy of Ambroise, 1560, there had been a long succession of pamphlets, many of considerable literary merit. But it is only the Satire Menipé, the last missile of the war, which has attained to the position of a French classic. The merit of its conception and initial design, to which sufficient justice has perhaps hardly been done, is due, as we have seen, to Le Roi. But the comparatively easier task of filling in the details has been carried out with equal success. Designed to be at once a comedy and a party manifesto, the speakers of the League party and the Estates are, by happy stroke, while preserving their own idiosyncrasies, compelled, as in a palace of truth, to reveal their real aims and ambitions. Mayenne, the papal legate, the French pensioners of Spain, each in turn disclose their selfish and anti-nationalist policy. Finally, the Sieur d'Aubray, the leader of the Paris politique, in a long speech in which burlesque and irony are allowed no place, and which good authority ascribes to Pierre Pitou, declares the sentiments of his party. It is an excellent piece of reasoned logic, and in its finest passages reaches a high standard of patriotic eloquence, not unworthy of a Demosthenes, a Cicero, or a Burke. Quiescendum. This was the motto on the bookplate of Jacques Gillot, one of the authors of the Satire Ménipé, at whose house the other contributors used to meet, and it expressed the longing for peace and repose felt by the whole of France. The first task which awaited Henry IV after he had cleared the kingdom of its enemies without and within was reconstruction. The Théâtre d'Agriculture of Olivier de Serre, 1539-1619, which had only been waiting for a favorable moment for publication, and which was now published with the king's warm approval, 1600, dealt in adequate fashion with the true basis of the material prosperity of the nation. But before this, an attempt had been made to reconstruct the moral basis. In a series of lectures, of which the most important is De la Constance et Consolation est Calamité Publique, written apparently in September or October 1590, though not published till 1594, Guillaume Duvert, 1556 to 1621, a councillor of the Paris Parlement and the most eloquent speaker of his day, urged his countrymen not to despair of their country, and in one of these treatises, La Philosophie Morale des Stoïques, offered them a moral code based not on a revealed religion, but on that Stoic law of nature with which the study of the Roman law had familiarized French writers. The same lines were followed in His de la Sagesse, 1601, by the popular preacher Pierre Charon, 1541-1603, who borrowed literally and liberally from his predecessor, adding little of his own but a more systematic arrangement. 
Unfortunately, he combined with this system of positive morality an equally systematic réchauffé of Montaigne's skeptical tirades, thus elaborately wrecking the foundation of human reason upon which his superstructure was built. Yet all this was done in perfect good faith, and there can be little doubt that Charon, however much it may have tickled his vanity to pose as an esprit fort, was a sincere Christian. The love of order, which manifests itself in the divisions and subdivisions of Charon's book, appears also in the poems of Jean Berthaud, Bishop of C, 1552-1611, published in the same year. In his preference for serious subjects, whether religious or official, and in his habitual use of the Alexandrian line, he is the forerunner of the man in whom the new order of literature was embodied. It was in the year 1605 that François Malherbe, 1555-1628, the future dictator and legislator of the French Parnassus, came to reside in Paris, and before long directed his critical batteries against the poetry of the Pliat in general and that of Deporte, the reigning chief of the school in particular. As he left no treatise on the art of poetry, we have to gather his views from the uncivil comments which he inserted on the margins of a copy of Deport's works. They are based on the heresy that versification apart, there is practically no difference between poetry and prose. This was a direct denial of the cardinal doctrine of the Pléiade. C'est posé de la rime et rime de la prose, said Mathurin Régnier, 1573 to 1613, the nephew of Desportes, in a satire which he wrote in defense of the old school, and in which he attacked in nervous and pregnant lines the theory and practice of the new. The last poet of the Pléiade, the first great French satirist, Régnier stands between two ages. Like Ronsard, Dubélet, and Deportes, he takes his property wherever he finds it, from Horace and Juvenal, from Ariosto and Berni, from Ronsard and Deportes themselves. And even more than his predecessors, he is indifferent to order and composition and grammatical correctness. But in his close and sincere observation of life, especially in its social aspects, and in his firm and manly versification, he announces the great writers of the reign of Louis XIV. At the time of Regnier's early death in 1613, the cause for which he pleaded was already a losing one. By 1624, the year in which Richelieu became first minister, the success of the new school was assured. At his death in 1628, Malherbe was the recognized dictator of French literature. None but a prosaic age could have hailed him as a great poet, and French lyric poetry would have never withered as it did under his cold touch had it not been for the barrenness of the soil. The only merits of Malherbe's own poetry are an occasional felicity of expression and a versification which, though it lacks the charm of mystery and variety, compels admiration by its sustained dignity of movement and its virile harmony. But without such an instrument, the classical drama of France would have never attained its perfection. Further, Malherbe's critical theories were of the greatest service to French prose. The qualities of purity, clearness and precision upon which he insisted, and which he illustrated in his own prose style, are just those which we miss in Montaigne's otherwise incomparable art but they were needed in order to make French the language of educated Europe. Even before Malherbe's death, there appeared a new writer who, by adding to these qualities those of balance and harmony in the architecture of the sentence and period, completed the lesson which his master had begun. This young man will go further in prose than anyone has yet done in France, prophesied Malherbe but the work of Jean Guest de Balzac and the verification of his prophecy lie beyond the limits of this chapter. End of section 8
Chapter 3. The Catholic Reaction and the Valois and Bathory Elections in Poland by R. Nisbet Bain. Part 1. Towards the end of the 16th century, the vast Polish Republic was one of the most interesting actual and potential factors in European politics. Originally a small and struggling military monarchy, wedged in the midst of hostile and oppressive neighbors, who excluded her altogether from the sea, Poland's dynastic union with the still vaster Grand Duchy of Lithuania, in 1386, was the beginning of a fresh period of expansion. And during the following two centuries, under the ambitious impetus of the great Jagiełło princes, she gradually grew to be the mightiest state in Eastern Europe. In 1387, Red Russia, and in 1431, Podolia, were definitely incorporated with her other territories. By the end of the 15th century, the almost perpetual warfare between the Republic and its most dangerous and persistent enemy, the Teutonic Order, had terminated in the collapse of the Knights and the restitution to Poland of all the territory of which they had deprived her. A subsequent attempt of the Grand Master, Albrecht of Brandenburg, to reconquer West Prussia was defeated, and by the Compact of Krakow, in 1525, Albert was recognized as Duke of Prussia under the suzerainty of Poland. Six and twenty years later, the Order of the Sword also fell completely to pieces after a long decay, and the last Grand Master, Gotthard Kettler, ceded Livonia to Poland and did homage for Semigalia and Kurland, which latter was erected into a semi-independent duchy under Polish protection. Poland had now reached the height of her power and territorial extension, her domains embracing the whole of the vast plain which lies between the Baltic, the Oder, the Carpathians, the Dniester, and the Dnieper. She had thus recovered her northern seaboard, and even touched the Black Sea towards the south. She was therefore indisputably the foremost of the Slavonic states, and after the Spanish monarchy the most considerable Catholic power in Europe. Her political significance, however, was mainly due to the fact that, since the Battle of Mohacz in 1526, and the fall of the Hungarian kingdom, she had become the one permanent barrier against the rising tide of Ottoman aggression. From the churchman's point of view, the Polish Republic in the 16th century was equally interesting and important. It marked the extreme limit of Catholicism towards the East, and, situated as it was midway between Greek schismatics and German heretics, might well be regarded and utilized as a battleground against both. Hitherto Poland had given the Holy See but little anxiety. Hussite influences, in the beginning of the 15th century, had been superficial and transitory. The love of orthodoxy proved stronger, in the long run, than fellow feelings for a kindred race. The Edict of Wieluń, in 1424, remarkable as the first anti-heretical decree issued in Poland, crushed the new sect in its infancy and it was with the general approval of the nation that the five Hussite preachers, who had found a temporary refuge at the castle of Abrahamsbaski, were publicly burned to death in the marketplace of Posen. Lutheranism, moreover, was at first regarded with grave suspicion by the intensely patriotic Polish gentry because of its German origin. Nevertheless, the frequent and extremely severe penal edicts issued against it during the reign of Sigismund I 1506 to 1548, who, in this respect, be it remarked, anticipated the action of the clergy, seemed to point to the fact that the heresy was spreading quietly throughout the country. Sigismund's motives in opposing the Reformation were mainly political, and certainly the violent outbreaks of the sectaries at Krakow, 1518 and 1520, to save nothing of the civil war resulting from the revolt of Danzig in 1526, seemed to justify his suspicions that the new doctrines were not merely anti-Christian, but anti-social. For a time, therefore, the Protestants had to be cautious in Poland proper, but they found a sure refuge in Prussia, where Lutheranism was already the established religion. Duke Albert gladly welcomed the Polish reformers at his court, and the newly erected university at Königsberg, where Polish printing presses were speedily set up, became a seminary for Polish ministers and preachers, one of the ablest of whom, Jan Seklucjan, was actually the Duke's chaplain. While Lutheranism was thus threatening the Polish church from the north, 
Calvinism had already invaded her from the west. Calvinism, indeed, rather recommended itself to the Poles as being of non-German origin, and it is a curious coincidence that, in 1539, the same year in which Katrin Zalaszowska, the wife of a town councillor of Krakow, was burned for propagating Lutheranism, Calvin should have dedicated his commentary on the Mass to the young crown prince Sigismund Augustus, from whom Protestantism expected much in the future. Meanwhile, conversions to Calvinism, among the higher classes in Poland, became more and more frequent. In 1544, Stanislas Lutomirski, canon of Konin, openly embraced the Helvetian confession. A still more notable defection was that of Jan Waski, nephew of the primate, who, after studying abroad and cultivating the acquaintance of Erasmus and other humanists, returned home, took orders, and, favoured by his uncle, was already on the road to high preferment, when, immediately after another European tour, he suddenly and publicly professed the tenets of the reformers, merit, and ultimately, though himself holding advanced views, sought to establish a union of the reformed churches. It is characteristic of the confusion of the times that, although no longer a celibate, he still retained the rich canonry of Gnazen, nobody daring to deprive him of it till he voluntarily relinquished it in 1542. We hear of crowded Calvinist conventicles in Little Poland, from 1545 onwards, which were regularly attended by several of the canons of Krakow and other eminent church dignitaries, among them being the Franciscan Lismanini, Queen Bona's confessor, who propagated heresy under the very eyes of his bishop. Calvinism continued to spread throughout the country during the latter years of Sigismund I, and was publicly professed by many Catholic priests, some of whom carried their congregations along with them. One of the most notable of these renegades was Andrew Prashmowski, prebend of the Church of St. John at Posen, who, banished by Bishop Izdbieński, found an asylum with the powerful magnate Rafael Leszczyński at Radziejowice in Kujawia, where he organized a Calvinistic community. Young Nicholas Oleśnicki, too, who had been expelled from the Paulinist order, and many other Protestant ministers, preached and taught beneath the protection of the Karvonskis, the Filipowskis, and other powerful families. But above them all towered Stanislas Orzechowski, one of the most accomplished young humanists of the day. The son of a country notary and a Ruthenian priest's daughter, he was sent abroad for the education denied to him at home, and studied with distinction at Vienna, Wittenberg, Venice, Padua, and Bologna. At Wittenberg he readily adopted the doctrines of Luther and Melanchthon, but during his subsequent residence at Rome, Cardinal Contarini succeeded in reconverting the impressionable youth to Catholicism. On his return to Poland, he was persuaded by his father to adopt a clerical career as being the most profitable. But his views grew more and more heterodox, and he presently came forward as an ardent advocate of a married clergy, and many of his fellow priests followed his example by taking unto themselves wives. Another sect which ultimately found even more favor in Poland than the Calvinists was that of the Bohemian Brethren. We first hear of them in Great Poland in 1548, and here they found a temporary protector in the magnate Andrew Gurka. A royal decree promptly banished them to Prussia, where, beneath the ages of Duke Albert, they soon increased so rapidly as to be able to hold their own against the Lutherans. Thus, by the middle of the 16th century, the reformers had gained a firm footing in Poland, though during the life of the old king they had to exercise caution. To the last, Sigismund continued to pursue them with severe penal statutes, and we even hear of isolated cases of the burning of heretics, not members of the nobility. Nay, the very importation of heretical books was made a capital offence. On the other hand, it is extremely doubtful whether any regular attempt was ever made to execute these persecuting decrees. On April 1st, 1548, Sigismund I died after a troubled but not inglorious reign of forty-two years, leaving the sceptre to his only son, Sigismund Augustus, now in his twenty-eighth year. The Protestants generally entertained great hopes of the new monarch, 
brought up by and among women under the eye of his refined italian mother queen bona he had from his infancy been imbued with the speculative humanizing spirit of the renaissance and was of a disposition gentler and more pliable than his father's had been he was known to be familiar with the writings of the leading reformers and to delight in religious discussions he was surrounded by protestant counsellors and most promising symptom of all he had become enamoured of barbara daughter of prince michael radziwill black radziwill the all-powerful chief of the lithuanian calvinists on the other hand it was not so generally known that sigismund augustus was by conviction a sincere though not a bigoted catholic and nobody suspected that beneath his diplomatic urbanity lay a patriotic firmness and statesmanlike qualities of the first order indeed the young king had need of all his ability to cope with the extraordinary difficulties of the situation poland was at this time on the threshold of a period of political transition of an almost revolutionary character the most remarkable feature of which was the elevation to power of the polish szlachta or gentry in poland as elsewhere the growth of political liberty was originally due to the impecuniosity of their sovereign the proverbial extravagance of the bountiful jagiełło kings had encumbered at last even their vast estates and they were consequently compelled to depend more and more upon the nobility and gentry for aids and subsidies naturally such accommodation was not to be had for nothing and the price which the monarchs paid for it was the liberal bestowal of special rights and privileges on the popular representatives thus in the course of the fifteenth century an elaborate parliamentary system grew up in poland although for a long time the szlachta still uncertain of its own strength permitted its elder brother the senate or royal council composed of the wealthier magnates and prelates to monopolize the chief dignities of the state but as towards the beginning of the sixteenth century the parliamentary representation became more throughout and extensive and the same or diet was dominated by the lesser gentry of great and little poland and especially by the grey-coated squires of the well-to-do and populous central province of mazovia whose chief town warsaw was now becoming a formidable rival of the old coronation city krakow the szlachta began to assert itself despotically and to look askance at all privileges except its own for it must not be forgotten that the new representative movement was never popular in the full sense of the word stopping short as it did at the gates of the towns and the huts of the peasantry the mental horizon of the szlachta rarely extended beyond the limits of its own particular province and the way in which the triumphant gentry after a brief but bitter struggle succeeded in the course of the sixteenth century in depriving the great boroughs of the franchise is one of the most melancholy pages in polish history still more jealous were the gentry of the clerical estate whose privileges far exceeded their own and this jealousy accentuated by a strong feeling of personal independence was after all the principal cause of the early successes of the reformation in poland any opponent of the established clergy was the natural ally of the szlachta but although the principal it was by no means the only cause the scandalous state of the church itself seeming to excuse and even justify the far-reaching apostasy which was now to shake her to her very foundations it is not too much to say that the condition of the roman catholic church in poland had never sunk so low as at the time of the reformation the bishops who had grown up beneath the demoralizing influence of the corrupt and avaricious queen bona elegant triflers for the most part as pliant as reeds with no fixed principles and saturated with a false humanism were indifferent in matters of faith and regarded the new doctrines rather with philosophical toleration than with orthodox aversion some of them were notorious evil livers pintpot latalski bishop of Posen, had purchased his office for twelve thousand ducats from queen bona while another of her creatures peter popularly known as the fornicator was appointed bishop of Przemysl and promised the reversion of the still wealthier see of krakow to many indeed the office of a bishop was but the occasion for amassing wealth or gratifying personal ambition 
and nepotism flourished as it had never flourished before in Poland. Moreover, despite her immense wealth, in the province of Little Poland alone she owned at the time 26 towns, 83 landed estates, and 772 villages, the Church claimed exemption from all public burdens, from all political responsibilities. Although her prelates, sitting as they did in the Senate, and claiming the chief offices of the state, continued to exercise an altogether disproportionate political influence. Education was shamefully neglected, the masses being left in almost heathen ignorance. And this, too, at a time when the upper classes were greedily appropriating the ripe fruits of the Renaissance, and when, to use the words of a contemporary, there were, quote, more Latinists in Poland than there used to be in Latium, end quote. The Academia Jagiellonska, or University of Krakow, the sole source of knowledge and enlightenment in the vast Polish realm, still moved in the vicious circle of scholastic formularies, and clung tenaciously to methods of teaching which had long since grown obsolete. The provincial schools dependent upon so decrepit an alma mater were for the most part suffered to decay. This criminal neglect of national education brought along with it its own punishment. The sons of the gentry, denied proper instruction at home, betook themselves to the nearest high schools and universities across the border, to Goldberg in Silesia, to Wittenberg, to Leipzig. Here they fell in with the adherents of the new faith, for the most part grave, God-fearing men, who professed to reform the abuses which had grown up in the church in the course of ages, and a sense of equity, as much as a love of novelty, moved them, on their return home, to propagate wholesome doctrines, and clamour for the reformation of their own degenerate prelates. Finally, the poorer clergy, hopelessly cut off from preferment, and utterly neglected by their own bishops, were also inspired by the spirit of revolt, took part with the Schlachta against their spiritual rulers, and eagerly devoured, and imparted to their flocks in their own language, the contents of the religious tracts and treatises, which reached them by devious ways from Goldberg and Königsberg. Nothing, indeed, did more to popularize the new doctrines in Poland than this beneficial revival of the long-neglected vernacular by the reformers. Such was the situation when Sigismund II began his reign. The bishops, desiring to conciliate a prince whose antecedents were more than suspicious, at once made a high bid for the favour of the new king by consenting to his marriage with his fair Calvinist mistress, and on December the 7th, 1550, Barbara was solemnly crowned Queen of Poland at Krakow by the primate Dzierzgowski himself. Five days later, Sigismund II issued the celebrated edict in which he pledged his royal word to preserve intact the unity of the church and the privileges of the clergy, and to enforce the law of the land against heresy. Encouraged by this pleasing symptom of orthodoxy, the bishops, with singular imprudence, instead of first attempting to put their own dilapidated house in order, at once proceeded to summon before their courts all persons suspected of heresy, and threatened them with various pains and penalties. The Schlachta instantly took alarm. They had not uttered a word of protest when Bishop Peter had burnt the wife of a town councillor of Krakow, an old woman of eighty, for heresy. They had regarded with supine indifference the debasement of the essentially middle-class University of Krakow by the clerical authorities, culminating, in 1549, in a wholesale exodus of the students because of the unpunished murder of one of their numbers in the streets by the servants of Canon Czankowski. But when they saw their own privileges, already confirmed and guaranteed by the king, jeopardized by the precipitancy of the ecclesiastical courts, their alarm and indignation knew no bounds. In the midst of the general agitation, the same met at Piotrków in January 1552. The temper of the assembly may be gauged from the fact that, during the whole of the customary solemn mass before the opening of the session, the magnate Rafael Leszczyński remained covered. The debates which ensued were passionately uncompromising. Leszczyński compared the clergy to wolves in sheep's clothing. Jan Tarnowski, castellan of Krakow, a devout Catholic all his life, inveighed bitterly against the bishops and denied their right of summoning the Schlachta before their courts. 
On this head, indeed, the whole estate was unanimously agreed, the Catholic gentry, without exception, energetically supporting their Protestant brethren against what they considered the usurpations of the clergy. The bishops, timid and vacillating, bent before the storm, and when the king proposed, by way of compromise, that the jurisdiction of the clerical courts should be suspended for twelve months, on condition that the gentry continued to pay tithes, the prelates readily sacrificed their convictions in order to save their revenues. Thus began a religious interim, which, as matters turned out, was gradually prolonged for ten years. It was at this same, moreover, that Orzechowski, who had been excommunicated by the primate for breaking his vow of celibacy, pleaded fearlessly in favour of the marriage of the clergy, and the bishops, for fear of irreconcilably offending their ablest opponent and driving him altogether into the heretic camp, annulled his excommunication and proposed to submit the whole affair to the decision of the Holy See. Thus relieved from all immediate fear of persecution, and imagining, moreover, that the politic and temporizing king was secretly on their side, the reformers began to propagate their opinions openly. Soon they felt strong enough, with the assistance of the sympathizing Schlachta, to assume the offensive and molest the Catholics. Those of the Protestant gentry who had the right of presentation to beneficence began bestowing them upon chaplains and ministers of their own persuasion, in many cases driving out the orthodox incumbents and substituting Protestant for Catholic services. Presently reformers of every shade of opinion, even those who were tolerated nowhere else, poured into Poland, which speedily became the battleground of all the sects of Europe. Indeed, the Protestants soon became numerous enough to form ecclesiastical districts of their own. The first Calvinist synod in Poland was held at Pinchów in 1550, when Felix Krzyżak was elected superintendent. The Bohemian Brethren, too, now proceeded to evangelize little Poland, and found schools and churches, and finally, at the synod of Koźminek, August 1555, they formally united with the Calvinists. A Catholic synod held the same year at Piotrków, at which the famous Hosius, the youngest but by far the most capable and conscientious of the Catholic bishops, appeared prominently for the first time, proved utterly helpless to stem the rising tide of Protestantism. In the same itself the Protestants were absolutely supreme, and they invariably elected a Calvinist or even a Socinian to be their marshal. At the Diet of 1555 they boldly demanded the National Synod for the cleansing and reforming of the Church, and presented nine points for the consideration of the King and Senate, amounting to a demand of absolute toleration and of the equalization of all the confessions except that of the anti-Trinitarians. The bishops naturally refused to entertain this revolutionary program, and the King again intervening as mediator, the existing interim was, by mutual consent, indefinitely prolonged. The violent and unscrupulous proceedings of the bigoted Ludovico Lippomano, sent from Rome to Poland as nuncio in 1555, still further damaged the Catholic cause by provoking universal indignation, the very bishops refusing to obey him. At the subsequent Diet of Warsaw, 1556, the whole of the Izba, or lower chamber, clamoured furiously against quote unquote, the Egyptian bondage of the prelacy, and demanded absolute freedom of discussion in all religious questions. Again, however, the king adopted a middle course, and by the Edict of Warsaw, January 1557, it was decreed that things should remain as they were till the following Diet. At that Diet, which assembled at Piotrków in December 1558, the onslaught of the Schlachta on the clergy was fiercer than ever, and a determined attempt was even made to exclude the bishops from the Senate on the principle that no man could serve two masters. True loyalty and patriotism, it was urged, could not be expected from prelates who were the sworn servants of a foreign potentate, the Pope. The King and the Senate, however, perceiving a danger to the Constitution in the violence of the Schlachta, not only took the part of the bishops, but quashed a subsequent reiterated demand for a national synod, and on February the 8th, 1558, the Diet dissolved without coming to any resolution whatever. The king, 
in his valedictory address, justly threw all the blame for the utter abortiveness of the session upon the intemperance and injustice of the Schlachta. The same of 1558 to 1559 indicates the high-water mark of Polish Protestantism. From this time forward it began to subside, although very gradually, yet unmistakably. The chief cause of this subsidence was the divisions among the reformers themselves. The almost absolute religious liberty which they enjoyed in Poland proved, in the long run, far more injurious to them than the church which they professed to reform. From the chaos of creeds resulted a chaos of ideas on all imaginable moral and social subjects, which culminated in a violent clashing of the various sects, each one of which naturally strove for the mastery. The first to sow discord among the Polish Protestants was Francis Stankar, professor of Greek at Krakow, who published a treatise against the divinity of Christ entitled De Mediatore, which was condemned by the Calvinist Synod in 1554. Crypto-Socinians were, however, very numerous in Poland. Socinus himself had spread his doctrines there as early as 1551. They held at first with the Calvinists, although their peculiar opinions gave rise to fierce debates in the Calvinist synods. Their leaders, Blandrata, Okino, Abiat, and others, although differing more or less widely among themselves, were loosely connected under the general term of anti-Trinitarians. They gradually succeeded in winning over some of the principal Protestant ministers of Poland, e.g. Lismanini, Lutomirski, Opauli and at last became even more obnoxious to the less extreme protestant sects than were the catholics themselves at a calvinistic synod held in 1562 to 1563 things came to an open rupture and the anti-trinitarians were formally expelled from the community and became the objects of the most bitter persecution at the hands of their former co-religionists moreover it was a common hatred of the anti-trinitarians which at length drew the hitherto fiercely jarring Calvinists and Lutherans together. But despite the holding of a united synod of the two confessions at Posen, October 1560 and November 1561, the relations between the two principal Protestant sects still continued to be rather fratricidal than fraternal. An auxiliary cause of the decline of Protestantism in Poland was the beginning of a Catholic reaction there. Not only the far-seeing statesman like monarch himself, but his chief counsellors also, could no longer resist the conviction that the project of a national church was a mere utopia in view of the interminable dogmatic disputes of the hopelessly irreconcilable reforming sects. The bulk of the population, moreover, still held languidly yet persistently to the fate of its fathers, and the Holy See, awakening at last to the gravity of the situation, gave to the slowly reviving zeal to, of both clergy and laity the very necessary impetus from without. Never indeed was the immense value of an independent external authority in ecclesiastical government so strikingly illustrated as at this critical period, for there cannot be any doubt that in the first instance it was the papal nuncios who reorganized the scattered and faint-hearted battalions of the church militant in poland and led them back to victory the first of these reconstructing nuncios berard bishop of camerino who arrived in fifteen sixty was charged by the pope to put an end to the paralyzing dissensions of the polish prelates to inquire into the alleged heresy of the archbishop-designate, Jakub Buchański, who was actually under the ban of Rome, and to induce the king to send deputies to the Council of Trent. The diplomatic finesse of the gentle and insinuating Berard proved far more efficacious than the blustering zeal of his predecessor. Perceiving that Buchański was so powerful and so popular as to be practically unassailable, he skilfully enlisted him on the side of Rome by absolving him from all ecclesiastical censures and warmly espousing his cause, with the result that Uchański's translation to the primacy was confirmed. He also persuaded the king to send delegates to the council at Trent, where Hosius was already actually engaged not as a Polish bishop but as a cardinal legate. Moreover, at a Catholic synod held in 1561, he opposed all violence and persecution, and persuaded the bishops to respond liberally to the financial requirements of the king. 
His efforts were less successful at the Diet which met at Piotrków in 1562. On this occasion Sigismund completely won the susceptible hearts of the Shlachta by appearing in the grey coat of a Mazovian squire. Needing the subsidies of the deputies, for the incorporation by Poland of most of the territories of the defunct order of the sword had excited the jealousy of Muscovy and the Scandinavian powers, and the whole northeastern frontier of the Republic was consequently in danger, Sigismund was prepared, as the lesser of two evils, to sacrifice the clergy, and with his consent the jurisdiction of the ecclesiastical courts was practically abolished, it being declared that henceforth no confiscation consequent upon condemnation for heresy could be executed except by the secular courts as administered by the starostas or provincial governors, many of whom, by the way, were Protestants. The bishops warmly protested, but the king was inexorable. You must, he said, take the plunge. One result of this reverse was the recall of the nuncio Berard, to whose incompetence the passing of such an anti-clerical measure was attributed by the curia, and, at the suggestion of Hosius, Giovanni Francisco Commendone, bishop of Zante, one of the most experienced and devoted of the Roman diplomatists, was appointed his successor. Commendone arrived in Poland at the end of November 1563. His earlier dispatches were anything but reassuring. The higher Catholic clergy were described as disunited and disaffected, and strenuously adverse to the Tridentine reform which it was his mission to impose upon them. The Protestants, with the audacity of perfect impunity, were guilty almost daily of outrages against the Catholic ceremonies and religion. The childless king, to the delight of the Protestants, seemed intent on a divorce from his third wife, his first wife's sister, Archduchess Catherine of Austria, widow of the Duke of Mantua, whom he had married for purely political reasons in 1553, two years after the death of his beloved second wife Barbara, when she had been crowned only six months, and who was now living apart from him at Radom, an incurable invalid. According to Commendone, moreover, the condition of the country parishes was deplorable. One third of the churches had been turned into meeting-houses. Whole monasteries were infected with heresy. In many places mass was said as rudely and clumsily as if it were now being celebrated for the first time. The people at large were steeped in drunkenness and debauchery. Nevertheless, these manifold difficulties seemed to melt away at the touch of the capable and courageous nuncio, whose consummate tact and indefatigable energy speedily worked wonders, especially as the king, despite the strong influence of Black Radzivil and his Calvinist surroundings, despite even the alluring precedent of Henry the Eighth of England and the Scandinavian princes, did not press to an issue the much-dreaded question of the divorce. In August 1564, Commendone presented the Tridentine decrees to Sigismund, who promised to accept and promulgate them, and, thus encouraged, the nuncio now proceeded a step further, and persuaded the king to issue an edict banishing all foreign heretics from the land, and forbidding conversions to the new doctrines, especially to the doctrine of the anti-Trinitarianism. These were especially designated in order to reconcile the Calvinists to this decree, which, moreover, at first was interpreted so leniently as to remain practically abortive so far as the latter were concerned. At the subsequent Diet of 1565 the Protestants presented a petition for a national pacificatory synod, but the king rejected it as unnecessary, inasmuch as the Council of Trent had already settled all religious questions. He declared at the same time that he was resolved to live and die a Catholic. But the most reassuring feature of this diet, from a churchman's point of view, was the presence in the Isba of a zealous Catholic minority which, while willing enough to keep the clergy within bounds, energetically protested against any attack upon the church's ceremonies or dogmas. It was quite a new thing to see the Polish gentry marshalled round a papal nuncio and drawing their sabres in full session against the gainsayers of Catholic truth. At the same diet, moreover, Sigismund, yielding to the persuasions of Commendone and of Hosius, who had now returned to Poland, consented to the introduction into Poland of the most formidable adversaries of the Reformation, the Jesuits. 
Noskovsky, Bishop of Płock, had already indeed installed them at Pultusk, and after the Diet had separated, the society was permitted to found establishments in the dioceses Posen, Ermenland, Varmia, and Vilna, which henceforth became centres of a vigorous and victorious propaganda. In December 1565, Commendone quitted Poland, well satisfied with the results of his mission, and indeed the Catholic cause in Poland, though still beset by many difficulties, was henceforth free from danger. End of section 9section ten of the cambridge modern history volume three the wars of religion recording by piotr nater this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter three the catholic reaction and the valois and battery elections in poland by r nisbet bain part two the great political event of Sigismund's later years, the union of Poland and Lithuania into a single state with a common diet and executive, accomplished at Lublin in 1569, threw purely religious questions somewhat into the background. But the Catholic revival gained in strength every year, although the king continued judiciously to hold the balance between the opposing parties and preserved order by occasionally nominating Protestants to the highest offices of state, and always preventing persecution. Moreover, a new order of bishops, men of apostolic faith and fervor, such as Konarski of Posen and Karnkowski of Kujawia, were gradually superseding the indolent and corrupt old prelates of Bona's creation, and, under the skillful leadership of Cardinal Hosius, and with the silent cooperation of the Jesuits, were everywhere recovering lost ground, Many of the magnates were about this time reconverted to the Catholic religion, the most notable acquisitions being Adalbert Waski and Jan Siewakowski, both of whom the Protestants could ill afford to lose. The long-deferred union of the Bohemian Brethren, Lutherans and Calvinists, Consensus of Sandomir, 1570, points to an effort on the part of the Protestant sects to concentrate their forces likewise, but at the same time they played into the hands of their Catholics' adversaries by their violent persecution of the anti-Trinitarians, whom Hosius, from motives of policy, ostentatiously took under his protection. In the same itself, the attacks of the Protestants upon the Catholics grew feebler every year, ceasing at last altogether. Nay, at the Diet of 1569, the Protestants actually made overtures for a union with the Catholics, which the latter postponed, till the reformed sects should have become, quote, quite agreed among themselves as to what they really believed, end quote. At the Diet of 1570, Sigismund, strong in the support of a large and zealous Catholic party, rejected a petition of the Protestants that their confession should be placed on a statutory equality with Catholicism, and postponed to the following Diet the enforcement of the decrees against the anti-Trinitarians and Anabaptists, which were never carried out, owing to the vigorous interposition at the Diet of 1572 of Commendone, who had been sent on a second mission to Poland in November 1571. A few months later Sigismund II died suddenly, without leaving any regulations as to the election of his successor. The decease of this prudent and tolerant monarch was a serious blow to Protestantism in Poland. Henceforth, as we shall find, the reformers had to deal with princes more or less hostile to them, and to abandon all hope of domination. It remained to be seen whether they could even hold the ground they had actually won. Fortunately for Poland, the political horizon was absolutely unclouded on the death of Sigismund II, otherwise the situation would have been serious, for domestic affairs were in an almost anarchical condition. The Union of Lublin, barely three years old, was anything but consolidated, and in Lithuania it continued to be extremely unpopular. In Poland proper, too, the Szlachta was fiercely opposed to the magnates, and the Protestants seemed bent upon still further castigating the clergy. Worst of all, there existed no recognized authority in the land to curb and control its jarring centrifugal political element. It was nearly two hundred years since the Republic had last been saddled with an interregnum, and the precedents of 1382 were obsolete. 
The primate Uhansky, on hearing of the demise of the crown, at once invited all the senators of Great Poland to a conference at Łowicz, but passed over the Szlachta altogether. In an instant the whole republic was seething like a cauldron. Jan Firley, Grand Marshal of the Crown and the head of the Protestant party, simultaneously summoned to Krakow a confederation of the gentry, which received the support of the senators of Little Poland, who resented the exclusiveness of the primate's assembly. Civil war was happily averted at the last moment by the mediation of Peter Zborowski, Castellan of Sandomir, and a convocation or national convention, the first of its kind, composed of senators and deputies from all parts of the kingdom, assembled at Warsaw, in the heart of Catholic Mazovia, in April 1573, for the purpose of electing a new king. The Protestants had proposed Calvinistic Lublin as the place of meeting, but were outvoted. Meanwhile, five candidates for the throne were already in the field. Lithuania was in favour of her near neighbour, Tsar Ivan IV, whose election would have guaranteed her territories against the chronic Muscovite incursions. In Poland, the bishops and most of the Catholic magnates and senators were in favour of an Austrian archduke, but the tyrannous and persecuting House of Habsburg was so obnoxious to the nation at large that the Schlechter was disposed to accept almost any other candidate, except a Muscovite, who came with a gift in his hand. It was therefore no very difficult task for the adroit and energetic French ambassador, Montluc, who had been sent to Poland, October 1572, by Catherine de' Medici, to promote the candidature of her favourite son, Henry, Duke of Anjou, to win over the majority of the Schlachta, especially as it was notorious that Poland's most dangerous neighbour, the Ottoman port, while inclined to tolerate a French prince on the Polish throne, would certainly regard the election of an Austrian archduke as a casus belli. Montluc, well provided with funds, had already succeeded in purchasing many of the leading magnates, notably Adalbert Waski, Palatine of Siradia, a dashing adventurer of heroic courage but absolutely devoid of conscience in money matters. He placed his chief hopes, however, in the ignorant and credulous masses of the Schlachta, in whose hands, as he acutely perceived from the first, the issues of the election really lay. He therefore devoted his energies to captivating all the lesser gentry, irrespective of religion. The Protestants were reassured by his exaggerated accounts of the tolerant policy, adopted just then by the French court, towards the Huguenots, while he insinuated mysteriously to the Catholics that the French candidate, as a loyal son of the Church, would leave nothing undone to promote the glory of God. Montluc's popularity reached its height when he strenuously advocated the adoption of the Powszechne Prawo Głosowania, or open popular mode of election, by the gentry en masse, which the Schlachta now proposed to revive, as opposed to the more orderly secret election by a congress of senators and deputies sitting with closed doors. It was mainly due to his efforts and the impassioned eloquence of young Jan Zamoyski, starosta of Belsz, now on the threshold of his brilliant political career, that the same decided in favour of the more popular method. The religious difficulty, meanwhile, had been adjusted to the satisfaction of all parties by the Compact of Warsaw, January twenty second, 1573, which granted absolute religious liberty to all non-Catholic denominations, dissidentes de religione, as they now began to be called, without exception, thus exhibiting a far more liberal intention than the Germans had manifested in the religious peace of Augsburg, eighteen years before. Nevertheless, the Warsaw Compact was eventually vitiated by the clauses which reserved to every master, spiritual or secular, the right, quote, to punish according to his judgment, end quote, every rebellious servant, even if his rebellion were entirely due to his religious convictions. This unlimited power of arbitrary correction speedily resulted in the absolute serfdom of the rural population, and eventually, when the Protestant proprietors were gradually won back to the church by the Jesuits, their dependents were of course forced to follow their example. Early in April 1573 the election diet began to assemble at Warsaw, and across the newly built bridge, the first that ever united the banks of the Vistula, flowed a stream of 40,000 electors, swelled to 100,000 by their retainers and dependents, hastening to pitch their tents in the plain of Kamienie near Warsaw. 
where the fate of the Republic was to be decided. The next fortnight was passed in fierce debates and in listening to the oration of the foreign ambassadors. The imperial ambassador, who spoke in Bohemian, first addressed the electors in favour of his candidate, the Archduke Ernest, but though he had a very great deal to say, he had very little to offer. Consequently, the electors soon found him tedious and clamoured impatiently for Montluc to speak. But it was now late, and the sagacious Frenchman, to avoid addressing a tired audience, feigned illness and postponed his harangue till the following day, when he exceeded the fondest expectations of his admirers by delivering an oration, quote, worthy of eternal remembrance, end quote, which took the whole assembly by storm. The speeches of the Swedish envoys which followed were considered tame and sober in comparison, especially as they were not reinforced by golden arguments. Nevertheless, as the prospects of the Duke of Anjou approximated to certainty, the more cool-headed of the electors began to feel some natural anxiety as to how far this foreign prince, the offspring of a despotic house, would be likely to respect the liberties of the Republic. The tidings of the massacre of St. Bartholomew had come as a shock to many, especially to the Protestants, although to them Montluc plausibly represented the catastrophe as a spontaneous and unauthorized endeavor of the loyal city of Paris to crush a dangerous Huguenot rebellion. It was therefore decided that the election should be postponed to a correctura iurum, or reform of the constitution, and a special commission was appointed for that purpose. This precautionary measure was, however, by no means to the liking of the Catholic party, and accordingly Montluc instigated, quote-unquote, his Praetorians, the ten thousand enthusiastic but grossly ignorant Mazovian electors, to protest energetically against any further delay. The commission was consequently obliged to confine itself to drawing up certain preliminary conditions considerably curtailing the royal authority. The Henrican Articles, as they were called, deprived the future king of the privilege of electing his successor, forbade his marrying without the previous consent of the Senate, required him to protect all the religious sects equally, and maintain the Sondevoyevudske, or temporal tribunals, considerably restricted his authority as commander-in-chief, and bound him to accept a permanent council of fourteen senators, elected every two years by the Diet, four of whom, in rotation, were to be in constant attendance upon him. The debates evoked by these constitutional changes were still proceeding when the Mazovian deputies, instigated by Montluc, proceeded in a body to a pavilion of the Senate and threatened to choose forthwith a king of their own if the election were postponed much longer. And, yielding to this pressure, the Grand Marshal Firley fixed May 4 for the election. On that day the ten thousand Mazovians voted unanimously for Henry, and their example was followed by the electors of the Palatines of Płock, Dobrzyń, and Podlasia, and most of the Lithuanians. On the other hand, the Prussian and Kiovian electors voted for the Archduke Ernest, while a large number of the electors of Great Poland and a considerable minority of the Lithuanians demanded a Piast or native Pole, and declared for Jan Kostka palatine of sandomeria the henricans with a powerful majority behind them now urged the primate to proclaim their candidate king but this demand was vigorously opposed by the protestant party headed by firley who formed themselves into an armed confederation and a retired en masse from the field of election sabres were drawn on both sides and civil war again seemed imminent but negotiations were ultimately opened between the contending assemblies, and the Protestant terms were being considered when the armed Mazovian mob again surrounded the pavilion where the Senate was deliberating and forced on the nomination of their candidates. Then, for a whole hour, says an eyewitness, there was nothing but a hurrying and a scurrying, the beating of drums, the blaring of trumpets, the firing of guns, and after that we all mounted our steeds and rode off to sing at a deum at the church of St. John. Thus, in the midst of intrigue, corruption, violence, and confusion, Henry of Valois was, on May 11, 1573, elected King of Poland. A few days later, Pacta Conventa, corresponding to our coronation oath, were laid before the French ambassador at Warsaw for signature. 
By these articles the King of France was to bind himself within six months to keep on foot in Poland 4,000 Saxons for service against Muscovy. Henry was to maintain a fleet in the Baltic at his own expense, place 450,000 ducats at the disposal of the Republic, provide learned professors for the Krakow Academy, educated 100 of the young Polish nobles abroad, espouse the late king's sister, the Królewna Anna, a princess 18 years his senior, immediately after his arrival in Poland, confirm the Compact of Warsaw, and obtain religious liberty for the French Huguenots. Onerous and extravagant as these conditions were, Moluk instantly accepted all of them except the last, whereupon Firley's party also proclaimed Henry King of Poland, and a magnificent embassy, consisting of the leading senators of the French party, was forthwith dispatched to France. They arrived at Paris on August 19th, after being detained for a time on their way through Germany by the disappointed and vindictive emperor. But even now their difficulties were not over. The very ample demands of the Polish democracy seemed monstrous to French absolutism, and it was not until after three weeks of incessant disputation and explanation that Henry was finally persuaded to sign the Pacta at Notre Dame on September the 10th. What he objected to most of all was that he, who was only twenty-two, should be compelled to marry a woman of forty, at the simple bidding of his Polish subjects. Indeed, he absolutely refused to bind himself on this head, although willing to promise that he would never marry without the previous consent of the Polish Senate and same. And with this concession, the deputation had at last to be content. Many of us, writes the contemporary Marcin Bielski in his chronicle, alluding to the new king, promised ourselves all sorts of good things from this gentleman, and had such an opinion of him as to make us fancy that nobody could rule us better or more profitably. So thought we, but the Lord God ordered it otherwise. And indeed Catherine de' Medici's corrupt, frivolous, and despotic son was not equal to the double duty of curbing and conciliating his unruly subjects. The Polish Schlachta, who had grown up in the austerely dignified court of the Jagiełłos, were revolted by Henry's nocturnal vagabondage in the streets of Krakow, by his bacchanalian debaucheries at the castle, and by his indecent revels in the presence of the Korolevna and her ladies. Henry himself, moreover, nurtured as he had been in the hotbed of luxurious absolutism, could not breathe freely in the rude and boisterous atmosphere of Sarmatian liberty, and with the new papal nuncio, Vincenzo Laureo, perpetually at his elbow, and urging him to perform some great act of faith in the eyes of all men, such, for instance, as closing the dissenting conventicles of Krakow, or publicly revoking the oath imposed upon him at Paris by the Polish delegates, which bound him to confirm the statutes of the Diet of Warsaw in favor of the dissidents, the new king's position, in view of his obligations to the Protestants, was difficult to desperation. Indeed, the violent scene which took place at his coronation in the Cathedral of Krakow on February 21st, 1574, three days after his arrival, convinced him that the dissidents would never submit tamely to any such cavalier treatment. The oaths having been duly administered, Henry had risen to his feet again when the palatines of Krakow, of Vilna, and of Sandomeria, the leaders of the dissidents, came forward, and with great importunity pressed the king to confirm an oath which he had made at Paris. But the archbishop would hear of no such innovation, and withstood them with high words. Thereupon Grand Marshal Firley rose, and placing his hand upon the crown, insisted categorically that the coronation oath should be recited in full before the ceremony proceeded. A fearful tumult at once ensued. The clamour soon spread from the altar to the choir, and thence into the nave, so that many feared a conflict, when Jan Hotkiewicz, the palatine of Samogitia, cried that it would suffice them, quod rex conservaret pacem et tranquillitatem inter dissidentes de religione. The king, without taking a set oath, thereupon confirmed what Hotkiewicz had said, adding, conservare curabo. Against this the archbishop protested, while the bishop of Cuyavia exclaimed, salvis iuribus nostris and the king salvis iuribus vestris meanwhile the palatine of krakow as grand marshal of the kingdom 
quitted the chancel and addressing the people in polish in a loud voice asked whether the king having now done all that it behoved him to do it was their good pleasure that he should be crowned whereupon the people exclaimed with a shout crown him long live the king and so he was anointed and crowned without further misadventure the position of the new king between such jarring elements was therefore difficult at the best of times and might at any time become really dangerous every moment he had reason to regret his haste in accepting so thorny a crown for seven hours a day he had to endure the interminable and only half intelligible debates in the senate whose president he was while the fierce dissensions of the coronation diet which assembled at the beginning of april to confirm the pacta conventa and in which a bare catholic majority stood face to face with a strong and aggressive protestant minority distracted and dismayed him moreover his gross partiality for his chief supporters the powerful zborovskis speedily and completely alienated from him the hearts of the gentry at a tournament held in his honour shortly after his coronation young samuel zborovski in a fit of pique and without any extenuating circumstances mortally wounded vapovsky castellan of tremyshl who died a few days afterwards the kinsfolk of the murdered man clamoured for justice well aware that death was the statutory punishment for the homicide of a nobleman but the king allowed himself to be influenced by the powerful friends of the accused and the sentence finally pronounced perpetual banishment without either loss of honour or forfeiture of goods was received with general astonishment and indignation the schlachta regarding it not only as ridiculously inadequate but as an outrage upon their whole order the result was a general revulsion of feeling against the entire french party hundreds of pasquinades began to circulate against the king and his following and members of the royal suite were frequently assaulted in the street yet still the king continued to lean almost exclusively upon the Zborovskis, and all the principal offices at his disposal were bestowed upon their friends and relations his uniform coldness towards the korolevna moreover did not tend to make him less unpopular he continued to stay at cracow in order to be nearer to france in view of the speedy decease of his brother charles the ninth who had been long ailing and on june fourteenth fifteen seventy four a courier from the emperor brought to cracow tidings of the death of that monarch on the following morning henry dressed in violet after the french custom appeared in the senate received the condolences of a deputation of magnates who there awaited him and in solemn and affecting words quote unquote, not without tears declared himself more than ever resolved to provide for the safety and glory of the republic he had at first intended to act constitutionally and obtain permission from the diet to revisit his native land but the fear of a humiliating refusal led him to change his mind at the last moment and resolve to escape by stealth on friday evening june eighteenth fifteen seventy four the king having gone to bed and dismissed the polish gentleman in waiting on the plea of weariness issued secretly from the castle by a little gate and having taken horse near the stables departed half an hour after midnight accompanied by a few french lords he took the shortest way to silesia was joined on the road by a party of french gentlemen mounted and well armed who had been waiting for him and made such haste that he had passed the frontier and entered silesia before he was overtaken by any of those polish lords who with a great company of horsemen had sent out in pursuit two hours after his majesty had quitted the castle of these only the count of tentrin his under chamberlain overtook him about a league beyond the frontier and with all due submission used every argument to persuade the king to return henry excused himself with words full of deep emotion saying that he must needs hasten on to france as otherwise he ran a great risk of losing that kingdom altogether but gave hopes that he would speedily return and referred tension in the meantime to the letters which he the king had written to the senate and left behind him accounting for his sudden disappearance a week later henry was dancing at a ball at chambery to which place he was pursued by a troop of cavaliers sent after him by karnkowski the militant bishop of kujawia 
The indignation of the Poles at this disgraceful flight was vehement and alarming. Perjurer, swindler, craven were the mildest epithets bestowed upon the defaulting monarch. All who were compromised in his support went for weeks in terror of their lives. The wealth, dignity, and influence of the Palatine of Sandomeria could not save him from insult. The Bishop of Cuyavia narrowly escaped stoning in the streets of Krakow, while the nuncio was reviled to his face and threatened with death or banishment. The Senate, after a turbulent session, agreed to address a solemn remonstrance to the king, and the primate, Jacob Uchański, as interrex, convoked a new diet, which was to meet at Warsaw on August 24, 1574. The Diet of Warsaw was short and stormy. The vast majority of the deputies, both Catholic and Protestant, were of opinion that the king was civilly dead, and that the public safety demanded the instant election of his successor. The majority of the Senate, however, and most of the prelates, including the primate, were of the contrary opinion. Meanwhile, audiences were given to the ambassadors of the competitors for the crown, no fewer than three of whom were already in the field, that is, the Emperor Maximilian II of Germany, King John Vasa of Sweden, and Duke Alfonso II of Ferrara. The Emperor, from his vicinity, dignity, and power, was most acceptable to the Senate, but the lesser nobility declared they would rather die than accept a German, and they found an ally in no less a person than Sultan Amurat III, who had also sent a Kiaus, or special envoy, to the Diet. The Turkish envoy, on this occasion, displayed a tact and finesse very unusual just then with the envoys of a nation which, invincible in arms, affected to despise the circuitous methods of diplomacy. The Sultan well knew, he said, that there was no hope of Henry's return. A new king must therefore be elected, but he was not to be taken from among the Sultan's enemies, of whom the Emperor was the chief. Their choice must fall upon one who would live at harmony with the port. His master had heard that in the confines of Danzig there was a man in every way worthy of the royal dignity. This was Jan Kostka, Palatine of Sandomeria. Why not elect him? Or there was the Swedish king, or Bathory, prince of Transylvania, the sultan's trusty friend and ally, renowned for his courage, integrity, and prudence. Elect any one of these three, and the sultan would not only not disturb, but even actively assist the republic. The Diet was much flattered by the tone and manner of the Kiaus. All three of the proposed candidates were agreeable to the Poles, though for different reasons. The Palatine of Sandomeria, perhaps the most popular, certainly the most powerful magnet in the land, was one of themselves. King John of Sweden was connected by marriage with the ancient and illustrious Jagiełło dynasty, which had ruled Poland gloriously for three hundred years. Lastly, the Hungarian, Battery, though a stranger, could scarcely be called a foreigner, for he belonged to a nation which had much in common with the Poles, and had stood by them in weal and woe for centuries. Besides, he had the additional personal recommendation of being one of the greatest captains of his age. The multiplication of candidates, however, so divided and perplexed the Diet that no resolution could be come to, and the Nuncio's party, aided by the Machiavellian Palatine of Podolia, skilfully took advantage of the general confusion to carry through a compromise, whereby King Henry was given till Ascension Day, May 12, 1575, to return and resume the government, failing which he was to be degraded and dethroned, and a new diet convoked to meet at the little town of Stenzitz, which the nuncio dejectedly describes as the most heretically infected hole in the kingdom. The Stenzitz diet, which met on May 12, 1575, could in no sense be called a fairly representative assembly. Out of more than 50,000 Polish gentlemen entitled to deliberate and vote in the National Council, scarcely 5,000 made their appearance. The Lithuanians and Prussians, however, who represented at least one half of the population and more than three-fourths of the territory of the Republic, but who had consistently refused not merely to recognize but even to attend the previous Diet, naturally disputed the validity of the present Assembly also, and merely sent a handful of delegates to protest against its proceedings altogether. It was the almost unanimous opinion of the Diet of Stenzitz that Henry of Valois, by failing to appear, had forfeited the throne, and he was accordingly deposed on the very first day of the session. 
When, however, the question arose how to fill the vacancy, the assembly at once split up into half a dozen fiercely antagonistic sections. Anything like agreement was absolutely hopeless. The audiences given to the ambassadors of the various competitors only increased the prevalent confusion. The Swedish envoy had nothing but vague words of benevolence in his mouth. The Muscovite envoys had neither money nor definite instructions, and were obliged at the eleventh hour to throw themselves into the arms of the emperor, who could already count upon the votes of the prelacy and higher nobility. But the Polish gentry's ineradicable hatred and suspicion of the crafty semi-Spanish Habsburgs defeated all the calculations of the imperialists. No sooner were the Archduke Ernest and his father, the Emperor Maximilian, proposed to the Diet by the Senate, than the five thousand deputies rose as one man and exclaimed, Niech chcemy Niemca, nie chcemy Niemca! We won't have a German, we won't have a German! For the moment it seemed not improbable that every member of the German faction would be put to the sword. Finally, the majority of the Polish deputies, the Lithuanians had already seceded from the assembly, quitted the Diet and marched in a body to the ruins of the castle of Sieciech on the banks of the Vistula. Here they strongly entrenched themselves, and for the next four days kept up a rolling fire of musketry to terrify their opponents. Deputations now went backwards and forwards daily between the castle of Sieciech and the Senate, but for a long time without the slightest result. At last, however, it was resolved that the whole question should be referred to another diet, a compromise very welcome to the imperialist party. And on June 27, 1575, after a session of twenty-six days, the Stenzitz Diet dissolved amidst the wildest confusion, and the Interrex summoned a new Diet to meet at Warsaw on November the 7th. A few weeks later, the Poles were taught the evils of anarchy by a terrible lesson. In the beginning of October 1575, the eastern provinces of the Republic were ravaged by a predatory Tartar horde, said to be 120,000 strong. The gentry shut themselves up in their strongholds. The common people fled to the nearest fortified towns, while, quote-unquote, the scourge of God swept over the rich plains of the Ukraine, leaving a smoking wilderness behind them, and disappearing into their native steppes with 55,000 captives, 150,000 horses, and countless herds of cattle, long before the frontier palatines could rally sufficient cavalry to oppose them. This lesson was not thrown away. At the next diet a king was really elected, though not the king that all the world had been led to expect. End of section 10。section 11 of the Cambridge Modern History, volume 3, The Wars of Religion, recording by Piotr Nater. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3. The Catholic Reaction and the Valois and Battery Elections in Poland by R. Nisbeth Bain. Part 3. The Great Plain round Warsaw was the meeting place of the new Diet. The Senate, anxious for the maintenance of order, and with the warning example of the last Diet before its eyes, had issued a proclamation limiting the retinue of each magnate to fifty persons, and strictly forbidding the lesser nobles to carry any other arms than the sword and halberd, without which no Polish gentleman considered himself fully dressed. But a decree that cannot be enforced is so much waste paper, and so it was now. Every one of the palatins who came to the Diet was surrounded by a bodyguard of at least one thousand horsemen, Cossacks, Hayduks, or Wallachs. The gentry also came Kapapi. The prohibited arquebuses and spiked battle-axes were in everybody's hands, and there were whole forests of lances. On November the 7th, 1575, the assembly marched in solemn procession to the cathedral, where mass was celebrated by the primate, who accompanied the deputies back to the Koa, and after invoking the aid of the Holy Spirit, declared the Diet opened. From November 13th to 18th, audience was given to the ambassadors of the various competitors, who extolled the virtues of their principles, and sought to outbid one another for the support of the Senate and the Diet. The Bishop of Breslau spoke first on behalf of the Archduke Ernest. He eloquently expatiated upon the gifts, the graces, the martial virtues, 
above all upon the linguistic accomplishments of the young prince so well versed was he in the bohemian tongue that the acquisition of the cognate polish language would be a mere trifle to him then too his great experience of affairs and his religious tolerance should not be overlooked where else would the poles expect to find a prince of such majesty and influence the support of the emperor the alliance of spain and the empire the union of bohemia the friendship of the european powers all these things were at his disposal he would also solemnly engage to keep inviolate the laws the liberties the ancient constitution of poland to live at peace with the turk to make new and more advantageous commercial treaties with denmark and the hanseatic league to erect new fortresses for the defence of the frontiers to rule through none but natives to send one hundred noble polish and lithuanian youths annually to the foreign universities to pay the arrears due to the army and the debts owing by the state in short he not only promised mountains and seas as the nuncio expresses it but anticipated his rivals by engaging in the emperor's name to grant everything that any of them might subsequently offer count francis turn quote, with all the dignity of age and all the vivacity of youth end quote, then delivered an extravagant panegyric on the archduke ferdinand according to the orator the world had never seen the equal of this young prince he was the pillar the oracle the shining light of the house of austria he spoke bohemian like his mother tongue and without disparaging the other members of the imperial family the speaker would boldly assert that ferdinand was by far the most distinguished of them all turn promised on behalf of his principal two hundred thousand florins toward reconstructing the polish fortresses and if agreeable to the diet ferdinand would also raise and maintain at his own cost a standing army of german mercenaries wherewith to fight the battles of the republic the ambassador of john of sweden who had nothing to offer but an alliance against the muscovite was despite his connection with the agilvos but coldly received whereas the spokesman of the fabulously wealthy duke of ferrara whose quote, indescribable love for the noble polish nation end quote, prompted him to promise to restore the cathedral of cracow at his private cost to lead six thousand horsemen equipped out of the revenues of his italian estates against the muscovite to replenish the exhausted polish exchequer and to educate fifteen young poles every year in italy was held to have spoken much more to the point last of all came george blandrata the ambassador of stephen bathory prince of transylvania who spoke with soldierly frankness and precision it was no time he said for meretricious words but for meritorious deeds the safety of christendom of which sarmatia was the iron bastion depended upon the prudence and concord of the estates of poland it was their bounden duty to lay aside all private ends and personal animosities and with uplifted hands seek the divine counsels the prince his master was animated by no vain lust of power he was well aware of his own deficiencies and none knew better than he that the sarmatian diadem must always be a constant care and a heavy burden to the wearer the orator then briefly alluded to the well-known homogeneity of hungary and poland to their frequent union fraternal concord ancient alliances to their time-honoured fellowship in peace and war still more briefly he touched on the merits of his master for whom he justly claimed all the requisites of a great soldier and statesman adding that his ignorance of the native language of poland was more than atoned for by his perfect command of latin her official tongue next with great skill he anticipated the objection which might be taken to bathory as being the sultan's nominee the sultan he said did not command them as a master he advised them as a friend if his advice were good why not thankfully embrace it with both arms if they thought it injurious however who prevented them from rejecting it finally he promised on behalf of bathory to preserve the national liberties to pay the national debt to recover all the muscovite conquests to make the frontiers of poland invulnerable to pay two hundred thousand florins into the treasury to wage war not by deputy but personally against all the enemies of the republic and if necessary to sacrifice his life on the battlefield for her honour and glory Blandrata's oration made a profound impression upon the Diet, and was greeted with loud applause. The Emperor's party, 
which began to despair of winning over the countless host of deputies, now placed all their hopes on the Senate, where, chiefly owing to the skill and audacity of the nuncio, they were very strong. Laureo, indeed, had so far compromised himself in support of the emperor as to run the risk of banishment in case of failure. Nay, on one occasion he had even thought it necessary to obtain a special absolution from the Pope for sundry diplomatic irregularities. Yet there is no reason to suppose that he was guided by other than the highest motives, and, though only the most signal success could justify his conduct as a whole, he never seems to have faltered for an instant on his self-chosen path to extirpate polish protestantism to form a grand league against the turk had all along been his objects and the shortest cut to them both now seemed to him to be the establishment of a habsburg on the polish throne his exertions were so far successful that after a few days debate november eighteenth to twenty first the Senate, by a large majority, declared itself in favour of the Emperor Maximilian. But the Diet had yet to be reckoned with. The debates in that turbulent assembly began on November 22nd and lasted till November 30th. The numerous factions, which had so long divided it, now resolved themselves into two, those who were for the Emperor and those who desired a Piast. Most of the Lithuanians and Prussians were for the former, but the Poles, who formed three-fourths of the Diet, were, almost to a man, against a German, and they found an eloquent and intrepid champion in Jan Zamoyski, Castellan of Belge, whose intellectual superiority was already generally recognized, and who was destined to become Poland's greatest chancellor. Jan Zamoyski belonged to one of the most ancient and illustrious families in Poland. After completing his education at Paris, Strasbourg, and Padua, he returned home one of the most consummate scholars and jurists in Europe. But his essentially bold and practical genius sought at once the stormy political arena, and he was mainly instrumental, after the death of Sigismund II, in remodelling the Polish constitution and procuring the election of Henry of Valois. After the flight of that prince, Zamoyski seems to have aimed at the throne himself, but quickly changed his mind and resolved to support one of his compeers. All his life long, both on the battlefield and in the council chamber, he was the most determined and dangerous enemy of the Habsburgs, the rock on which their anti-Polish projects went to pieces. Zamoyski now delivered an impassioned harangue against the emperor and his family. After holding up to the Diet the warning examples of Bohemia and Hungary, the historical victims of Austria's craft and cruelty, he asked whether it was prudent to irritate their good friend, the Sultan, all for the sake of a decrepit old man, Maximilian II, who could not defend them, or of a sickly youth, Archduke Ferdinand, inoculated from his cradle with Spanish bigotry and superciliousness. Zamoyski's speech was decisive. Despite the counter-arguments of the opposite party, the Diet, on November the 30th, decided by an enormous majority to elect a Piast, and on the following day the Grand Marshal officially informed the Senate of their decision. Negotiations now ensued. Zamoyski, as the spokesman of the Diet, eloquently declaimed in the Senate against the Emperor. The Polish deputies thereupon seceded from the Diet, and, encouraged by the accession of the minority of the Senate, sent a second deputation to the Interrex and his faction, demanding the repudiation of the Emperor. The Senate retorted by requesting the Diet to name its candidates, and, after some hesitation, Jan Kostka, Palatine of Sandomeria, and Jan Tenczynski, Palatine of Belge, were nominated. Both these noblemen instantly declined the dangerous distinction, and the primate, egged on by the imperialists to proclaim the Emperor, rose from his presidential chair, raised the crucifix aloft, and had already pronounced the first words of the coronation formula in nomine patris, when he was interrupted by the more cautious of his own party, who, to avoid bloodshed, postponed the proclamation till the following day. By daybreak, on December 10th, the field of election resembled a field of battle. Both parties stood face to face in full panoply, behind entrenchments bristling with cannon, the outbreak of a bloody civil war hung upon a thread. A last attempt at a compromise was made by the Bishop of Krakow on behalf of the Senate, 
while Zamoyski, at the head of a deputation from the Diet, bitterly reproached the imperial commissioners for sowing dissension in Poland. We are determined, cried the orator, not to suffer the fate of Hungary, and will on no account have a German king. On the twelfth, the Senate, perceiving the futility of further negotiation, and fearing the violence of the armed nobility, barricaded themselves within the citadel of Krakow. But at sunset, the primate, secretly issuing from the gates with a slender retinue, proceeded a quarter of a league from the city to a sequestered nook, and there, beneath the uplifted crucifix, and in the midst of a little group of senators, declared, in the name of the Most Holy Trinity, Maximilian II of Austria, King of Poland, by the will of the Senate and nobility of Poland and Lithuania. Then, returning with the utmost speed to Krakow, he closed the gates, planted artillery on the walls, and thereupon sang, with chattering teeth, a hasty te deum in the cathedral. But the triumph of the Senate was short-lived. At sunrise next morning, seven thousand Polish noblemen had assembled outside the city to protest, sword in hand, against the election of the emperor. The excitement was frantic, and the pacificatory deputation from the Senate narrowly escaped being massacred. The embarrassment of the assembly, however, was at last equal to its indignation. The question was, whom were they to elect? The emperor they refused at any price, but no native candidate dared to come forward against the Habsburgs. At last, when the confusion was worse confounded, the Palatine of Krakow suddenly arose and proposed the Prince of Transylvania. In an instant, the name of Bathory, whom no one had hitherto seriously regarded as a likely candidate, was on every lip, and a subsequent motion by Zamoyski that the prince should accept as his consort the Korolevna Anna was carried by acclamation. On the 14th, Sieniecki, the Grand Marshal of the Diet, thrice put the question to the chivalry of Poland and Lithuania, do you desire Stephen Bathory, Prince of Transylvania, to be your king? Whereupon the seven thousand thrice replied as one man, We do, we do. Then, cried the marshal, I herewith proclaim the said Stephen Bathory, King of Poland and Grand Duke of Lithuania, provided he take the Princess Anna to wife. Thus Poland had two kings elect, one supported by the Senate, the other by the Diet. It seemed as if nothing but the arbitrament of battle could decide which of the two was the rightful monarch. And now began a sheer race for the crown. The last act of the Diet was to dispatch a deputation to Transylvania to congratulate Bathory on his election, and to invite him to come instantly to Poland with as much money and as many men as he could get together. Escaping, as by a miracle, an ambush laid for them on the way by the imperialists, the deputation reached Stuhl Weissenburg, Bathory's capital, and delivered their message. Stephen acted with characteristic vigor. Fortified by a friendly letter from the Sultan, he prepared at once to take possession of his new realm, and, after drawing a military cordon along the Austrian frontier, and appointing his brother Christopher, vice-regent of Transylvania, he hastened with 2,500 picked troops by forced marches into Poland. Meanwhile, his partisans had not been idle. By the advice of Zamoyski, another Diet was summoned to confirm the decision of the Diet of Warsaw. It met on January 18, 1576, at Jędrzejów, on the Vistula, about ten leagues from Krakow, and here ten thousand Polish nobles, without awaiting the Lithuanians or Prussians, confirmed the election of Stephen and Anna, sent an embassy to Vienna, forbidding the Emperor to enter Poland, and then, after a fortnight's session, remarkable for its unanimity and tranquillity, marched in a body to Krakow, put to flight all the emperor's partisans, and sent another deputation to meet the king-elect, and escort him from the frontier to the coronation city. Yet even now the imperialists did not abandon all hopes. The nuncio was the life and soul of this party. He did all that energy and adroitness could do for a badly beaten cause, he boldly pronounced the election of the Transylvanian seditious and invalid. He endeavoured, though in vain, to cajole the Krolevna into rejecting her appointed husband and marrying one of the emperor's sons. He persuaded the primate, whose peculiar office it was to crown the kings of Poland, 
to absent himself from the coronation altogether. He wrote letter after letter to the Emperor, urging him to invade Poland at the head of a large army. He suggested that the Holy Father should forbid the voivode of Transylvania, as he persistently called the new king, to accept the crown. Nay, he even sent a special envoy to Bathory himself, adjuring him, by his chivalrousness, his piety, his Catholic faith, to give way to his imperial rival. A splendid embassy, headed by Adalbert Waski, had been already sent by the Senate to Vienna to announce to the Emperor Maximilian his election. On March 23rd, exactly a month later than Bathory, Maximilian II accepted the Polish crown in the Cathedral of St. Augustine, in the presence of the imperial family, the court, the papal legate, and the Venetian ambassador, and took the self-same oath which had already been taken by Stephen in the parish church of Stulweissenburg. From the cathedral the envoys were escorted to the castle, where they were pompously regaled at the grand banquet which lasted till dawn of day, when three successive salvos from seven hundred cannon hailed the newly elected king. But the thunder of the artillery had scarcely ceased when other Polish deputies from the Diet of Jendrejów arrived at Vienna to inform the emperor officially that Stephen Bathory was now the lawful king of Poland and they were speedily followed by a kiaus from the sultan with a letter in which amurat the third informed quote unquote, the king of vienna that for the last one hundred and thirty years poland had been under the special protection of the sublime port and that he the sultan had now been pleased to recognize his faithful servant and ally stephen bathory as king the sultan added that any attempt on maximilian's part to disturb either the polish or the transylvanian possessions of the new prince would be regarded at stambul as a casus belli and that in such a case the pasha of buda and the beglerbeck of temeshvar were under strict injunctions to cross the austrian frontier with one hundred thousand men in poland too bathory was carrying everything before him he had postponed his coronation for a fortnight as the day originally appointed fell within holy week so that it was not till Easter Monday, March the 23rd, 1576, that he made his state entry into Krakow. The procession was headed by George Banfi, captain of the Hungarian Hussars, the Palatine of Krakow, his brother, the Marshal of the Diet, and the Bishop of Kujawia, who, in the absence of the primate, was to crown the new king. Next rode five hundred Transylvanian gentlemen, two abreast, with leopard skins over gold and silver cuirasses. In the midst of this brilliant retinue towered the Herculean form of the monarch, distinguished by his manly carriage and majestic gravity. He wore a scarlet damask attila, a sable embroidered scarlet mantle, grey hose and yellow buskins. A black heron's plume waved from the top of his calpac, which was fastened by a diamond clasp. His huge bay horse, of the best Turkish breed, had a golden bit, and its bridle was encrusted with emeralds, rubies, and sapphires. Before the king were led three other Turkish thoroughbreds in scarlet housings trimmed with ermine, their saddles embroidered with the royal arms in gold and precious stones. Each saddle was valued at one hundred thousand florins. Immediately after him came one thousand Hungarian Heiduks, half of them in sky blue, half in crimson uniforms, all veterans, not one of whom had fought in less than ten pitched battles. They were known as the blue and red Drabans, but Bathory always called them my strength. An imposing array of one thousand Polish noblemen brought up the rear, at the head of whom rode the young and handsome Tentrinsky, Palatine of Beuz, so gorgeously attired, quote, that the like of it had never been seen in Poland within the memory of man, end quote. A glittering banderium followed him in gold and silver armor, mounted on fiery Arabs. On May 1st, after making the customary pilgrimage to the tomb of St. Stanislas, Stephen and Anne were crowned by the Bishop of Kujawia with the usual ceremonies, though not before Stephen had sternly warned the assembled nobles and prelates that he would hold them responsible for the possible consequences of their precipitancy. By the nuptials of the sovereigns, banquets and tourneys, the distribution of offices and dignities, Samoyski's appointment to the vice-chancellorship was one of the first, 
and the issue of circular letters summoning a general diet to warsaw in the beginning of june all who failed to appear there at the appointed time were to be regarded as traitors and rebels immediately afterwards bathory who was determined he said to show that he was quote, neither a painted nor a ballad king end quote, set off for warsaw to meet the diet the night before bathory's entry into the polish capital the nuncio had been obliged to leave it stephen had done everything in his power to win over laureo but his protests his remonstrances and his threats had alike been thrown away laureo though sorely troubled and dismayed never wavered in his allegiance to the emperor at last an ultimatum from the indignant king already on his way to warsaw to the obdurate prelate bade the latter either to come and meet him forthwith or leave the kingdom the legate chose the latter alternative and was escorted to silesia by a royal chamberlain his banishment however was not for long the sudden death of the emperor maximilian at the very moment when that potentate in league with the muscovite was about to invade poland completely changed the face of things stephen whose orthodoxy was unimpeachable he had before this extirpated the transylvanian unitarians had already satisfied the pope of his perfect devotion to the holy see and laureo was now ordered back to poland it was with no small anxiety that he looked forward to his first interview with a monarch whom he had so grievously offended and whose chief counsellor he regarded as his bitterest foe comforted however by quote, a most humane letter end quote, from the king who was too great a man to bear malice and too prudent a politician to make foes of possible friends especially as his own position for the moment was insecure and even perilous the nuncio returned at last to warsaw where he was received with open arms in many subsequent interviews stephen detailed his political plans to his new friend he justified his hatred of the habsburgs by reason of the treachery with which the princes of that house had always treated transylvania and convinced laureo that it was simply and solely political expediency which attached him to the sultan but that he was resolved to break these bonds and take up arms against the turk quem odio habebat canepeus et angue to the glory of god on the first opportunity of the poles generally he had a very poor opinion he appreciated their valour indeed and hoped to make the most of their splendid military qualities but a man of his stern simplicity and sobriety could not fail to be disgusted with their vanity flightiness and extravagance i do not wonder he said that henry of valois escaped from them but if ever i go it shall be by broad daylight and not in the dead of the night all laureo's efforts during the remainder of his stay in poland were directed towards bringing about an amicable understanding between the king and the emperor he exhorted bathory quote, to burn all past offences in the fire of christian charity end quote and though stephen's distrust of the habsburgs remained invincible he consented at last to enter into a defensive alliance with the empire which the nuncio personally carried through on his way back to rome in august fifteen seventy eight where the zealous though not always successful services of the aged prelate were rewarded by the red hat the leading events of stephen bathory's glorious reign can here be only very briefly indicated all armed opposition to him collapsed with the surrender of the great city of danzig since fourteen fifty four a self-centred free state under its own oligarchy and nominal polish suzerainty the quote -unquote, pearl of poland encouraged by her immense wealth and almost impregnable fortifications as well as by the secret support of denmark and the emperor had shut her gates against the new monarch and was only reduced december sixteenth fifteen seventy seven after a six months siege beginning with a pitched battle beneath her walls in which she lost five thousand of her mercenaries and the famous banner with the inscription aurea libertas long regarded as the palladium of the city danzig was compelled to pay a fine of two hundred thousand gulden into the royal treasury but her civil and religious liberties were wisely confirmed stephen was now able to devote himself exclusively to foreign affairs which demanded equally decided and delicate handling in those days the turkish power was still in the ascendant 
and even states so important as Venice and Poland were inscribed in the registers of the Ottoman Empire as tributaries to the sublime port. The difficulties with the Sultan were temporarily adjusted by a truce signed November fifth, 1577, and the Diet of Warsaw was at length persuaded, though not without the utmost difficulty, to grant Stephen subsidies for the inevitable war against Muscovy, subsidies which as usual proved totally inadequate. Two campaigns of wearing marches and still more exhausting sieges ensued, in which Battery, although repeatedly hampered by the parsimony of the short-sighted Schlachta, which could not be made to see that the whole future fate of Poland depended on the issue of the war, was uniformly successful, his skilful diplomacy at the same time allaying the growing jealousy of the port and the emperor. But for the loyal support of his wealthy Transylvanian principality, however, and frequent loans raised on his personal credit from foreign powers, he would have been unable to prosecute his sagacious imperial policy. In 1581 Stephen penetrated to the very heart of Muscovy, and on August 22nd sat down before the ancient city of Pskov, whose vast size and imposing fortifications filled the little Polish army with dismay. But the king, despite the murmurs of his own officers and the urgent representations of the papal nuncio Possevino, whom the curia, deceived by the delusive mirage of a union of the churches, had sent expressly from Rome to mediate between the Tsar and the king of Poland, closely besieged the city throughout a winter of Arctic severity, till, on December 13, 1581, Ivan IV the Terrible, alarmed for the safety of the third city in his dominions, consented to treat for peace. Negotiations were opened at Possevino's residence near Zapoli, and resulted, January 15, 1582, after nearly five weeks of acrimonious wrangling, in the cession of Wielic, Płock, and the whole of Livonia to Poland, whereby Muscovy was entirely cut off from the sea, and the Polish frontier pushed further forward towards the east, than it had ever been before. It is a melancholy and significant fact that Stephen Battery's brilliant services to his adopted country, so far from being rewarded by the dutiful gratitude of his new subjects, absolutely made him unpopular with both the magnates and the Schlachta. Not one word of thanks did the king receive from the Stanrycerski, a state of nobles in the Diet, for defeating Muscovy, acquiring Płock, and reviving the ancient glories of Poland till the Chancellor Zamoyski put the whole assembly to shame by raising in their midst and delivering an eloquent panegyric in which he publicly thanked his sovereign in the presence of quote unquote, this ungrateful people for his inestimable benefits. The opposition was marshalled round the immensely wealthy and powerful Zborowski's family, which had grown to undeserved greatness and monopolized the principal dignities in the kingdom during the short reign of Henry of Valois. During the first, they had treated the new king insolently. A Levy held soon after the coronation, as the papal nuncio tells us, Marshal Zborowski, the head of the family, fell to reasoning of good sorts, drew forth his own blade for its sheath, and lauded it as one of the best in the presence of Battery, who, justly taking offence thereat, suddenly loosed his scimitar from his girdle, and beating down with it the other's sword, flashed the scimitar in his face, remarking that it was a still better blade than his, Zborowski's, sword. Thereupon the marshal, perceiving his error in unsheathing his sword in the royal presence, straightway fell upon his knees and begged pardon of his majesty. The Zborowski resented being set aside under the new reign in favour of more meritorious persons, and conceived a fanatical hatred of the upstart Chancellor Zamoyski in particular. Stephen bore with them for a while, but at length their conduct became so seditious and defamatory that he was compelled in self-defence to take notice of it. His opportunity came when the outlawed homicide, Samuel Zborowski, presumed to return to Poland. Zamoyski at once arrested him, and he was arraigned for high treason before a tribunal presided over by the king himself, and after a scrupulously fair trial was condemned to death and duly beheaded at the castle of Krakow. May 26th, 1584. The Diet, which assembled on January 15, 1585, took up the cause of the Zborowscy, and its stormy deliberations seemed to be the prelude of a civil war, 
the whole session being little more than a determined struggle between law and order on one side as represented by the king and his chancellor and anarchy and rebellion as represented by the zborovsky faction on the other ultimately however stephen prevailed the sentence of samuel zborovsky was confirmed and his kinsman christopher was declared infamous and banished february twenty second fifteen eighty six stephen's policy in religious matters aimed at consolidation and pacification devoted catholic as he was he nevertheless respected the liberties of the protestants severely punished the students of cracow for attacking their conventicles and even protected the jews from insult and wrong a man of culture himself moreover caesar's commentaries was his constant companion and he revised and corrected the manuscript history of his muscovite campaign written by his secretary heidenstein he justly appreciated the immense value of education and at the beginning of his reign entertained the ambition of reforming the university of cracow by placing it in the hands of the ablest scholars of the day men like muretus zabarella and gregory of valencia his chronic poverty due to the abstractive parsimony of the diet rendered this large and liberal scheme abortive and he was therefore obliged to rely more and more upon the jesuits who happened to be the best educational instruments at his command he established the order in vilna posen cracow riga and other places despite the protests of some of the catholic bishops and all of the protestant superintendents and from these seminaries whose superiority was speedily and universally recognized the protestants themselves sending their children to be educated there issued those quote unquote, lions of the spirit to use skalga's expression who in the succeeding reign were to reconvert poland to catholicism high political reasons also bound stephen bathory to the jesuits they alone had the intelligence to understand and promote his imperial designs which aimed at nothing less than incorporating muscovy with poland and uniting the kingdoms of poland and hungary with the object of ultimately expelling the turks from europe and settling the eastern question once for all these grandiose but in view of peculiar circumstances and of stephen's commanding genius not altogether impracticable designs were first suggested by the death of ivan the terrible in fifteen eighty four stephen's views found an ardent supporter in the new pope the vigorous and enterprising sixtus v to whom the king sent sokolowski archbishop of lemberg and his own nephew cardinal bathory on a special mission to explain his plans the king offered in return for subsidies amounting to three million six hundred and forty eight thousand ducats to put on foot eighty four thousand men-at-arms for the turkish campaign and twenty four thousand for the conquest of muscovy at the cost of two hundred thousand ducats a year for four years the pope thereupon dispatched possevino on a second special mission to poland and russia to pave the way for this vast undertaking and a diet was summoned by stephen to meet at grodno in february fifteen eighty seven to consider the whole scheme when the entire project was for ever dissipated by the sudden death of bathory who was carried off by a fit of apoplexy on december the twelfth fifteen eighty six in the flower of his age and vigour no other polish monarch not even john sobieski ever deserved so well of his country in his all too brief reign of ten years he had already approved himself one of the foremost statesmen and soldiers of his age not without reason does poland reckon him among the most illustrious of her rulers End of section eleven